Today we are at Mapperton. This is the nation's finest manor house and our family home. Do you know, Mapperton has not always been the Montague family home. In fact, there was a much larger, almost castle-like home in Cambridgeshire called Hinchingbrook. And unfortunately, that house was lost in 1955. It was actually sold by my husband's grandfather after the Second World War. And the family, and I'm including myself in this, we feel really sad about this because that house had been in the family since 1627. In fact, nine Earls of Sandwich lived at Hinchingbrook. But Hinchingbrook actually wasn't alone. So after the Second World War, so many historic houses were either sold or demolished because they couldn't afford the upkeep of these houses. The cost of, of maintaining these houses was back then and still is today extraordinary. I'm really excited though because I'm actually going to be heading up to Hinchingbrook to see what's happened to it and to look at the fabric of the building and also to look at the history that's still left there. But before I do that, I'm going to meet with my father-in-law and we're going to go through some of the archives because he grew up there. That's where he spent his childhood. And then of course he moved here in 1955, but I want to find out what it was like to actually grow up at Hinchingbrook at like a castle. And then of course the loss of Hinchingbrook and how he felt about moving here at Mapperton. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors, and stately homes as much as I do, please join this American Viscountess as I journey into the British countryside in search of some of Britain's finest historic houses. The Montague family have always had a connection with Dorset and enjoyed its remote and beautiful landscape. And so it was perhaps a natural choice to move here when in 1955, the family were forced to leave the ancestral home, Hinchingbrook House, in the east of England. I'm really excited to get stuck in, John, uh, as to your memories of Hinchingbrook before we head off um, to see the house itself. But I don't know if I've ever shared this with you. Uh, this was when I was visiting Rockingham Castle and your aunt Faith had written this, and this was her memories of, of E.M. Forster, but in particular of Hinchingbrook. So I just want to quickly read this to you, and then we can kind of go uh, back. She says, after lunch, my father asked me to drive our guest over to Hinchingbrook and show him around the house. So this, by the way, was uh, December 1955. So this was written after Hinchingbrook was vacated. Hinchingbrook was a quarter of a mile down the drive. We drove through the great Gothic main archway and pulled up at the front door. During the war, Hinchingbrook was a hospital. And after the war, my brother, your father, to whom the estate had been transferred, found himself forced, partly for economic reasons and much to his regret, to sell the property. In 1962, the Huntington County Council bought the house for a comprehensive school. But in December 1955, when Faith went, the great house was empty and deserted. She then continues to say, before entering the house, I took Forster onto the terrace where Charles I and Oliver Cromwell once fought as boys. We stood on the terrace steps and admired the great semicircular bow window. 
We then wandered across the lawn to see the medieval nunnery and from there into the main house. It was dark and lonely, but beautiful. Every room shuddered and we looked at the furniture and pictures by electric light. Some of the furniture had been taken away, but most of the family portraits, the Hogarth, Lelys, and the Van Dykes were still hung on the walls. Our tour took an hour and Forrester had not said a word. Then he rounded on me explosively to abandon it like that, to leave it empty, just to clear out. What will happen to all its art treasures? He was desperately concerned. Houses are important, you know. A house gives security. It is an anchorage. And I think obviously you'll remember that period in 1955 when Hinchingbrook was sold because you grew up there. Well, your childhood that, was spent there. That is a really sad description. It's making me sad right now because I was at boarding school or in London with my mother so much of the time that I think a big historical event like the emptying of a house simply hadn't occurred to me. I mean, we had a new house down in Dorset and all the excitement was forward at that time. And I think, you know, I can only now feel a bit of emotion about that. So John, there's a lot of um, Hinching Brook <laughs> sort of archive material here, but can I just ask what is, you know, growing up there, what was your earliest memory? And did you, did you think it was, if I was growing up there, I would think it was a castle. Did you think growing up that you were living in a castle? I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Well, I mean, it, it is really a castle now because successive generations keep improving it and making it more comfortable until my father comes and knocks down half of it over here on this wing. But my memory is mostly about the early morning when I was maybe 12, 10 or so. And I used to pick uh, primroses and sell them to the public because the great thing was stand at the gate and <laughs> entice the public, you see. It was quite a business. I have a photograph here of my, my mother sitting at the seat of custom. That was unusual because she was divorced practically by then. <laughs> and <laughs> myself on the climbing over the, uh -huh. uh, the bar, over the entrance, and we used to collect um, half crowns and two and six and sixpence for children. Right. That's what it was. And these are all your siblings. Kate's there. Yep, Kate's there. Sarah is the tall one. And, and yes. another one. So I can see I'm about six or seven there. I think. This what is a, a set of postcards. Right. That were sold at the gate as well. But this is wonderful of the dining room. And this is, is this where you would have your meals? Breakfast, lunch, and oh, dinner? Oh, yes. And there, there was another photograph of that, too. Here we are. Wonderful. Oh. So that, that's, I'm not in this one, but my older sisters, my mother, and a school friend, and my father carving at the side table. I mean, that's all very familiar to me. And what was the room in the house, do you, would you say, that you spent the most time in? Oh, well, we were in the nursery upstairs, or the corridor along to the nursery. We weren't particularly wanted on the ground floor. <laughs> right. <laughs> But I, I can go back and see if the mangle is still there in the room next to the kitchen and the nursery. You know, it won't be. <laughs> right, right. And, and when you were growing up there, do you remember, because, you know, from everything that I've read, uh, doing my master's in country house studies, you know, these houses were well equipped with staff. Did you have uh, quite a lot of staff or not so much? <laughs> <laughs> well, we had 20 before I was born. And we were down to about three. <laughs> <laughs> we had a, a French governess who perhaps didn't count for my two s younger sisters. At the pinnacle was uh, George Small, the butler. I've got a photograph of him here. And he, he's doing something very uncharacteristic, which is putting down linen, probably maybe protecting something. Right. But he was my great friend uh, because he was the only one who would tell me what was happening. So I really did get very close to George Small. And then many, many years afterwards, I was visiting his wife and so on. 
So how... we had a very small number looking after us. I think. Can I just see that photo really quickly? Because what's wonderful is, of course, it's you know wonderful to see George here, but I recognize this chair, and I recognize this painting of um, Martha Ray, and I recognize um, uh, this Hogarth painting here. So, you know, the collection, as much as possible, was then, of course, taken uh, from Hinchingbrook here at Mapperton. In fact, I recognize these wall lights, I'm certain. <laughs> well, they all came, absolutely. We, we took everything we could, but a lot was sold, simply because you couldn't get it all into this house. And there were things which my father paid less attention to, which we are now missing. You know, some of the little details, like the fireplace implements and so on. So the house was left vacated in 1955. And then what happened to Hinchingbrook? Well, you know, going back to Mr. Small, the butler, he's probably laying the dust sheets. It's a very sad moment. I wasn't really there half the time, so I don't, I don't remember that. But what was actually happening was that the county council finally agreed to pay because we had a, an American uh, religious foundation that came and put up partitions everywhere and we thought they were going to buy it and then I think he died and everything was derelict. Um, right. The sprinkler system collapsed, you know, the water streaming out of the ceiling. Uh, it was a very catastrophic moment and thank goodness that's persuaded the county council to come up with money. And after some vital restoration work, in 1970, Hinchingbrook became a school, which it remains today. The house survived at a time when so many others were demolished. And for that, we are forever thankful. I'm really looking forward to going back to Hinchingbrook with you. I can't wait, we'll go there together. We're gonna to be, Kate, your sister is going to be joining us. Well, she'll have some memories. They'll be not the same ones. No, they'll not be the same ones. No. But how does that make you feel, you know, going there and, and we're going to film this together? It's very exciting. I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, yeah. marvellous. I'm sure it will evoke some other memories as well, so I can't wait to explore those with you. Well, we'll put all this into reality. To really get a sense of what it was like when the family lived there, my father-in-law and I look at some of the old films of Hinchingbrook from the family archives. I haven't watched this in years. So yeah, it'll be interesting. I saw it once, once upon a time, but I haven't, can't remember it. Here we go. Wonderful. Uh, this was taken by my father on the roof of Hinchingbrook. On the roof? That's the famous um, express train to Scotland. <gasps> How wonderful. <gasps> and there oh. is the south side, beautiful um, there bay is, window. There is the castle. It really is a castle. It has a gatehouse. Look at that fantastic gatehouse. That's become a busy road now, but it was quite slow at that time. <laughs> On the way down to Brampton, where Samuel Pepys lived. Yes. Now look at this extraordinary roof. How is the roof these days? We're not so sure, are we? I don't think the roof is very good. <laughs> now, now that's the park. Lots of familiar sights. There is the courtyard, where all the cars were chauffeured. Oh, goodness. Now, now this who is, is this? an event. This is a reenaction of something. That looks like my sister being picked up. That's my grandmother oh, on the left. That's my, your American grandmother, Alberta. Yeah, you can not see very well, but there, yes, moving in the background. Yes, there my she is. My grandfather. And there's Alberta right there, yes. Fantastic. Extraordinary thing to have this still now. Right. Now this, now. Is, this is one of my cousins, and those are my two sisters following. <gasps> and are you in the pram? Well, I haven't got a very clear mm. image. That's my Aunt Faith. That's my grandmother over there. American grandmother, <laughs> I always have to say. Yes. Fantastic. Look at Everybody how wonderful. getting up for the photo. It's my mother. <gasps> yes. There we are. That's a nice shot of her. Yeah, it really is. And oh, that's goodness. My two sisters again and cousin Drew, his name was. How? And that's, that's your mother. mother. And she had to sit at the gate and collect money from the public. So this is this right here is the in the gatehouse. That's that the right? gatehouse, exactly, ah, where the public came in. Where the public and came in. That's grandpa, grandma. Oh, Alberta, yeah. With something in her hat, rather cheerful. Now, this is my mother. Oh, I'm glad this is 
this sequence. It's in the rose garden, and um, she's preparing for something. And who is she with? She's with one of the gardeners. I can't tell right, you which right. one. It's before me. <laughs> and wasn't she, can I just, wasn't there something about your mother written that because she wore trousers, she was one of the first sort of aristocratic females to wear trousers at an event. Is that no, right? No, but oh. specifically at the Royal Yacht Squadron in Cowes. <laughs> You weren't allowed to wear trousers. And she woman. did. And you, in fact, weren't allowed on the lawn, the main lawn. And did she do that as well? And she did that too. <laughs> well done to your mother. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Well, it's around, oh, can we tell what date that is? End of the 30s. Oh. The Rose Garden, which is now being restored, I think. Yes, it's. I don't think it looks like that, does it? Well, I <laughs> hope so. <laughs> Not quite. Oh. Well, there's Mum again, getting ready. I didn't know she was good at decoration. And look at that wave now. Now, it may be that I'm in this one. Oh. Yes, that's me oh. and, that's and, and my sister Kate, me in a jacket. Uh, I don't know what game this is. It might be croquet. Oh, goodness, that went too fast. Oh, I think we're going to have to find more of that um, footage if we can. Or better yet, we get to go up there. So I've only been to Hinchingbrook twice, but um, I'm looking forward to having a tour around with you and Morrison When we go Kate. next, a few days' time. Yeah, in a few days' um, time. I have a feeling a lot of memories will be flooding back. I'm sure they around. will. You know, I was actually surprised when I was having a conversation with my father-in-law that he didn't have a lot of emotional attachment to Hinchingbrook. I, I actually think I might have more emotional attachment, but that's just the American in me because I, I love history and I, I find that there's a bit of sadness there as well. But I think, you know, this is his home. This has been his home, you know, since he was 12 and he was able to detach from Hinchingbrook, and and I think that's also the way that things were at that time. So many houses were sold and demolished during that period that it was almost normal. So you you had to detach, if you like. I think it'll be interesting to see how John reacts actually when we get to Hinchingbrook, and when we go through the rooms and we see the carvings and we see the places where he hid as a young boy and where he played on the lawn. And perhaps that will conjure up some more emotion and feelings that perhaps um, might come out then. I do think I will definitely get emotional, but listen, I'm American. I get emotional about most things, but in particular, you know, my last name is technically Hinchingbrook, and this is the house where nine other Countesses of Sandwich and Viscountesses of Hinchingbrook once lived. I'm one of the first to not live in the Montesquieu ancestral home. So for me, it is a little bit emotional, but I also am really looking forward to it as well. Today I am here at Hinchingbrook House and this is why my name is Viscountess Hinchingbrook, because of this house. Nine Earls of Sandwich lived here and then it was sold in 1955, but this is really the Montague family seat right here. My father-in-law, John Montague, the 11th Earl of Sandwich, and his five siblings all spent their early childhood here at Hinchingbrook. This is the gatehouse we built from Ramsey Abbey by the Cromwells. Did you have this car park here? No, well, was absolutely no not. <laughs> there was no car park. Just there were no grass. buildings. There was nothing. It was all trees the whole way through to the, the station, really. Really? Yep. I'll tell you one thing that hasn't changed. The cold. 
<laughs> the wind. You would come home through this gate sometimes. Yep. And it was just normal. And this would be open all the time. And so you play, you get walk, walk through. Through. Well, no, the, the public came in through the main entrance because we were sitting here. Right. This is so, where we collected the half crown. So when you open to the you public, both of you obviously remember that. And I remember that photograph that you showed me yes. sitting here with sitting your here. mother. And, and you were taking And then tickets. suddenly we'd see a member of the public coming quick, rush to here. <laughs> Two and six, please. That was the kind of thing. And I even sell primroses, a bunch of primroses. Uh, there was a rather nice little red booklet we had that we handed out. A yes, little orange little booklet. Yes, that's true. And what, yeah. do you remember that as well, just the public coming in? Was yes, it exciting, though? It was, was exciting. It ex yes, it yeah. was exciting. Yeah. And we were showing it to others. You know, it, normally it was kept very exclusively for us, but suddenly it was thrown open to everybody, and it was great. And it was great, and it, was, it must have been very exciting. Mm. And here are the 12 apostles, so this, as we called them. What has changed here so much? They've Anything. got much bigger. Oh, these have gotten They've much bigger. They've gotten much bigger. They were, they were much more um, rounded and smaller. Right. We used to play um, around them, right. skipping around them. And, and that's the part of the house that we lived in at the end. Yes. That was the 1950s. And uh, the house was much restored over the years. Um, but I think that was we my bedroom, that third one along. Was it? Mm. Oh. <laughs> and the sitting room remember. was that far end one. Oh um, my well, goodness. my room was over the entrance. Should we go in? Yeah, let's go in. Let's go. It's, it is cold. Let's go in. Just, yes. So this, I just love. You see, you should describe that, really. The three diamonds signifies the mountain reflected in water. Mont Aigu, the sharp mountain, the Norman French word. And the eagles come from the Mont Therma, much earlier connection. It's in the Middle Ages. And the coronet above. And the coronet above. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Oh, gosh, it's warm. Yeah. Hinchingbrook's foundations date as far back as the 12th century, when it was a nunnery but not until after the dissolution of the monasteries in 1536 did it become a family home. First to the Cromwell family, and then in 1627 to our family, the Montagues. So here we are. So here we are, so what, what room is this? This is the outer hall, I think we called this, didn't we, John? This is just the, the way into the main hall mm -hmm. and uh, family portraits around. Well, Some the, the fourth earl is on the left, who is the most well known of the portraits yeah. and then the fifth earl was important in the family because he brought the dorset estate um, at hook park in oh dorset, west dorset so the fifth earl that's he's the one who made the connection with dorset and now obviously mapperton exactly married into the paulet family i didn't i actually didn't know that i didn't know that either I've always wondered, I knew that somebody in the family, that yes. there was a connection with Dorset because there was land down there, but I didn't know that it was the fifth, the fifth Earl. So right. uh, that all took place in the mid 18th century. And then the lawyers argued for a hundred years and the family didn't get the property till about 1860. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So coming in here, so this says inner hall, but is that what you called it? I remember it as a concert hall, funnily enough, because we used yes, to have well, concerts. Yes, there was a huge grand piano. The grand piano, piano was there. The grand piano was yes, there? Yes, over there. Mm, on, on a raised stage. platform. And, so, that's a, and what else was in here? Well, Furniture? I mean, or only, just only much, events. No. No. It, no. It was really for events, wasn't it? it Everybody was. we, walked through the hall and nobody stopped. <laughs> yes, it was particularly good at Christmas. Oh, exactly. Because we had a huge Christmas tree, to, not to the ceiling, but sort of well up. Right, uh, what, in, the in the corner there. Right all here. decorated with, with uh, proper candles. That <gasps> was quite frightening. Proper live candles that had to be lit. When I'm in this room, I obviously my eyes focus in on the lozenges, which you've explained, the reflecting mountains. And, but there's just a lot of coat of arms here. Well, of course, <laughs> that is the full-size coat of arms with Neptune on the left, the eagle on the right, and the family motto, post tot naufragia portum, 
after so many shipwrecks, we reached the harbour. Yes. And that, of course, goes very well with the life and death of the first Earl, Edward Montague. Yeah, no, no. Because he died in that sea battle. He died in that sea battle. Can you do what my father used to be able to do and describe it in heraldic terms? No. No. No, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> was something about beaked and membered ghouls. Well, you, you did actually study heraldry for a bit. I did oh. for a little bit. Now, where should we go next? Well, you tell me. There are, it's going to the, was it called the big, the big drawing, drawing room? room. Big I drawing room. We must peep in there. All right, then, let's peep in the big drawing room. Then we've got a lot of memories down that corridor, haven't we? Yep. Oh. Okay, let's peep so in there. Hiding, yes, the, the, the hiding places. Hardly went into this room. Well, um, we weren't allowed. Children were not allowed in the big no, room. No, because of the lovely furniture and things. We weren't really allowed in so here. So you weren't, so this, but the public was allowed in here. You were. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. This was open, certainly. Is that the eighth Earl? That is the one who was unmarried, my great uncle. Right. And then he, because he was unmarried, he then, uh, it went to George, who was the ninth Earl. Right. And who grandpa, was his that was grandpa. grandpa, who was Edward's nephew. And this, I'm certain, is Alberta. Oh, do you think? That's yeah. interesting. I've not so, seen... Yes, because when I've seen her in, you know, I'm doing my master's mm, I do. on Alberta. It has to be Alberta because when you look at some of the footage of Hinchingbrook that John and I just watched, and early you, photographs. Of and watch. early photographs, yeah. you can see that, that right. it is. You can see bits of auburn in her hair. I was just looking for that. that. I was coming from this angle. You can see the auburn hair. You can see the auburn hair. But, but then it's very light touch. Yeah. So you, weren't, you were too young to come to this, this part, room. This room. And, and the room there, yes. So you really didn't live in this part of the house. No. This, because it was open to the public, is that right? Mm. Well, it was out of, out of bounds unless there was something happening which affected us directly. Right. But we weren't, weren't normally down here. But we were allowed further down, so uh, when we go through, we'll see. We might just glimpse at one or two of hiding places. Rooms. Okay, mm. okay, of hiding so places. Some, okay, some you lead the way, say. it's your house. <laughs> As was the custom in country houses like Hinchingbrook, the children of the family spent much of their time away from the rooms where the parents would entertain. Exploring the house with John and Kate is such a privilege for me. And even they are finding some surprises here. This is, this is a this new was, discovery. This is the billiard room. And this right. is the chapter But it's house. opened up because they found this amazing... Chapter house of the old ah, Norman church. Of the old Norman church. Mm. Oh, how wonderful. We'll see wonderful. signs of that later. So when you were growing up... We didn't this, see this You didn't at all. see this at all? No, no this was a wall. No, this has been found. This has been found. But what I also particularly like is you know, the carvings here. Mm. I just feel like every room I walk into, some Earl of Sandwich <laughs> was there. I thought there was a hiding place, Kato. Where is it? What are you looking for, John? Well, look, a hiding I think place. it's been taken away. No, there was no door, that, no extra used door to hide there. Between one no, 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 it's further oh, it's on. It's further on, yeah. Right? Yep. Oh, well, what's this? Is this a hiding place? That's <gasps> no, that's a hiding place. <laughs> did you hide in there? <laughs> I bet you did. <laughs> no, well, we might have done, but it's rather murky and, and cobwebby and frightening. I don't think I'd have gone in <laughs> oh, there. I, th I think but you the, in there. But the actual hidey one is in the billiard room. Do you want to see yeah, that? Yeah, I do want to see that. Okay. This is where I had my electric train. He had his electric trains in here, and they used to give me shocks. So I used to come here a lot. He would, he would say, just put your finger there. <laughs> Lick your finger and put it there. <laughs> Lick your finger. And... John, do you remember doing that to your sister? Um, okay, so this shut, was well. this. Okay. This has been changed. This was a double door. This was a double door. Oh, it was so far down here. Yeah. Oh. This was a double door. I see, and so that's and the so library. And so that's now the library door. And so we it, used to hide in yep. here. Yeah, we'd hide in there. Did you? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. It was the whole house involved in hide and seek, or was it just particular rooms? Um, I think it was particular rooms. rooms it would right. be the library and in here and probably the halls and around in this bit, but not probably in the big rooms that had the lovely furniture in because right. they would be frightened of us <laughs> breaking, breaking something. something. You know, when you look at these rooms, does it all kind of come flooding back? It certainly and, does. Yeah. Mm, it does. But it's wonderful to see what the school has found. You know, something like that arch of the old chapter house. Huge improvements. No, 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 absolutely. New discoveries.
Architectural references to the time when the nuns lived here at Hinchingbrook weren't the only discoveries. Ooh, this door. Spooky, squeepy, creepy. So what is this? What are we looking at here? This, this is a hiding is place. The this nuns is bones. the nuns' bones. When my father put in the new staircase, 1953, I was 10 years old, Kate was eight years old. We had this absolutely terrifying prospect of the bones of two Mount nuns being discovered again through the just the excavations by the text. But oh, you, need, you need to you need to what? pick up that okay. panel. Yes, okay. you can pick up that okay. panel. So turns out that they weren't exactly nuns' bones. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. You These see how they're very frightening for children. It was quite frightening. <laughs> So we used to be terrifying each other. We, we, we and would, and the others, would, and, and, and the others. Oh, my goodness. But it turns out that there are a man and a woman from an earlier period even than the, the priory. So we haven't any so idea. So they're not nuns. And they're not actually nuns. Probably they're not nuns. Probably. But it was a good story. It was a good we, story. We said nuns' and, bones. And Dad was good at making things a bit frightening. And it became so a, it a feature of the house for mm. the public. Mm. Oh, for the forever public. after. Mm. Mm. Yeah. But did you really hide in there? Wouldn't it be too scary? No, not too much, too many times. <laughs> <laughs> One of the rooms which the children were allowed into was the dining room. What I would like to know is, we're here eating our lunch and in this grand dining room. Oh yes, well we've got <laughs> memories of the dining room. So tell room. me about the memories. Do you want there to was a Kenneth? long table down the middle and those Cromwellian chairs that I think are at Mapperton. Yes. They're rather painful to sit in, yeah. upright leather chairs. <laughs> um, we have those. Was it formal or was it, it certainly wasn't like this. It's very formal. Very formal. So describe that to me, like what do you remember? uncomfortable formal at work. Well, we ought to mention Mr. Small, George Small, the head of the household. He was, he was the butler, mm. and everything that had to be done was organized by Small, or Mr. Small. And right. Mrs. Small and he became a great friend of ours, didn't he? he did. He used to look after our interests. He but, did. But of course, he was serving on the side tables. There was a big screen over by the door Right. which blocked off the, the table where the food came into. And then he would, it would all be brought in and laid out on the table there, mm -hmm. and then he would do the serving. Or, well, he would hand the things around right. for us to take from. For well, you to take from. For the others, so yeah. I don't remember. I would have had my plate made for me, I think. There was a children's end, I think, of the table. So we, didn't, we weren't interspersed with the grown-ups. I think we had our, our end, mm. and therefore we could talk ourselves uh, right. uh, uh, about what we wanted to talk about and mm. not have to have, make polite conversation to the grown-ups. And what was dress like? When you came and ate here, what were you... You'd have to dress up. No trousers for girls. No trousers um, for girls, right. So skirt or a dress with a sash and a bow. Mm -hmm. You remember little... you and I... Oh, my goodness. You and I were looking at a photograph. Mm. But that, that was my two older sisters. Yes. And a friend of theirs sitting at the table, but a bit formally. It was a bit alarming to come in here yeah. when the grown-ups all down on sitting at the table. You might, there might be 16 people sitting at this long table that we had. Right. I didn't eat much at the dining room table in here because I think I was too young. You probably did. Well, it was called, you know, when you're grown up, sort of. When, when yes, you're it was, eight. there was a sort of a bit <laughs> of a division. Yes, and I do remember meals, but I also remember events as such as my birthday. Do you? Uh, there was a birthday party here, and I was given a bicycle which was wheeled towards me across there. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> I think uh, uh, my dog, you don't remember uh, that Friday. Labrador, black rab I Labrador do. called Friday. Well, he was produced in here as well. Oh, well, this is a, a happy present. room for you. So it is a happy room. And I also had to um, play the part of the white rabbit in Alice in Wonderland. Um, I'd, I'd broken my arm, it was in a plaster, mm. and I had to run across from a screen there to a screen there. <laughs> and that was my whole part. <laughs> Your whole part, <laughs> with a broken arm. How many rooms would you say, a hundred? No, no. No, I wouldn't have said a hundred. More like sixty, I think. 
So what did we say? We said 20 bedrooms, didn't we? Yeah. I think 50 maximum. To listen to John and Kate reminisce is simply amazing, and it's really affecting. From the moment we arrived, it brings Hinchingbrook to life for me. You know, I, w I will forever look at this gateway completely differently in, in the sense, seeing John and Kate sitting there on the bench and showing where they sat and then where the visitors came in and asking, for money, what was it, two and six, please, two and six shillings. And just hearing that story, that they did really try to save Hinchingbrook. And when I say save, I mean save it for the family. Of course it's been saved, it hasn't been demolished. It's still here, but to keep it in the family. And I think I'll just remember that gatehouse as really a representation of how the country house, not just Hinchingbrook, has really struggled over the past century, but in particular, you know, since the Second World War in particular, that was the final blow. If you look at the Second World War, it was kind of the final, final blow and how all these families had to work incredibly hard. And when I say all of the families, the children included, to try to keep these houses in the family and so many of them couldn't, so they were demolished or they were left in ruin or they became hospitals or hotels or even schools. But I always think the ones that did survive and they became the hotels, the schools, the hospitals, um, at least they're still here. The fabric of the building is still here and so are the stories. Just other stories are being told. Living here as young children in the late 1940s and early 1950s, John, Kate, and their siblings spent much of their time in the nursery wing of the house. So here we are, this is top floor, and which way is the nursery? Right, kiddo. The nursery is no, to no, them. No. Oh, oh, we're going to have a disagreement. Depends which way you want to well, go. This is the bathroom. It's actually there. It's behind us, it's just so we can go either way. Okay. Oh, your old room. My old room. Wow, look at this. Wow. Lovely <clears> room. How well do you remember this? I, I'm not sure I have very many memories of this. Well, what I chiefly remember is this double door led to my mother's mother's bedroom, my grandmother on so this side. door here led to your and there was a secret mother's place mother's between. There was, was a double, another hiding, double door hiding places. But I also remember the ceiling was a sort of blue firmament with stars. It was a most a rather wonderful ceiling. And then, did you have a fire, John? This has obviously been well. I can't up. remember the fire, but I do remember my mother's bedroom was right there. So it was a very good position to be in. If you were in trouble, you ran in there. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't quite so close, were you? No, I was miles away. <laughs> special boy again. <laughs> special boy. <laughs> special boy again. <laughs> Number one son. <laughs> but do you remember coming into John's room sometimes, occasionally? Not this one. I remember no. the other one, the measles one. What's I the don't remember this one. Where's the measles one? Well, it's down the passage, his second room. We're on the way down to the oh. nursery anyway, aren't we? Okay. What's the Let's measles from? Well, I'll show you. Go okay. On. Keep going. Oh my goodness. Wait, Kate, just hold on before we go see the measles room. Yes. Whatever that is. What, yeah, yes. This room. I've just spotted it. This is my mother's bedroom. Really important room for us. Oh. Um, she had the bed here up against her. Yeah. And I think there was a fireplace there. Right. And. <gasps> This lovely little balcony going to the to the on, overlooking her garden. Beautiful. And the, the in the behind there is um, her bathroom. And was this where her dressing? Yes, dressing table, table would have been there. there. Yes, <gasps> absolutely. And so, do you you, re you remember this? Absolutely. I remember this because on Christmas morning we opened our stockings in here. <gasps> oh. Um, on her. On bed. her bed there. Yes, absolutely. She had a big, lovely bed. And this one, this room was her bathroom. Oh. Um, attached, I suppose, <gasps> done up for her to have a bathroom. Yes. Um, How wonderful. 
It's w I mean, it is. It's wonderful. Look at her it views. It is. Yeah. Her views are, are the best. And I mean, did she go really out are. on the balcony? Um, yes, I think she would have done. Yes. Yeah. And she probably had a little chair there, and she could yeah. sit in the sun. <gasps> That's mm. beautiful. I know. This room was always a very happy room. It it's always smelt deliciously <gasps> off of my mother, and it um, was always just had gave off this great vibe of of happiness. Oh. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah, it's do you beautiful. feel that you can feel? I can, I can feel it now. Yeah. It, it just yeah. has a feel about it. Right. Mm. It's nice. Yeah. Really wonderful. Wonderful. We've got another room to see down here, which was my old room. Well, we've just seen your old room. Is this another I know, room? No, but this is older. Oh, this is the one that's turned into a loo. <laughs> that's very funny. Is this oh. a bit different from how you remember it? You got to laugh at this one. John's bedroom is now a loo. Overlooking it, I think that. <laughs> that I think I'm allowed to come in because it's a female loo, so I, I'll go in. Oh my goodness! So what I remember about it is there was a terrible piece of wire, right? Instead of a light. The light was seemed to be never attached. So I had this memory, Kate remembers this, of, of a joke of saying a piece of wire, and I made fun of it, but actually I was rather afraid of it, as to what was going to happen. You were really shut in here for three weeks, I think, when you had measles. Uh, oh, of course I had measles, yeah. Oh my goodness, three, do you remember that, John, being in dark, here? Dark, dark, three do weeks. Know. I do yes, I had forgotten Three about weeks it. in here in dark. Mm. Well, there's, there is a lot of light compared to the other rooms. You can yes, see yes but that would have been curtained. You wouldn't right, have allowed, right, been allowed right. a light. <gasps> and so now that's it's, all I can remember. Because it was something afraid. to do with blindness, I think, with measles. Um, yes. That was the thinking. That, that was the stage. thinking back then. So this was mm. your room. With each room we visit, the feelings become more intense, the memories more vivid of how Hinchingbrook was once their family home. And that was the way out to the roof. Ah. ah. That was the way out to the roof. And would you go out there? Mm. Oh, you would, mm. you naughty mm. little girl. Mm. <laughs> when you went out there. Oh my goodness, but you went out here. Oh mm. yes, we did supervise. So this we area here. I know, here. it was not supervised. You couldn't just wander Yes, you jolly could. could. <laughs> well, I didn't. Kate clearly did. I did. <laughs> Loved it. You must so have been much braver. So this is the nursery area here, no. We haven't but quite this, got to it. No, this, is, this is the laundry room. I don't remember it. But it had the mangle. Oh, the mangle. The great mangle. What's a mangle? And then the, a mangle? A, yeah. Oh my goodness, you can't not know what a no, mangle is. I don't know is. what a mangle is. What's You've a probably got a different American term for probably. it. Probably. Uh, it's a, a couple of bars, of row of like, rather like rolling pins. Right. And then a handle. And then you'd put your clothes, or when you washed them, through the mangle. Oh, yes. And then it would drain the water, the water out. Right. Okay. And then you could hang them up. Okay. We probably just called it a dryer. No, you couldn't <laughs> possibly have called it a dryer. Oh, look, Katie, this is it. <gasps> so this room. is the nursery. I can see why. I can absolutely... It's rather dark, John, isn't it? See why I this could we're be on the this, nursery. This is the north side of the house. But you could lean out and you could see exactly who was arriving. And you could see who was yeah. arriving. Yeah. See. So, but a nursery was just where you would... Okay, a nursery a was room. where... A playroom. A playroom. But it was, it was um, where we ate as well. And we'd do lessons in here. I'd have lessons. I had... Um, there was a table in the window where there I did my first lessons. There was certainly a table in lessons. this window, wasn't there? The strongest, earliest memory I have of this room is the telephone ringing. And the telephone was high up on the cupboard, so we couldn't reach it ourselves. It was kept away from us. Telephone ringing, Julia is born. 1947, this was our younger sister. Right. And I, that's absolutely crystal clear. I was only four. Mm. But you that's remember the phone ringing and the news that. coming through. That Julia was yeah. born. One other thing is my mother's studio, because she was a painter, her room next door, we, we ought to look in quickly. Okay. Because yep. that's where yep. we also spent some, some moments anyway. Not right. long. Right, so let's go check out. The, the studio. And do you remember seeing your mother paint? 
Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, certainly. Yeah. Canvases everywhere and, and, and oil, lovely smell of oil paint. This is the one. Yeah. There's so many bedrooms or rooms. So I all say. I can remember is canvases. What can you remember here, Kedda? Well, again, I remember pictures and easels and paint everywhere and um, just, just a room which we didn't really come into very much because it was very much Mum's area. Right. And area. she didn't really like us to be yeah, but in a lovely room. too much. Yes. Well, lovely light. I can see why lovely she, light. she would want this. Mm. To, to, but so this, where we are now in the house, because I've been, you know, the nursery area, is this really where you felt that you lived? I mean, you slept mm. here. Yeah. But exactly. Yeah. Right. Yes, definitely. Down we were passage. all pretty well in this passage. Right. Either just down the bottom there, or where we were earlier. Or run to our or, parents' or, rooms. Yeah. Was the right. Mm. So it was just this yeah. part. Mm. Yeah. No, well, it's so much. vast. Uh, but we, were, we just had a separate life up here. I used to like getting up very early in the morning and just walking around the exterior of the house and saying hello to one or two of the, the carpenter or the chauffeur, you know. And that, that I do remember clearly. So it might have been because it was busy in the house all the time. But Yes, no, no, of course. But there was somebody always here that when you would walk around, you would see the carpenter or so the chauffeur. Yes, or yes. Or I mean, there were lots of people around. It was very warm. I mean, in some ways, they were more friends to us than our parents and the people who came to stay in the house. You'd go into the kitchen garden and the, the gardeners didn't tell you to go away and do something <laughs> else. They would say, come and have a peach or, um, or you know, they, they, everybody was really lovely. Having both of you here, I just can see how close you are, not only in age, but you know. We are. You've very, you've, I mean, I've known this not, a, you, my whole that. life. Well, mm. not my whole life, but since I married into family, I know you're both close, but now for me to be able to just listen to the two of you together, mm. to reminisce and tell stories. Mm. And I, th I, it's wonderful. Well, it's lovely for us, actually, because there's lots of things we might not have ever thought about again. So what was in here, John, this room? Do you remember? Oh, yes, this, is, this was our main guest room. This was a guest room? This was our, this, this was, was the, a corridor. There was a corridor down there the side. There was a corridor. Right, Which and, made, then, and then, and then it was bedrooms. divided. It was divided. That was oh. the main bed, the guest room there. Okay. How lovely that window is, with its uh, gothic tracery yes. at the top there. Isn't that beautiful? Beautiful. Just absolutely beautiful. But you know, here, the bow window. But I remember taking um, trays from the butler's pantry, our uh, butler's pantry. <laughs> and sliding down the banks when it was snow. <laughs> oh, yes, that I do remember. Remember that? Oh, 50, yes, remember that. 53, too. On there trays. was a very, very cold spell at one stage. Right, and you took the trays. And we, yeah, well, we asked him, of course. Right, right, right. Just yeah. to take them. <laughs> but we had a, a tin, because we had tin trays, those great mm. big tin trays. So perfect for sitting on. Perfect. Mm. How fun. Mm, I remember very clearly, just at the end there. Oh, yes, there the goes terrace. the train. That evokes mm. the, the film we just watched of Hinchingbrook. But this, what do we know about this? Do you remember this? We've never seen that in our time. It's been done much more recently, and it's part of the old Norman church. Ah. We it did was see the Lancet window, but this is a bigger one. <gasps> it's beautiful. Part of the old Norman church. So it was discovered after. Another example of how the school has been looking after the mm. building. Yes, absolutely, the fabric of the building and uncovering and making these extraordinary discoveries. Well, this was, this, did you see the name of this room? Is the Montague room. Oh, very yeah. good. I think it's, rightfully so, it's the, probably the grandest room in upstairs. So it's nice that, I like that, Montague room, the grandest room on the first floor. And on the upper floor of the house, Kate and I find her father's rooms, now classrooms. Well, Dad's room was down <gasps> the end there. Oh, my goodness. So right. his room was at the end there with his bathroom just off it. And these two rooms, I don't know what they were. Well, maybe they were just bedrooms. almost like his... But no, maybe they were just his lounge rooms. But let's just have, like, have a quick Let's look. have a look. This is really fun. It's like exploring. And you have to really use your imagination. Oh my, the, the school has 2,000 people, Kate. And Does you can it? use your imagination. But this and is this the sixth floor. Kate and John, it's so fun. 
This is the sixth form, though, you see. Yes. Okay, so this was Dad's bedroom. <gasps> and he had oh a my little... Goodness. He had a little prie Do you know what a prie -dieu okay. is? No. In the corner here, and where you kneel to say your prayers. Oh. And his bed was there. And his bed was there, and look at this. Yeah. I mean, that's original, yes. Yeah, he must have loved this room, I think. <gasps> but where was his, his bathroom, bathroom, then? His here. And I used yes, to watch him shaving. Is. One of those, he had a strop. Stropping razor. Right. I used to watch him. And you watch, let's open up that door, shall we? Just opening up lots of doors. I mean, how many doors do you think? Oh, no. it's locked. It's an office. An office. The loo is now an office. <laughs> it's so fun it's to go through so nice this with like you. This, and your memory, Kate. Yeah, it's not bad, my memory. <laughs> no, it's, it's not. No, not bad. Look at this. Oh, you see that? Oh, gosh. So that's the rose garden there. Yes. And there's a little walkway that goes there, and then there's a new building there. The cedars are amazing, because there's a cedar there, there's a cedar out there, there was a cedar here that we climbed all the time. You know, I'm going to get emotional here because I think seeing John and Kate walk around together with their memories really s struck home to me because I was able to experience that. And for that, I'm so incredibly grateful and lucky that I was there to hear their stories and to see them laugh. That's important. And I think Hinging Brook for me represents that, those stories that can continue to be told, not only through you know, my father-in-law and, and through Kate, but I can then, of course, tell the story of filming here with them and be able to tell that to my children that do you know that I was once with grandpa and your grandpa or your great grandfather and we went through his house that he used to live in and he told these amazing stories and so I think Hinchingbrook and the Montague family can still live on and survive together and tell those stories um, we just have to, have to keep coming back. And I think we have to be able to make sure that this, that this building survives. So I think that's my attachment to it. It's not just that 350 years of Montague's lived here. I think for me, it was, it was the experience of seeing my father-in-law and, uh, and telling his stories. So I can then tell that experience to my grandchildren. And that's how history lives on. Sorry. I didn't realize how vast Hinchingbrook House was. There were kind of two houses within the house itself. So there was the grand part of the house, if you like, where the drawing room was, the library, the billiards room. And then there was the other side of the house where John and Kate lived. And it seemed much more, I, th I guess, warm and friendly. And I, under I could kind of understand why they really stuck to, to that part of the house. Um, it seemed more like a home. Hinchingbrook House is a symphony of architectural styles. From its medieval origins to the time the Montague family lived here, each generation has altered the building to suit its needs. And most recently, Hinchingbrook has adapted to become a school. But by spending time with John and Kate, it's not so difficult to imagine it as their childhood home. Look at this kitchen. Ooh, I can't wait to hear what you remember about this. So in here, there was a great big table in the middle here. Right. Where Mrs. Small would stand. She was your here, cook, here, Mrs. Small. And then she could be against, she could be on the table, or she could be, and this was one long black stove. <gasps> that, um, Lovely. I, I don't know whether there's baker's ovens and things. Um, Look at those, Kato. Remember those? Oh, that's a spit that's up a there. Spit. Yeah. Was it, you remember that? Yeah, that. but it, it's been put up there. I think it was working. It would have been in the, in the fireplace. I think it was working. Right. But there was absolute movement everywhere. So this was, this was busy in here, very busy. 
So and the you scullery, had, the scullery was around was the corner. There. I love the scullery. But you had breakfast, lunch, and dinner made for you by... Yes, but that came up in the lift to our floor, to the nursery floor. So, but did you ever come in here and try to get food? Or? Yes, I was forever... Look, this is one of the interesting things that, about the children in the house. You, you could not just assume that you could walk through places where people were working. So if she was doing her kitchen work, no, out rolling out pastry, it was out of bounds unless you poked your head round the door and she said, yes, you can come in. Yeah. So there was permission all the time for right. the children of the house. Of the children of the house, mm. even though mm. it's your even house. Even though it's your house, exactly. <laughs> Permission at every turn. And what was mm. she like? Did she give oh, you? Oh, she was a lovely, oh, she... lovely, lovely person. Yes, she did. Slipped us bits of pastry. Talking about Mrs. Small. Mrs. Small. Oh, wonderful person. Wonderful. Yeah. So she would slip you bits of pastry and yes, and, and 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 show you how to do it and make allow you to roll it out and all of that. Oh. Hmm. Perhaps not you. Perhaps it was because I was a girl. No, no it wasn't me. <laughs> that was the way through to the. Okay, we... The nunnery we called it. All right, so we're going through here. So this we'll is the scullery. Okay. This is so British, the scullery. This is what I love. You have these names, the larder, the scullery. What else yes. is there? Well, that was about, about it. it. Right. Pantry. <laughs> Pantry. There you go. <laughs> but all had different purposes. You know, they were all different. <laughs> yeah. Well, what was the purpose of the scullery? Remind me again. Oh, peeling vegetables. Washing up. Like that. Washing, washing up. up. Washing up. That's right. So this was the scullery here. And do you remember this back staircase? Was no, I don't think that was there, but I may be wrong. Kate and I climbed the stairs to part of the house known as the nunnery. It was here, when their parents separated, that Kate, John, and their siblings lived. So when this transition happened and you moved to this part of the house, you know, did you, I mean, did you still have friends over and... and so friends is always an interesting one. Friends is a tricky one because we, we lived in the big house and we right. didn't have very many friends um, locally. Well, we did, but, but right. they were rarefied, like Prince Richard and Prince William of Gloucester, who <laughs> used to come every now and again for tea parties. <laughs> this is <laughs> and, unbelievable. And, and also, but, but it wasn't the thing for us to just mix with everybody, although all the, the children that worked on the estate were our great friends. Were your great so friends those were our friends, really. Right, right. But no, I don't remember lots of children coming into right. this part of the house. Right. I don't remember it's lots just... of children, other children, being in the house at all. So this, we're now entering the This nunnery. is very strange indeed, because this was a completely different. In fact, of the, the school buildings, this is the least recognisable. <gasps> because really? every window here, through, yes had a, be a bedroom. So there would have been a bedroom there and a bedroom there. And as we go on through, oh the same goodness. thing happens again. Look at this great open plan area. It's lovely. Beautiful so place these, to work. So there were walls um, There here. were walls. Yep, absolutely. Ah. They were all little rooms except for the end room, which was the big sitting room, which went across the whole of the width of the building. Okay. And then there was a passage way, the whole way up here. And in fact, it was rather good because you could run all the way along and it, there was a bit which went over something below but it was a sort of little bit of a, a and you could jump over it like a bridge so you, almost it like would go da 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 to the end to the end running up and down the passage uh, no it was it was some oh my goodness yeah. so, so this... it was all passage this bit where we're standing yeah. so i'm envisioning this bedroom there bedroom there bedroom there that's mm. five bedrooms yeah. and a corridor along here that's right that's and right. then what leads and into that my mother lived at the uh, in the end bedroom so she's moved from that room I just saw, which was lovely, with a spectacular balcony, mm. to sort of here, low ceilings mm. Mm. and right. Yes, but she wasn't here all the time because no. she was in London and we had the governess and the people looking after us, a nanny and a nanny. Right. So mum wasn't really featuring much except for weekends she'd come down. She'd come down mm. weekends. Because mm. she was doing art, she was painting. So you literally lived five bedrooms across here sitting room mm. here yeah you make it sound as if it was an odd thing but for us There's it wasn't no. odd at all it was just completely uh well what we'd been told was going to happen yeah, so you yeah. just do you what just happens. know that that's mm. what children mm. that's what children do yes i mm -hmm. i think it's quite cozy uh, it's, <laughs> yes it's quite cozy it's a nice warm temperature no, <laughs> exactly. it, no it was cozy compared yeah. you know the rooms are all very little compared to the big rooms we right. had in the other house right and it's very yeah. cozy yeah. 
No, it does it slightly slightly. Yeah, good. no, it is. Well, it's I good. think the we wind were happy is. here. That's good. Yeah. Even though it was blowing a gale outside, we ventured out to see where the late 19th century west wing of the house once stood. And it's here where Kate and John played as children. This is Ooh. where we got on the stilts once upon a time, Kate Did and you? I. You got and we went up and down on stilts, <laughs> didn't we? And then do you remember there were big red pots on here? Big red pots, right. and in them, you knew when summer was coming because the wallflowers were exchanged for geraniums. Ah. Oh, what a, what a now, can I ask a question? The wing that was demolished, yes, was John that knows coming this. out here? It was, yes, there were arches all the way down here. Yes. Ah. All the way down. But John, did it come off the end of this? Yes, it was on connected with that. Whoop, it's going to blow, it's going to rain now. Oh, steady! <laughs> Julie, there should, be a, there should be a cedar tree. Yes, John, there's a stump. Is it there? There's a rump. Look, <laughs> there's a rump of a cedar tree. Look. Oh, God. Oh! Is it there? Yeah. God, we're going to get there. Just a rump. And you used to climb there. Good yes, we God. did. Um. I don't think I can work out any footholds there. Can you, John? <laughs> right, we've had it. Come on. Better not. When the sun returned, we tried again. Clear. This is lovely. Clear. This is fantastic. Really yes, good. look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Beautiful. I remember the bicycle on here, too, going up and down these paving stones. Can you remember the unevenness of the paving stones? I can. And roller skates and we were on the same. Stilts, playing with stilts. Playing with stilts. It's lovely. And then this was all previously covered by arches and the offices, I think they were bedrooms at that right. time, by the Edwardians and my father pulled down the, the wing. Pulled yes, down so the and wing. I have that photo of before the wing was pulled down. This would, would have been service rooms, staff rooms previously. Staff uh, rooms. Staff rooms. And then okay. we lost all the okay. staff too. What do you remember of here running around playing you know, kitchen garden, all of that. Because I have this lovely photo of your mother and she's in trousers and she's in the rose garden with somebody and she's got a lovely basket. Yeah. And, and it's well, also in the all film. In, all in the rose garden, which is just over there, through there. Right. Um, I remember my father weeding the creeper. There was a creepers all the way along there, sort of um, wisteria pruning, and things like that. Pruning. A lot of pruning. Yes, along that quite a bit of pruning. Right. Yeah. A lot of pruning. A lot of pruning. And what about this door? Did you ever... Yes, we can't use that door. That was the flower room. The flower room? Mum's yeah. flower room, yes. You had a some, flower room. Well, she kept, you know, if you went around and picked flowers in the garden, right. she'd take them into there <gasps> and then put them in vases to put on in the guests' yes. rooms. We'll all, we'll link all hold on. Link on. Oh, no, we bottom, did have skirt. sometimes, we there had was a tea. Little ta yes, we had a little table and chairs there. This should be a nice in this place little to spot. Stand, and there should be a door um, there somewhere. Let's just stand. Yes. Yes. Should we stand these in here? The, these are the wheels from the mill. Oh, these Brampton, are the what? The mill wheels. <gasps> oh, the mill wheels from well, Brampton could be Mill. From Brampton. Oh, Brampton Mill. <gasps> Wonderful. That was a good idea, wasn't this it? Is I never quiet. remember that no, being this made. This is much better here. This is a nice place to be. Oh, look at these irises. Aren't they beautiful? And this was the church, the little chapel. The chapel. Where we, we on Sundays, we had prayer. <gasps> so there was a table and chairs so we could sit out sometimes. So you could sit outside. And family photographs were here. This yes, is a good you, place you'll, for you'll, that. you'll see. It's Div. obviously a nice protective <laughs> bit. <laughs> it certainly is. Those irises are smart, aren't they? Yeah, very smart. Lovely. And then this right here, obviously we're coming up to the library. Yes, this is the This is the bow window. window. Beautiful. Yep. But that's obviously Queen Elizabeth I. Yes, Kate, oh, yes the cipher that. at the top there. It was 1564, but that says 1602. That's when it was put up, obviously. That's when it was put up. Yeah. Oh. But this wasn't always the position of this great commemorative bow window. After a fire in 1830, the east front of the building was dramatically changed, and the window relocated to where we see it now. You see how it was completely rebuilt, you see, where the bow window was. You can't tell where it would have fit no. in. No. 
So that's where it was, I see. Know. Right. There's so much architectural history to be discovered at Hinchingbrook. And later on, I meet up with Tom Wheely, one of the history teachers here, who explains how parts of the building have evolved from their medieval beginnings to what we see today. There's one room at Hinchingbrook which still bears some resemblance to the time when John and Kate lived here as children. Oh, this is exciting, coming back into the oh, yes. library. With that beautiful glass. Gosh, I remember this room was really not coming in here very much. I mean, you all no, have a different feeling. It's a grown-up room. Grown up grown up room. room. And people playing cards is what I remember. Well, as it is now, I mean, it was generally a very quiet room and you could come in mm. and work here. Mm. And there were some wonderful bound volumes. Yes, beautiful books, always. Do you remember that on either side of these steps there were... Uh, there were bushes. I can't no, remember I what the name of it that. is. You don't remember that? No. Yes. No, you see, I nice. remember things like the trees really here, because didn't Sarah and Anne have a favourite tree? But it wasn't the cedar tree, I was told. It was a beech tree the that beech was tree. called Cubbins. Cubbins. Yes, we Cubbins. Call Cubbins. But, but I don't see a beech tree no, that could gone, be I Cubbins. Has it gone think, completely? Well, it might be just behind that one. But the I can't trees tell. in this garden are quite... You, you know, as children, we knew about the cedar we tree. We ran that was a lot up and lot. down here, didn't we? We did, yeah. Lots of stories. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And the, and the daffodils that I see are still down there. Are they still out? Uh, yeah, well, dust. Do you remember the old family film that was taken from the roof? It was looking out over the railway. That was yes, I over do remember in that, that direction. Yes, I've, well, I've seen it over the years. That was taken by my father. And then by Sarah as well. I think. Oh look! There you are. Oh Julie. Oh so Julie, how good. kind. No, <laughs> very well. The least I could do. Special Come biscuits. Into your family home. Where are you that's, that's John's. That's John's. Yep. So th for me, this room, the library. You know, I, and listen, I know I'm coming at it from my American point of wow factor, but this really is a wow factor type of room. I mean, it's just Montague everywhere in this room. Mm. Mm. What are, your, what are your recollections of this room? Because it was a library when you were growing up, is that right? We yes, were just it was. trying to remember. Because it again, it's one of the. We, yeah, weren't we, weren't, we didn't come in much. You, you thought games and things, but I oh, don't I remember. remember. And people sitting around and chatting and being in here. It was used as a sort of secondary. After dinner kind of yes, room so. with cards played. Hmm. The library, one of the most impressive rooms at Hinchingbrook. The walls are lined with books but it's the amazing stained glass windows which really seize your attention. So Kate, since you're heraldry, Kate is an expert on heraldry. Oh, she's not an expert yes, on heraldry. Yes, she yeah. is. So now is, this it's is the perfect moment. room. This is yeah. your moment. This is your perfect room. And really, honestly, I don't understand. Obviously, I understand the Montague coat of arms, but when we look at these stained glass and you can see the lozenges on one side and then another, family partial coat of arms. What does that mean? There's because these throughout these stained glass, it's not just the Montague coat of arms. It's sort no. of split. Well, when you married, you brought in the coat of arms of the wife or the wife's family. So you it would be divided. So because back then you would always marry somebody, well, most likely somebody who had a title or comes from a, a you know, aristocratic family. Is that right? I, I suppose that would be right. Yes, yes. The Montagues were always trying to draw attention to their grandeur. That's the basic thing about these whole windows. I mean, you wouldn't otherwise see that no, no, in any course. other generation, I don't think. When you found out that it was being sold, did, you, did that conjure up any emotion of sadness, or were you attached to the place, or... Uh, yeah. Not in my case. <laughs> oh, he's not right. He yeah. minded hugely. Well, we were all at school, you see, us older ones. You've minded hugely over the years that it's not been here and not Mapperton. You do. Right. No, and you do. I don't. I simply don't. Life moves on. How could I possibly feel that? No, but during... I was too young to get attached I to I remember it. having a conversation with you when you said that you were rather sad. That How the, long ago? That the whole point was the inheriting from a long line of people in through the family about, I don't know, what, 20 years ago? And that, that it was really rather sad that you had that we had to move. 
Yeah, that, well, Luke feels, I will tell you that Luke, when Luke and I came here in December, we, we came here just to take a photo on the outside and we happened to be here when it was open for its Christmas fair. We couldn't believe it. And um, I, Luke and I walked around for an hour and I can get quite emotional and he didn't, he didn't say a word. Not, not a word was spoken. And I think Luke feels, you know, it was quite poignant for him and he feels sad that your father felt he had to sell it. Mm. The relationship with the family is everywhere. It is the family. This is the family. The carvings, the, the lozenges, the stained glass, uh, you know, and even evoking your memories today, that is the family. And, it, and it's, for me, I love listening to your stories because I'm trying to imagine it and envision it, but there's a sadness for me as well because the story stops with you both. It would have been rather wonderful to have lived here. And um, it was wonderful living here. Yeah. I'll just say one thing about the school though. They have been extremely generous to the family, the, those teachers who yes. know about yeah. the family history. And we have been welcomed back here at any time. Of course. And so, you know, I feel also that we've come to terms with the changes that have come here. Yes, um, and I mean, yeah. think of it, of it being used by hundreds of children over these years. That's delightful. Yes. You know, we were six wandering about in here. Now there are hundreds of them. Yes. And I, all that is wonderful. Mm. Yes. Seeing the two of you together has just has been something I will never, sorry, I'm going to, but is never going to cry? I'm I have a feeling. Because it's, I think it's extraordinary. And I think seeing the two of you together, brother and sister, and reminiscing, and it's, that's what sweet. life is about. You are sweet. So, Julie, we're yeah. going to look at the archives and the photographs, and we're going to relive again. <laughs> yeah. and again. I yes, know. we will. I know. Yes, and that's, we've you know. lots of those. But being able to, for me to spend time with both of you is really special. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. He always sits perfect. When yeah, he does. Perfect. When we're not sure it is. Yes, exactly. All right. Yay! Did we get that on camera? I love that. That was, I liked that um, we're ending this way. Sort of a, a photo on camera and we'll all walk out together. Walking out together. Arm together. in arm so we don't blow over. Right, where are we go? <laughs> Which way, John? This way. <laughs> John's taking me this way. Middle, you'll have to run, girls. <laughs>I want to give you, alongside Tom, much more Tom um, than, than me, really a history of the fabric of this extraordinary building. It's more or less a thousand years old, the site here, so it's easiest to remember it as uh, being five periods of history, really. Okay. So the first building on the site here at Hinchinbrook that we know of was a, a Saxon church, which was then rebuilt um, by the Normans. Uh, around 1100 okay. and uh, we think then that was the basis around which a nunnery was established around 1200 so that became the second main period of Hinchinbrook's right. history. Right, it was um, the nunnery, the yes. Nunnery. And they, they remained here quite happily until um, Henry VIII came along uh, in 1536 and dissolved the nunneries right. and Hinchinbrook was one of the first to go. When they were moved out uh, Hinchinbrook was granted to the Cromwell family, another very important uh, English. I mean, we are family. really in the birthplace, not here, but this area is the birthplace of Oliver Cromwell. That's right. Huntington, yes. Indeed. And we're, in a sense, very lucky that they didn't do a total demolition job. Uh, and as we'll see as we walk around the house, there's uh, a footprint of the old nunnery still just sort of visible right. in the layout of the, the house itself. Right. Uh, so then, so then, so we've got obviously then, then from the Cromwells, then we've obviously have the Montagues, and that's a large part of this, almost 350 years. Yes, yeah, so they they move in in 1627 and move yes. out in 1955. And then, of course, the present day of Hinchingbrook is a school, which is what, what you attended, and it's yeah. a very large school, isn't it? It is. It's one it's of the largest comprehensives. So yes. Just short of 2,000 pupils, and yeah. um, most of them are. Uh, occupying the site to the north 
uh, of the house itself, where the gardens, uh, the kitchen gardens would have originally right, been. Right, right. In a sense, this room is one of the oldest and one of the most modern rooms in the house because as we see it today is how it was enclosed by the 8th Earl in 1909. Um, so prior to that, it, for much of its history, it had been an open garden in the centre of the house. I didn't know that. Um, so, so that means seven Earls of Sandwich live, th this was a garden. This yes, was an open, an open courtyard in the, in the centre. Really where we're standing now is the original medieval footprint of the central cloister of the nunnery which stood here in the medieval period. Yeah. So you can sort of imagine the, the corridor which leads around the outside of this room would have been the cloister walk of the nunnery uh, all the way around. Right. Let's carry on and um, we're gonna stick with this theme of right now of the nunnery. So now I'm just really envisioning the cloister here yes. just going all the way around. Oh yes. Behind us here we have the Norman Archway, which was revealed in the 1960s right. um, when the building was being renovated to become the school. And they were, the, the workmen were sort of restoring this part of the wall and they realised that this had been bricked up by red Tudor brick and it was actually hiding one of the original Norman archways. So this room, now called the Chapter House Room, mm. unsurprisingly was the Chapter House of the Nunnery, which was so the administration centre. And then with that same sort of sense that the walls are hiding the history. Yes. If we just look up here, we can see. So I'm in the cloister here. Indeed. And are you looking up here? I'm looking that? up here. Wow. And we can see a Norman Lancet window. And it would have been looking out onto the, onto the cloister itself. And the north door of the church would have been somewhere just about here where the door into the library is. OK. OK. Incredible. I mean, wonderful. Really That's what's incredible about these country houses, if you like, and especially here in, in England and, and, of course, in Great Britain, all throughout Great Britain, is that it's building upon building upon building. It's this transformation. That's right, um, yes. Which is just incredible. And what, what every sort of family or owner or custodian, they kind of put their mark on it. That's right. Once uh, it became that country house. But it started, a lot of the country houses did start as something else. Absolutely. A nunnery yeah. or a monastery. Particularly when the, the monasteries were dissolved um, and they were granted out to the gentry or noble supporters of the crown. Yeah. So many houses therefore have their origins in monastic buildings. Yes, so we're still though looking at a little bit of the nunnery in here, is that That's right? That's right, yeah. So this room, as you can see from the shape, is very long um, and it's sitting on the original footprint of the medieval church. Ah. And so we would have just walked through the north door, roughly where the library door is. Yes. And we would be looking up towards uh, the choir and the altar. <gasps> at this far end of the library. Wonderful. So. You can, I mean, really get a sense of how this was yes. a, a church. You, you absolutely can. That's I right. mean, it is, it's extraordinary. Before the Montagues, it was the Cromwell family over three generations from 1538 until 1627 who called Hinchingbrook home. And it was the Cromwells who transformed the buildings from their monastic roots into a house. So this, this room that we're heading to now, um, for the majority of the time that the Montagues were here, was a series of bedrooms. But as we see it now, as an open, single room, um, was much more as it would have appeared in the Cromwellian period. Ah, okay. So the Montagues closed this off. There would have been a bedroom here with the, with the bow window, which yes. you can see, which is Hinchinbrook's biggest feature, really, yeah. externally. Um, and there would have been a corridor running down here. But That's right. As we see it now, this is as the Cromwells built it um, when they uh, took, took the nunnery over. Right. And so the upstairs of the church becomes the long gallery. And, um, fantastic. I mean, that is fantastic. You know, I always wondered if Hinchingbrook had a long gallery because yes. I visit other historic houses. And many of you remember if you watched Rockingham Castle, um, that beautiful long gallery there. And I always wondered if Hinchingbrook had one. And, here it is. It yes. And it was created by the Cromwells. That's right. And we can see sort of some of the work that they've, uh, they've done when they've arrived. So this, this stonework here was one of the original church windows. 
in the upper we're part of the, the church. And my, I'm going to tell you, we're standing just above the library right yes, now. Yes, that's right. So yeah. you, this is the church. Yes. We are, we are in the church. We are just above the library. Incredible. And you can see the red Tudor brick has been used to, to fill the, the windows uh, yes. in this part. In this, incredible. And, and this was uncovered when you started the, the restoration when it became right. a school to, to knock down yeah. the walls that the Montagues had made. That's right. And to bring it back into a, a, to a large room. But the, one of the best features that they found was this fireplace, which is certainly a Tudor fireplace. Um, and for us, it's, it's really lucky for us that we can date it to the first Cromwell owner, uh, which is Richard Cromwell, because of the decoration that we can see. Right. So if you look very carefully, you can spot Richard Cromwell's initials in the decoration. Yes, you can. Just here. Yeah, Just well there. found. But not too grand there. You'd think no, it would pretty. be some enormous, I don't know, coat of arms or something with his initials, but, That's but right. rather small. But there's, there's lovely little uh, sort of mementos of the past here because we can see there's some graffiti, which some people think might be from students, but it's in Latin, so probably isn't. Um, and uh, we did have somebody... Uh, translate some of these and they, they were lines from love sonnets uh, so okay. very much from the period and we can see a date just you can here. see a date 1566 yeah. and this lovely scroll scroll work so that's the Cromwell period and again only 90 years now we've got to move on to, the to my period <laughs> the Montague yes. period there's one room where the presence of the Montague family shines brightly This is my favorite room. I have to say, Tom, library, it's my favorite yes. room, the library. There's a sense of calm in here. The sense of calm, and then I'm just overwhelmed by the lozenges. <laughs> <laughs> overwhelmed the, by the, the Montague, Montague yeah. imprint here in this library is rather extraordinary. If we look at the far end of the library, we can see some painted glass depicting the life and death of the first yeah. Earl. Uh, on the left-hand side, we can see uh, the return of Charles II in 1660 at the Restoration. Yes. So after the period where oh Oliver Cromwell goodness. had been Lord Protector. And Edward carried Charles II back to England on board his flagship. Uh, it had been called the, the Naseby, which right. was one of the great victories over, over, over the Royalists. And so he hurriedly renamed it the Royal Charles to bring the king back right, to England. Right, right, yeah, no, no, And course. so we can see him here kneeling before Charles II. Uh, so that's him kneeling before yeah. Charles II, yes. And then we can see on the right-hand side mm. the death of the first Earl 12 years later in 1672. The Battle of Solbay. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And so he, was, he went down with his ship. And I, most accounts suggest that most of the crew escaped, um, as you can see even in the painting there, so on, the, on the ship's boats. But, right. Uh, uh, he wanted to stay, yes, he, he wanted went, to stay. That's, that's, right. that's a very noble... Um, act. I mean, this is just an extraordinary. Yes, um, and it's surrounded uh, by this this great record of the of the Montagues of Hinchinbrook, because we have his coat of arms uh, alongside those yes. of his wife Jemima. Yes, uh, and then you have their children in these coats of arms so surrounding. Th these are all of their children. That's right. You can you can then follow the family tree, because off to the left we see their first son, Edward, ah. who, who was Viscount Hinchinbrook originally, and then uh, his marriage to Anne Boyle and their children. Daughter of the Earl of Burlington, and then their children, they had three, another Edward. That's right. Elizabeth and Richard both died unmarried. Do we know what happened to the second Earl? Yes, we just have ah. to turn I this way. This. <laughs> this is brilliant. This is unbelievable, this record all in gorgeous stained glass. So right. here we can see he's married um, Elizabeth Wilmot, the daughter of the Earl of Rochester. The glass windows that we've seen so far mm. were commissioned by the fourth Earl in the 1760s. All of these? All of those ah. uh, that we've just seen. Okay. Um, and then the seventh or eighth Earl then decided to pick up the, uh, the family tree. Okay. And we can see them continued in a slightly different style uh, noticeably more Victorian uh, style here. Yes. Uh, but continuing to tell the story of the family. It's not just the interior of Hinchingbrook where there are still glimpses of the Montague family's time here. 
Outside, Tom shows me where the estate buildings and surrounding land were remodeled in the 1960s into a school. You know, I see these aerial shots of Hinchingbrook, and I saw these lovely stables. That's right. And I always wondered what happened to them. <laughs> yes. And, 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 and they're, obviously they've turned into the school. Sadly, the decision was taken to take the stable blocks and cottages down, which surrounded this courtyard. Um, but at the time, they were, they were relatively new. Um, they had only been uh, reconstructed in the 1890s. Right. So they were less than 100 years old. At the time of them being, uh, exactly. being pulled down. Right. Yes. So, and I, I can see that. I mean, of course, when you look at those photos, you think you could have just preserved that. But yeah. you're right. It was, it was considered a new build when That's they were right. pulling, when they yeah. pulled, when they and pulled them down. And I think it was in, in pretty rotten repair as well. Right. Because of course. with the family having moved out in 55, um, and then the restoration work not really starting until the mid late sixties. They had been derelict for nearly 10 years. Right. The stable block was adjacent to the most amazing kitchen garden. Where we're heading now, as we walk through what's now the school site, is the original kitchen gardens, uh, which would have provided food and vegetables for the for the house kitchen. I mean, we're still in yeah, the kitchen still, garden. Yeah, still in the kitchen gardens. <laughs> we, when we get to the end of this building, you can see the old kitchen garden wall pick up uh, and kept in in uh, in place. In so place. it gives you an okay. idea of where the... Oh, just, here, right here. Yeah, right up along the side of this building. <gasps> so, so you have it. kept this. Yeah, so you can this still see, see the footprint of the... The footprint of the, of the kitchen garden and the wall. So then behind here, so we're now moved on behind yeah. beyond the kitchen garden, what are we moving into We're going here? into the gardens now. Okay. Um, and in fact, this garden just here uh, was a Japanese garden created by the 8th Earl. Originally, there was a little tea house in here, uh, of which there are photographs still surviving. This, and there's water down here. Yes, like, there was a little, little pond. Little pond uh, within the Japanese within garden. Within the Japanese garden. There was a bridge originally sort of going across. Right, right. Uh, Lovely. So these all would have been formal gardens, you think? Certainly yeah, around the house. house itself right. in the in the Tudor period and even in the buck print of 1730 we can see that there are sort of l formal pathways laid around right. the immediate uh, lawns of the house okay so um, okay but this is one part of the formal gardens that survived it's the the rose garden this is um, by the friends of Hinchinbrook who oh. do an immense amount of work yeah in just replacing the roses and uh, wonderful trying to keep the, the the original garden to keep it, yeah, it yeah and I remember watching the footage of um, Hinchingbrook and you can see rosemary going through I th I think it's th through this oh so this through garden here, here through which this is the <laughs> so this is this is where she was this yes, is where she right. went so I just think it's wonderful that I'm able to kind of walk in in um, you know my husband's grandmother's steps and he was very close to rosemary as well um, here as well so it's, that's what it is. It's all about walking in the steps of, it is, yes. of ancestors and, and family members, but also seeing how it's, how it's evolved. Tom's being very nice and letting me go first. <laughs> so we're coming out onto the roof, the lead roof of Hinchingbrook. And this is where we really want to talk to you about and explain that we're, we, as we started this film, that there were sort of five periods of people inhabiting uh, this house, if you like, and five periods. And now it's a school. That's right. So yeah. we're in the fifth period. This is now Hinchingbrook School. We touched on it earlier, but this is also still a grade one listed building. So it's of exceptional historical value. And the stories around these buildings, which we've told today, those are so important. But the upkeep of these buildings, and I know this firsthand just from Mapperton, which is, you know, a fraction of the size of Hinchingbrook. This is still a grade one listed home. The school doesn't receive any extra funding in its uh, no, educational it's a, budget. Right, it's um, a state school, so it's not a private school, which would then be, of course, funded privately right. by, you know, the the, the, the parents of the right. students. So, and you don't have the luxury, if you like, of opening up the house to the public six months out of the year, seven no. months out of the year, or having the amount of weddings that we have, 
or a cafe or embarking on you know a rewilding project you know when we walked around Hinchingbrook today I of course have an eye having lived at Mapperton for a while now of like oh that needs to be restored that needs to be repaired mm. but the biggest project here is the roof and I have filmed with so many other historic house, house owners who said it's if you don't have the roof, you don't have the house. That's right, yes. So we're, so, we're facing a, the next big battle in Hinchinbrook's survival is the eventual replacement of this lead roof and the, the lead work which continues on the other levels as well. It's probably got a 100-year lifespan and we've got 10 years left on that. Um, we're already starting to get leaks and ingresses of water. So the, the necessity to replace this which is going to be an immense sum of money, is, is looming just around the corner. Yes, in a month. I mean, the, repairing the roof is an immense sum of money, as you said. And, and let's be clear here, you can't replace a lead roof with slate. No. You, it's like for like. Because it's a grade one listed building, this has to be replaced yes. with lead. Absolutely. <laughs> so this is very special because we're, we're really limiting the number of people who come up onto the, yes. onto the leads. Um, and one of the things that we did before we came out was to check our, our footwear was, uh, didn't have any stones no. because we found that that's starting to um, puncture holes in, in the lead as it gets thinner. So where are we gonna head? How, how brave are you feeling? I'm, I'm brave. Right. Brave. Well, we how brave is the cameraman feeling though? Brave. <laughs> brave. Yeah. <laughs> now, if we climb up here. Oh my goodness. Wait till you see this. If we venture around the corner, yes. we'll be able to see the reverse of Elizabeth the first coat of arms. Well, if you just head to your right between these two, yep. two roofs, oh, it will take us onto the, the top of the bow window. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. This is unbelievable. <gasps> oh, this is crazy. Here we are. <laughs> this is, can I touch it? Hopefully yeah. it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. So you get a sense of the scale, which is rather nice. Yeah, you really do. So we have the Lion of England on the right hand side. Yeah. And then of course, because Elizabeth is a Tudor, we have the Dragon of Wales as the supporter on this side. There we go. But you get a nice view of the tributary of the river Great Ouse running across the floodplain just in front of the house. I mean, And we it's... think that's where Hinchinbrook gets its name. Oh yes, I was going so, to ask. So there's a suggestion that the, this, this land was owned by the Hintzel family in Saxon times. Okay. And so this, this brook, this yes. river would yep. have been known as Hintzel's Brook. And then over time it's, it's emerged it's as Hinchinbrook. Hinchinbrook. That's right. I, I'm so happy you answered that question because actually it was on my list today and I ah, realized I forgot to ask well, it, but you've read, you read my mind. <laughs> I'm so grateful to Tom for giving me this rooftop tour and telling me about the origin of our family name. What a sensational way to end my visit to Hinchingbrook House. In rural Shropshire, close to the border with Wales, is hidden the most fascinating of historic homes. Today, I am at Pitchford Hall, and Pitchford is considered England's finest Elizabethan half-timbered house. It was actually lost by the family in 1992. However, they managed to get the house back 25 years later. This is an extraordinary story of heartbreak and stoic determination. Thank you very much. Cheers. With her husband James, Rowena Colthurst, whose mother inherited Pitchford in the early 1970s, has worked tirelessly to get the family home back. But now, they're faced with the enormous task of recovering the building from years of neglect. This is incredible. When I think of England, I think of green, and houses that look just like this. Of course, it pulls at my heart because Hinchingbrook, we had to do the exact same thing. The house was sold in the 1950s and lost. This family, Rowena and James, managed to get their family home back, and I can't wait to find out how they did it.
When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day, we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles and manors and stately homes as much as I do, please join this American Viscountess as I journey into the British countryside in search of some of Britain's finest historic houses. I'm Julie. This is Edward. Hi, hey, Edward. Hi. Hi. So, and who's that? Doggy. Doggy. Love it. <laughs> um, well, it's amazing to be here. Are you going to show me around as well? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. <laughs> oh my goodness. At the heart of the house is the Great Hall, where Rowena vividly remembers her mother's presence and tells me how the house was lost to the family in 1992. We used to have a settle here where my mum used to love sitting. She'd be <laughs> draped in cats, sitting there as close as possible to the fire. <laughs> and that was basically a roaring of laughter, smoking lots of fags. <laughs> I mean, absolutely outrageous. She was such a character. Oh, my goodness. I so can you, picture her there right now. You can, that's amazing. So you obviously grew up here. And then in 1992, my parents um, just literally, it felt like overnight, suddenly told me they had to sell Pitchford. And my mum was the first person in the entire history of Pitchford since, you know, the medieval times to ever have to sell. And so it was absolutely disaster. But they were Lloyds of London victims, yes. both of them, same names in the disastrous syndicates. I mean, I mean, it happened so fast, I couldn't believe it. Oh, my goodness. So when they called you and told you, I mean, what did, do you remember that, that it, feeling? I, I remember it so well. I mean, James would tell you as well, I was sitting on the window so in floods of tears. And the um, incredible thing was, my husband is just as passionate about Pitchford as I am. Obviously, I was lucky enough to grow up in this idyllic house. But he um, immediately is a very positive person. He took me to this old oak tree and we made a vow there and then that we'd try and do everything in our power to get the house back again. Oh my God! It took us 25 years of trying and trying and trying to get the house back. And here we are. And so. Here we are. Oh my gosh! Like, I mean, Rowena. I so, mean, and to see Edward oh, and Serena and Georgiana growing up and having the wonderful opportunities so, that I used to have. Yes. That's what really moves me. And people have been unbelievably positive, and it's such a story of hope. And it's it's been the most incredible experience. Oh my goodness! So you spent with James. 25 years doing everything you could yes. to get this house back. In 1992, after valiant efforts to try to save Pitchford Hall for the nation, including debates in the Houses of Parliament, nothing could be done. And in September that year, the hall was sold. So there was the, um, all the contents had to be sold. So Christie's were kind of all over the place, like putting stickers on all our things. James and I were here taking stickers off. Meanwhile, my parents have completely distraught and have gone off to Mexico. I mean, it was just appalling. Oh my goodness, Rowena. The house got sold and I, in 1992, it was probably the worst possible time to sell a house given the sort of state of the economy and everything. They sold it uh, for under a million, like 700,000. I mean, no. nothing. They also had to pay back every penny we'd ever got for the roof, the 200,000 my dad had, you know, English Heritage gave us an amazing 80% grant for the roof, we had to pay that back. And then all the uh, contents got sold through Christie's. Through Christie's, and who bought it? So in the end, I, there were a few people who were interested, but the best option my mother thought was this Kuwaiti princess, because at least she had lots of money and she's talked a good game in terms of wanting to do lots of things to it. And, uh, and she was, of course, interested in the sailor yard, but she really wanted to have, loves horses, not houses, is my 
Suspe right. Suspicion, yeah. Right. So she was here really for the yeah. stables. She really wanted the stable yard because she had an Arabian stud farm and that was the thing that was really important to her. So she didn't want the land. So we kept right. the estate. She had a ridiculous situation where we had all the estate, thousand acres or whatever, but minus the house. From the moment the house was sold in September 1992, Rowena and James vowed to somehow, one day, get the house back. I, I really hope my mum would be happy to see us here today. Oh my gosh, she must be, you know, <laughs> jumping up and down for joy in, um, in greener pastures. I mean, that is, what a story that you got. I mean, I mean, but just the determination that you and James had to get this back. Pitchford traces its roots as far back as the Roman period, and you can really sense the layers of history here. Out on the estate, there's a special place where Pitchford derives its name. So basically this is the kind of most incredible thing. There's a natural phenomenon of pitch, like black sticky bitumen, you won't yeah. believe this, seeping up through the ground. And that is why it's called Pitchford. Because when I show you this incredible pitch well, next to, it's next to the forge. And I was ah. always told that it's a sacred place. And that's why there's this incredible aura of goodness around Pitchford. Oh Goodbye. my goodness. So here we go, Here's the, this is the pitch well. But it's so cool. <gasps> so I, I still get excited by this every time, and I've done this thousands this of times. This is the pitch. Wow. Basically, <gasps> this. Yes, yes. You're going to see. Look, can okay. you see? Can you see? There's so much of it. There is. Don't you think this is crazy? And yes. it's just. And if you smell it, it you... smells oil. Oil. Yeah. That's it's exactly right. Natural oil. And they think what? that. So there is a lot of Roman stuff around here because we have a Roman road going through the estate and we're part, you know, tributary of Watling Street. Right. And they think the Romans would have got so excited when they found this pitch that they might well have built a temple under the church. And we don't know for sure, so that's another thing to be discovered, layers right. of history. Yes, and yes. And so there we are. <gasps> this, so this is, okay, this is the pitch well, but is the pitch everywhere or is it just, just here just here just, just here, here. <gasps> just literally here this, this is it i'm always fascinated by how these houses um have their names the origins of them and so the pitch there and then we're coming up to the ford the here ford. and then there's the pitchford family who were here in the medieval times and the pitchford church was built by one of the pitchfords and the pitchford medieval house is under the tudor house is and there's a crown oh. post in the attic that i'll show you that proves that it's the medieval house that the pitchford family used to live in so right we feel very much that they're incredibly important part of the of course, well, is of the story. So underneath the house that I see now, this Elizabethan half-timbered house, underneath is the medieval. The medieval, the guts of the, you know, a proper kind of open fire, the classic medieval hall. Wonderful. Yeah. And then when exactly was the house that I'm seeing now, when was that built? Yeah, so my answer so there was a rich wool merchant called Thomas Otley. So in those days, they could make incredible fortunes yes. of wool, believe it or not. And he um, bought the house, in, the, the estate in 1473, um, but obviously didn't start building the house really until about 1549, I believe he started. I'm very excited to uh, to show you. This is a door that we always used to use. I mean, obviously that's the front door where guests and things come if there's a right. party, but this is like the normal door. <gasps> that's my bedroom up there with the bars and the Oh, yes, yes. To stop me falling out. So when you got the keys to the house, so this is 2016, yeah. September 28th, you, 25 years later, <laughs> you get the family house back. You work so hard, you buy it back. And is this, the door you went through or was it, what happened? No, so this is the door and basically <gasps> I, I bet I was shaking so much as you can imagine that I couldn't get the key in the knock <laughs> and then I was like crying half with joy and half with laughter and half with I don't know what emotions were going on it was oh absolutely crazy but I was like literally shaking here we go oh, so come on in so this is 
Oh my god! My usual front door. These are the stairs to my bedroom. This wonderful cantilever staircase where my mum kept all the millions of tins of cat food for our three cats. And so then, you walk in here, you get the keys. This is the very first room I went into. This is our old anti kitchen. And this is, again, where we used to have breakfast. But the first thing I saw was obviously the ceiling had collapsed and that was like, oh my goodness. Part of me is I'm thinking, um, having flashbacks, because basically this is one of my favourite rooms. It had copper, beautiful copper pots and pans all around the room, all got sold at the Christie sale. We've no idea who bought those. Um, this incredible, um, you know, range, which is the, very similar to one at Hampton Court. I don't know, there's so many different feelings, but the most ridiculous thing, and this is what really moved me, is there was a newspaper, my mum and dad's Telegraph newspaper from 1992 still sitting in, in here. It was just, just there. No. Time had stood still. No. It was insane. So you walk through here and you... And there's this newspaper. <gasps> and there's this newspaper, 1992. Oh, just still no. sitting there. It's just, like, oh, she's yeah. Inside. But just still sitting there. Hadn't moved, just where my parents left it. As we explore, what's clear is the enormous projects Rowena and James have on their hands. But by opening up part of the house as a holiday let, they hope to fund the repair and restoration of some of these rooms in the former servants' quarters, which hark back to a different era. Gardeners and butlers and right fish women. Yeah, of and, course. And a number of incredible maids and, and wonderful people. This was the um, luggage room to the left here, just an entire room just dedicated to suitcases. Um, I am really embarrassed to say this used to be my kind of um, fun room, and I, I did actually, I did what possessed me to paint it this colour. But <laughs> as a teenager, I thought that was uh, the thing to do. So you painted this this bright red colour. Oh, no, How so old were you when you painted it? Oh, when I was about 13. <laughs> I thought it was super cool. I had my record oh. player up here. Fantastic. So this was for you growing up. What did this room represent? Yeah, this is my own space to right. have you know, my friends and just yeah. kind of do whatever I wanted up here. So, but, but was it nice to see, I guess in one sense, when you came up after 25 years, at least the red was still the here. The red was still here, <laughs> I know. Oh, no. The red colour. And then I also love this room for a different reason because there, I was always told that there's this lovely little cubby hole with the window. And then my mum's psychic friend um, came and he said that there were these maids totally overexcited because they see that their master's coming home for Christmas. Right, wait, so these were the ghosts. I am always fascinated about ghosts because we do have one grey lady in the Tudor room at Matberton, but how many ghosts do you think you have here? Good ghosts at, at Pitchford. So this will make you laugh. So my, this is a direct quote from my mum. She, she was told that the entire house was stuffed full of ghosts <laughs> and they were all very lovely ones. <laughs> and they were all very lovely ones. <laughs> that Edward, is Edward was serious. I, I have smelt, uh, so my step-grandfather smoked these incredibly pungent cigars or cigarillos um, from Latin America. And so very often you get a whiff of the smoke. So I've totally smelt that and that got really excited when I was 13. I smelt the smoke and then you go running off to tell someone because you're so excited. By the time you come back, nothing. Nothing, right, and right. Then, and then Edward, uh, I was in the Great Hall when you saw, well, tell Julie what you saw. Well, the first time I saw a ghost was when I was about four and like someone who was doing work on the house had like just left. And then like, I saw this black figure and I was like, hmm, I said hello to it. And like, it just paused, looked at me, and then like just carried on walking oh. outside of a door. Can it look like Darth Vader? <laughs> and, and then he was a bit rude because he wasn't talking to you. I remember yeah. that. <laughs> For some reason, like ghosts don't come where there's like for more than like one person. I mean, that's what they usually like to do. I mean, they're walking around when like there's no one there because they know that like, no one's going to see them. Right, exactly. And then maybe they think of like children as won't get as scared, so they come out. Whereas adults can get, I think, yeah. a little. Yeah, I think you're right. It's a good theory. Quite shy. <laughs> yeah, that's a good theory. So, Edward, do you ever come up here and play a little bit of hide and seek? Or no, nope. no, nope. <laughs> no, nope. no. Nope. Um, what do you think of the red color that your mommy painted when she was thirteen? Uh... <laughs> So a bit too, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what possessed me. <laughs> I, mean, 
I think it's brilliant. I thought it was so cool at the time. But where are we in the house? Obviously, yeah. the servants uh, used to be the servants' quarters, but not when you were growing up. Yes, it's really the Victorian wing. And the way I would best describe it is the classic Tudor part is an Elizabethan E-shaped house. And then they added a servants' wing on and it became an F shape. So how many rooms in the house are there? Yeah, it's an excellent question and I think it's partly a subjective answer, but I'd say maybe like 40 or 50 rooms, but um, now there's 52 because I discovered two more rooms, which I didn't even know about when we got the house back and went round with the children because they obviously wanted to see every single room and explore every inch of Pitchford. Careful of the dodgy floorboards. I will be careful of the dodgy. Look at, put these. Look at this. This is what we. I mean, this is like. This, you see this? We've got an insane amount of work to do. The ceiling, yes, the ceiling everywhere. But there's something. I know it looks like the ceiling's about to collapse, but it's there's something rather beautiful about it. I completely agree. I mean, my um, <laughs> husband's nephew got married at Pitchford recently. The first wedding we'd had in, since the house had um, had come back. So in 25 years and Gabby, his beautiful wife, had wedding photos taken here and they looked fabulous. Yeah, it's very, I mean, you know, this is what people want. They want this sort of rustic, um, run down, shabby chic, shabby chic. <laughs> the ceiling's about to fall through, but no, but this obviously is a lot of work though when you want to. Yeah. No, I mean, it is a huge amount This is a massive work. amount of work. All right, so what room are we heading I to next? I really, really want to show you this special room. So this is what well, I was always told. My mum was always fascinated by all the ghosts and everything. We always had lots of wonderful psychic people. And one, oh. so I was always told that this room in here is unbelievable. It's got the, the lady. <gasps> I can feel it. <laughs> it's got, especially, it's, it's you always good. feel the kind I of can rustic feel that. Energy. I feel, I'm, I haven't, I, I'm walking into the room now. It feels now. different, doesn't it? Oh my God, it I feel like everything's tingling. I can feel, feel like, it. So Is this weird? It's so bizarre. So the lady who's in here was like the, <gasps> um, the, the head servant lady and she was just apparently this life force, incredible woman, power of positivity and she loved protecting the house and apparently there's an aura of goodness that protects the house oh, and, and this is this, this you can actually feel you that can feel it energy you can feel it and i love that the room is this pink color too because it's sort of a happy color well it is a happy color that looks fun this looks like an old fuse box here i heard the clicking and I had to look over. It's an old fuse box, obviously completely detached. That looks like a fun, fun project. I think that you can already tell, I've, you know, I've only been here for half a day and I can already feel the good energy, not just in this room, but all around, yeah. all around. You can feel it. And, the, and uh, my great aunt taught me to do water divining and there's just so many incredible things that happen yeah. in Pitchford. In and people just feel alive and happy. just about to meet Rowena and James and it's a beautiful day. I can see that they're waiting for me there. Oh, they're so lovely. They have some wine waiting for me. We're meeting at the Orangery, which is one of the first buildings James and Rowena restored when they returned to Pitchford. Can I first, I'm gonna do lots of these, so I'm gonna do one right now because I feel really honored to be here, um, I have to say. And just, your story is, I mean, it's one of a kind, remarkable story. And it really sort of tears at your heart when, you know, not when I was walking around with you today. Yeah. And just, I think we can hardly believe it ourselves. Yeah, it's yeah, it's yeah, do you story. still feel sort of five years on? We do, we do. You still kind of pinch yourself at times and think, look, you know, it's, it's been five years. But that, you know, I think it's really important to have that sense of excitement and, and keep on having that sense of excitement. If we ever take Pitchford for granted, that, that is a complete disaster. So, yes, but you do now and again have to remind yourself of, of that <laughs> initial kind of excitement. Yeah. when Rowena walked through the door, uh, and, and, you know, after yeah. 25 years. Yeah. You made this pact, you were going to do everything you can to get Pitchford back. Mm. And those 25 years, can you just talk me through, 
really the ups and the downs of it. And did you did you really feel you could do it? No, I, I, I think there were there were absolute times when we thought we can do this. And absolute times when we thought it's, never gonna, it's just <laughs> not going to happen, not, not open hell. Um, so it, look, it went in kind of waves. We, sometimes we felt kind of confident there were things that were happened. Right. Sometimes we'd hear kind of gossip from, you know, let's say the village or something, and it looked like it, it, it was possible. Right. And other times, yeah, we just thought it's never going to happen and yeah. we, we should forget this kind of dream. But we never quite did. Did, yeah. We always knew this day was a brilliant platform to kind of launch, uh, you know, potentially a bid for the, for the hall. So we spent those 20, 25 years building up the state, doing up derelict uh, buildings, farm buildings, and turning them into kind of holiday cottages. Yes. Trying to make, you know, essentially the funding that would then make uh, going for the hall kind of possible. So yeah, we did. We, we spent 20, 25 years just yes. building on that position. Right. Uh, and then, then it eventually happened. Yeah, yeah and, and working full time, both of you. Oh, no, yeah. that was a very, really important part of it. <laughs> yes. We spent most weekends out here, and what was absolutely brilliant is though we, so many of our friends were part of that hope. So they'd come up, we'd have, we'd start off with the lodge. My mum let James and I have the lodge as our weekend thing, and then we eventually turned that into a holiday let. That was the very first commercial thing when my, um, you know, after my parents and everything. But the, um, the, the joy of the friends willing us on is what I was thinking about, the impetus and yes. everyone rooting for us, basically, yes. which was really special. Yeah, no, I mean, the, I mean, again, it's the most remarkable, you know, story of saving and getting back the, the lost family home. Well, cheers to both of you because this is just the start. I can feel that and I cannot wait to explore more and see what you both have done. Oh, no, thank you very much. much. Cheers. Thank you. Pitchford Hall, to me, is the most remarkable story I've ever heard of a historic house being saved by the family. I mean, it's inspiring to hear James and Rowena talk about the 25 years that they took and worked towards getting the family house back is inspiring in itself, but now they're on this different journey and it's about getting the treasures back, but also making sure that this survives for generations to come. What they have done to save this historic house, it will be talked about for years and years to come. Pitchford Hall is layered in history, with much of the building constructed in the 16th century, during the Elizabethan era, when this beautiful half-timbered style was the height of fashion. I attended the first day of the you of the sale. There. there were two days. Oh there were two God. days, and I went to the to, to the first day, and all I mean everything, pretty well everything, was sold on on that on that day, and everything we go out. Let's say, say that lamp or the court cupboard, we go out of that door, go into the marquee, go to the auctioner's kind of thing, and and, and the gavel would come down, and that's oh gone. And this is our kind of bible of. of what happened in 1992 in terms of the Christie's catalog, right. and so, how many items are there? A I mean, it's thousand. a thick book. Yeah, it's a that huge is book. A thick. So, how many there items in total? A thousand and forty-seven lots. And forty-seven. Um, so yeah, that's why it's two days. Oh my goodness, that just gives me chills. It was it was a bizarre atmosphere of, in a way, it's quite social event yeah. because people were interested in uh, you know what was happening at, at Pitchford uh, and you had hundreds and hundreds of people and everyone in a sense wanted to kind of own a, a piece of a piece of Pitchford. You're on a treasure hunt now you've, you've it, got the house back yeah. you know the house itself yeah. the walls of the house back it's now starting yeah, to yeah. fill it with the yeah. treasures that it once had. And what has that process been like? Yeah, look, I, a treasure hunt is absolutely right. That's, that's exactly what we feel. And that, look, I, look at, I look at a piece of furniture just over there, and that came back from Shropshire. It was about 20 miles uh, from here. It was owned by a woman who was downsizing, and she wanted it to go back to, to, to Pitchford. So, you know, every room I go into now, I can see these objects from, from the treasure hunt yes. that have returned. How many of the 1,047 objects do you think 
you now have in possession? I think it's probably only about 50. So oh there's, my that, goodness. there's a huge treasure hunt ahead of us. For James, of the thousand or so pieces still to find, there's one in particular which he would love to see back at Pitchford. There are a number of items that, that you know, I feel really important to me. And there was one that was the uh, cabinet table. So it was, in, it was in number 10 Downing Street. It was used as you know, Gladstone, the prime minister, uh, as his kind of cabinet table. And it was given to, I think, uh, it was through the Lord Rosebery family. And the Lord Rosebery family was a, a British prime minister. And his daughter owned Pitchford, Lady, Lady Sybil Grant. Oh, yes, so yes. that feels like, you know, I'm very interested in politics. I work in politics. Yeah. Having, having that cabinet table back is really important uh, to us. And there's one painting by the early 19th century artist, James Ward, which would have pride of place back here. So it's only, it's only really good painting that has kind of Pitchford Hall in it. Now it's also got uh, a horse, a beautiful horse, but obviously we're interested in, in uh, Pitchford Hall. And th th this is it, in the Christie's catalogue by James Ward, uh, painted in 1822. I assume, and I'm not sure if the artist ever uh, you know, came to Pitchford because it's a slightly different landscape, but I, I assume he kind of romanticized the landscape. But the importance for us is, it's just a wonderful picture of, of Pitchford Hall with the smoke kind of billowing out of the many chimneys at, at, at Pitchford. Yes, but this horse, it's, this is for me, this in one way or another represents the Queenie Princess. It does, and it's, the so, horse. it's so true. And it's all of a sudden the horse yeah. is looking on. Yeah, it's startlingly, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's incredibly ironic because it, is. it calls, I mean, the, the, the painting is a, a bear Arab uh, horse. And it looks exactly like the horses that the Kuwaiti, previous Kuwaiti yes, owner yes. Uh, had, at, had at Pitchford. And, and you're absolutely right, it's looking uh, yeah, slightly askance yes, yes, uh, and, and at, at us. As word gets out that James and Rowena are on a treasure hunt to restore the family collection to Pitchford, people have come forward with some of the pieces sold in 1992. And there was one particular lady who said, look, I've got the painting let's work towards you kind of getting it back and these these things take time yes they're not necessarily easy um and the funding wasn't there you know we didn't have the funding no. to pay for that painting and amazingly i did during um lockdown uh like like you did we did a few kind of virtual virtual tours and there was a um a man from texas from houston in, in texas <gasps> who we did a virtual tour with, and I mentioned the importance of the Jenkins and Barb painting to Pitchford. And he said, um, James, I'll, I'll, buy, it. I'll buy it back for you. No. <laughs> yes. And you've never met him. But he just said, look, James, I'll, I'll, oh my goodness. I'll give you some money. That just gave me chills. That is incredible. So do you have, is, where is the painting now? Uh, um, we are going to, uh, going to uh, hang, hang it. it. Yeah. Okay. Is it here? Yeah, you know, it's, 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 in the, oh. it's, in the, it's in the porch. <laughs> so I get to, can I, can I help a little bit? Yeah, no, well, <laughs> I love you too. I love you. Oh. We, hey, we need it. It's, it's, oh quite a big, it's quite a big painting. I am so happy I'm actually here on a day that, you know, a no, treasure no, no, gets to be hung and be seen. This is it, everybody. The moment has arrived. One of the big treasures is just about to come through the door and we're going to hang it. And this is so exciting for me and for James and Rowena, uh, an incredible, incredible story of a treasure being recovered. Yay! Here it is, this is so exciting. Oh Here we go, Judy. Wow, holy cow. Oh my goodness. How do you feel, right? <laughs> well, look, I, we, we've spent, you know, five years <laughs> trying to get this painting back in to the hall and it hadn't hadn't been in you know right. this left in 1992 okay we're just gonna hang it in the in the drawing room yep in the drawing room very gently beautiful um it's, oh my gosh it's giving me chills but it's such a it's such a prominent yeah painting okay mm. shall i yeah 
I might learn something here as well, how to hang. <laughs> well, Rupert's yeah, Rupe the, Rupe the expert and has, has helped us kind of hang all the yes. paintings in the, in the house. Now, do you want me to help at all? Do you need me to hold anything? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah? Just, just stabilize it would be okay. just great. Right Thank you. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. Ready? Yeah. Let's see. Hang on, let me do double check. Yeah. It'll be on that J hook. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Oh my goodness. Can I let go at the bottom yes. here? Yeah. You're fine. <laughs> I know, you just. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's best to level it by eye anyway, because nothing's straight in this house. Exactly. Okay, let's go back and see. It looks, I mean, wonderful. Just. You know what, out of all the paintings that were sold in, in the Christie's, you know, having this one exactly, exactly, it, it, exactly. now, because yeah. there's life in this house yeah. again. Yeah. And that represents the smoke coming out of the chimney. It's, life has returned. Then, I meet up with Rowena to visit someone very special who has kept the spirit of Pitchford alive for over 30 years. So we're heading off to, you, um, is it Violet? Is so, right? so this is um, the North Lodge where Vic and Vi, very, very sadly, Vic um, unfortunately died quite recently, but we were so, so fond of him. But Vic and Vi have been here forever. They're absolutely sort of the earth, the most wonderful people. She's like my granny. <laughs> And they used to look after us in the good old days when we had Pitchford. So they name my mum and dad. They call my mum Mrs. C, my dad Mr. C, and they're just brilliant. And I can't wait for you to meet Vi because she's such a character and she knows everything about the ghosts, my parents. I mean, she's fabulous. <gasps> there's Vi, there's Vi. Oh, hi, Vi. This is Julia, this I'm is Vi Roberts. Hi. So nice to meet you. I've heard so much about you. We were just oh, walking down. Oh, I hope it was good. Um, it was all good. Oh, good. How long have you been here at Pitchford? Uh, since 1989. Okay, right. Mm. So you've so you've seen it when obviously Rowena's parents were here. Oh yes. And then three years later, 1992, yeah. it was sold. Mm. And was that? Do you remember what that happening and what oh, was yes. going on? Oh yes. And it was horrible. Yeah. Over those 25 years, who was looking after the house? Vic and Vi, <gasps> they were the custodians. You were the custodians. Mm. So you would go in and do what you could just to make sure that it was still standing, really? Well, the, we couldn't do much because there was no furniture in there. Right. So there wasn't an awful lot we could do, but fight dust. Fight dust. And that was a continual battle. Yes. Uh, but um, apart from that, we kept the rats out and we kept the mice out and, but <laughs> right. it was deteriorating rapidly we could see it it was breaking my heart yes to see it falling apart yeah i kept saying to for god's sake raise the money and buy it back <laughs> right <laughs> did you think that that was possible did you think because when i was speaking to oh, her, i knew they would you did you did mm, i'd got faith in them i knew they would so how is it now just having Rowena and james's children around so you've got edward serena and georgiana does it is it feeling like because, of, of course, it feels like it's back to life, but for you, having seen these changes, the sadness of the of the cell of the house. Yes, but you do, um, you look positive now. Yeah. Um, that's gone. Yes, yes. I want to ask both of you, um, and it would be interesting to see if it's the same or if it's different, but if you could, if there's a room in the house that, is just your favorite room. I know I have one at Mapperton. Mine is actually a loo. <laughs> I love that, I love that. I'm obsessed with the Thunderbox loo room <laughs> at Mapperton, and I think it's because as an American, we don't really have Thunderbox's loo, but all in that loo, we've decorated with all of the Earl of Sandwich oh, um, painting, well, sort of pictures if you like. Yeah, but is there yeah. a room in Pitchford that holds some great memory, <laughs> fond memories oh, for you? Kitchen. 
kitchen, <laughs> definitely my kitchen. I took you in there, the yeah. oven, the tea the ovens are still there and I can still picture you making all that amazing food and that terrible time where the whole thing roast fell on the floor. <laughs> what happened there? That was a disaster. Can't you beat me to it though, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the Labrador. The Labrador grabbed over this leg of lamb and took off with it. <laughs> it was snack there. Luckily, I'd got another piece of meat in the, in the fridge, thawing out for it the next day. And I had to grab that and tell them, lunch will be a little late. <laughs> For me, I think it depends what mood you're in. I mean, I love the attic, and sometimes if I'm in a contemplative mood, I'll go up there, or the great hall with that roaring fire, it's fantastic, or obviously my bedroom, um, my parents' room. I, don't, I, I find it yeah, impossible it just to get one yeah, room. It's so chill. And, and, and the Life Force lady room, that I go in there, I love that one. Yeah. I love the whole house. Yeah. I don't you, know what to say. Yeah, no, okay, well, don't. But you've given mm. some great examples. <laughs> I know it would be so hard. I think for me, because... If I were to ask my husband the same question, yeah, if he had to pick a room, I think he would choose, like you, yeah. it just depends on, yeah. on the mood that yeah. he's in because yeah. he grew up in that house. And what do you feel would be, I guess, a hope for you and what you, how you would see Pitchford in the future? It's going to go from strength to strength, there's no doubt about that. But. I don't suppose I shall still be around, but I'd love to see that little boy taking over here. Oh, boy, oh. Yeah, I, oh. I won't be around, oh. but I'll be looking down. Oh, oh boy, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh I got tears oh. in my eyes, oh. Yeah. But you will be around, you'll just be in a... A different place. In a different place, yeah. but you'll still be here. Yeah. <laughs> Pitchford Hall is layered in history, with much of the building constructed in the 16th century, during the Elizabethan era when this beautiful half-timbered style was the height of fashion. It may look stunning, but it needs a lot of repair and restoration. I hear you're going to be putting me to work. Yes. First of all, we've got to spray down this uh, exposed panel that's failed, because lime needs lots of water. Okay, so I'm just going to have to have you back completely up because you're the professional yeah. and I'm not. Tell me a little bit about the history of this exterior and what it takes to repair it. Well, it's, I mean, it's, this house has you know, been built over many years, but uh, this bit's Elizabeth in this section. Right. And uh, it's in a bit of a poor state, unfortunately. Yes. It's not much what was done for 20 years, so... Uh, it's uh, an ongoing thing. Every summer we, we start and keep going and then uh, down tools for the winter. And here you are again. So yeah. how many years have you been working well, on I've been Pitchford? on this for five years. Five I started years. on the medieval section, which is just over there. Right. Um, which has been turned into a holiday let. Yes, yes. It, so it can pay its way. So you're now on the Elizabethan part of yeah. the house. And what are you doing exactly? What are you repairing? I'm repairing all the plaster panels. Um, right. They're, they've been repaired with varying different materials. So we're putting it back using the, the right stuff, ah. the, the right techniques. So it will last because the wrong stuff, like cement and other things, it just uh, damages the timbers because the building can't breathe. That's why we use the lime. It would have all originally been lath. The brick infill was just done because it was easier. Now it's explain to me concern. lath because... The lath is a wooden cut or split and it's um, timbers like um, such as beech or oak that split and you leave the small gaps. Right. And then you press the plaster in. And yes. the plaster falls through the back and we call those snots. Okay. In, in our, in our, in the, in the <laughs> they, they just dro they droop through and then once it's, it sets, it's, that's the key, it goes rock hard. And it goes rock hard. And you build it up over layers. Right. Whereas the brick infill there was done much later because it's easier. Because each, each slat has to be nailed in and it's so... But right. the problem that you have with the brick is it puts a lot more weight on the building. So you're here on the Elizabethan part now. I see you've got... The, that's the lath there. That's original. Ah. Because they are just hand split sections. So you today and well, for the past yeah. five years, you're taking off the paneling. Yeah, that's failing. That's failing. And, the, and where the wrong materials have been used. Big question for you. How, do you call them panels? Yeah. Yeah, how many panels have you restored so far? Well, I did the other side as well, hundreds. <laughs> yeah, hundreds. And how, and how many more do you have to go? 
Thousands. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. There's a lot. It's it's, it's all over. But it's we, we we're just prioritising the, the, the stuff that's really failing. That's, that's letting water in. So you will repair all of that. No, you will. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to put me to work? Yes. Okay. So what do I? What do first you need is, to do? And what do I need thing, to do? Lime needs lots of water because it's not like cement, which is, which is a chemical reaction. Lime reacts with the atmosphere. So okay. It needs to stay wet. So my first task is to dampen the area we're going to be working on. All of it. Yeah. Inside. So I can definitely see through here. Yeah. I can see the Just, interior wall, right? Yeah. And then the space in between. How am I doing, Nick? Good. Yeah. Just make sure you get the edges of the timber because it, oh, yeah. it's very dry timber and that will suck the moisture out of the plastic as it goes in and dry it out too quickly. And what about the timber on the inside there? That's fine, there? No, just leave that, that, don't worry okay. about that. It will get wet, but it'll dry. Okay, okay. I see. Then it's time to prepare the lime itself with one key ingredient which will help fix it to the timber. Yeah, well, lime's quite, it's, it's pretty strong, but we want to bind it together. And the hair, all the fibers, give it its strength. So even if it cracks, like you can see all these cracks, it won't fall out because there's thousands of hairs in there that just, it's like, fi it's like fiberglass, so it's right. the same sort of principle. So oh here we've got, this is, this is a lime plaster. Okay. That was um, made from uh, lime putty yep. and uh, sand. And then this is the hair here. This is, this, I had, you get it no, in these, I had no idea. You get it in these rounds. <laughs> this, this is um, Chinese yak hair. Okay. Where it's goat hair, horse hair. Anything's good, really. So what you have to do yeah. is sprinkle it bit by bit. Oh my goodness. I... So if you want to, and then In... you have to hand turn it. You can't mix it with the, mechanically because the hair just binds round and you end up with a big, like a fur ball. And how do you know how much hair to put in here? I, obviously a lot more. Yep. <laughs> I'll... I'll be... You tell me. And can I just ask you now that we're mixing, how did you, get into this line of work because you know the thing about is these historic it. houses yeah. is the, the craftsmen and you're far and few between these well i know i just the thing is i, I like i specialize because i just love old buildings in a right. perfect place to work perfect place to work yeah we forget all these wonderful traditions and the way that things you know were made you know i think we're ready now ago. This scoop is, a little bit up yeah you just get it on the trowel and you press that in gently. Because what we want to do, we want to press this through the laths so they form those uh, snots, as we said. Yeah. And then just keep yeah, I have going. to have you watch. I have to, you have to do it first. I've got to see okay. this first. Right. I cannot do this by myself. So I'll just get a little bit <laughs> I on. I cannot mess this uh, up. <laughs> I'll never be asked back. Oh my goodness. So I, mean, I just wiggle it on. And it's the first bit you press in, so it's almost, so I know that that's gone through there because it's only very thin. And we'll add more to that. Okay. The plaster can't fall through because the hair is attaching it to the rest of it. So even when you've got big gaps there, it will fill it. Oh my gosh. So once we get it like that, we'll then build it up just a few more mil. And right. then you have a different type of plaster goes on the top. I'll and how long the... does it take for this to dry? Um, well, it's not the drying we want. Oh. It, it's the chemical process. We want oh. we want it, the, the the carbonation to, to to happen. To happen. So, I'll be able to top coat this maybe in about three or four days. Right, right. So I'll cut. We'll cover it with a sheet. We'll wet the sheet too because we don't want it to dry. Because if it dries, ah. it cracks, it, and it literally will start to fall out. It'll start to fall out. Yeah. I see. All right. Let this me... is why people use cement to cut corners because it goes off in a few hours and it's hard the next day. Right. Whereas this. Takes three to four You can't days. rush it. Right, it's, it's, right. So, I'll hold that. Okay. That's your. Okay. Oh dear. Okay. Don't worry. It's. It... I can't mess it up. <laughs> I'll put some on your trowel for okay. you then. Okay. This is, I have to say, one of the most exciting things I've done. I know that sounds crazy. So, you... well, I guess I just tilt it up when you get it on there. Just. And go up above here. Yeah. yeah? Tilt. D yeah. And just. And push just it gently up. push that up. That's it. Perfect. All right. And that's it. And you keep adding, adding, adding. Okay. And you build up the layers. Oh, it's, you know, it's wonderfully soft. So do you want me to go up? Yeah, keep, yeah, keep going. 
This is so much fun, but thank goodness I'm under the careful guidance of Nick, who specializes in these traditional techniques. This has got quite a lot of hair in it because we've got some big gaps here and you can also use it to repair the holes in the timbers. So we'll add even more hair because then they, this can be colored and stained to, to match. It's quite satisfying. It is. It's really satisfying. Sorry, that was a bit messy. No, there's no, it, it it messy is fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. Oops. Gosh, I, I want to make it perfect, but I guess it doesn't matter. Sign your name in it, so. Put your, put your initials. <laughs> Can I? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do JH, everybody, for Hinchingbrook. Somehow Hinchingbrook needs to live on, so I'll sign it with JH, Julie Hinchingbrook. Oh my gosh, thanks. Thanks, Nick. It's rather exciting. It's left for three or four days, then another layer is applied before it's covered in five coats of lime wash. You certainly need to be patient in this job. What we were just doing over there yeah. is this yeah. finished. When I apply the top coat. When you apply the yeah, top coat, right, yeah. that is that finished. Yeah. And then you have to cover so it's, it up. It's three, it's three processes really. It's base coat, top coat, and lime wash. And lime wash, okay. Now you have, these are all covered up here. Yeah, it's, just, it's because it's sunny and it's, and it's hot. Right. And again, it's just like the lime wash because it's made from the same stuff. If it dries too quickly, it fails. It fails. <gasps> and I'll, this will be soaked tonight with the uh, water, so... So you'll soak it again yeah. with water. So should we pin this yeah, one back I'll up? Yeah, tuck that up. And these have all had the same first coat down here. These have yeah. all been first coated by you throughout. Yeah, they were done today. This, right. Yeah, yeah. So how much... So those were, you've done one coat, and then how long do you have to wait to do the next coat and then the next coat and then the next coat till you get four to five? Um, probably a day, a day or so, Dad. two days, I would. Oh my goodness. You can, you can tell really, it, 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 it's just, it's, it's not, it, the, the elements decide it as well. So right. it's, it's, you just gotta Right, just so it's a it. long process. Yeah, and, and this, is why it's, this is why restoration is expensive, and that's why so many people cut corners using the wrong materials, because you could do this in cement and have it painted with a, with a masonry paint in, you know, two days. Right, whereas this is... It takes weeks, yeah. Yeah, now I also hear that there is another project that you're working on yeah. that has a royal connection. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Can I come visit you later? Yes, of course. Okay. Yeah. One of the things about historic houses is that they usually come with a lot of other buildings. And back in the day, those other buildings would be used really for the family or for the staff, but times have changed. These historic houses have to find new ways to generate income. And so here we are at Pitchford, and you can see I'm walking through what really were the old stables, but now they've been repurposed by James and Rowena into workshops. And I can really relate to this because it's the same thing at Mapperton. We have old buildings down there that we need to repurpose and use them in a way that will help generate income for the estate. So I'm heading now off to see uh, a sculpture here, and I believe it's this one right here. Hello. Hello. Michael, I was told to find you here. Um, I'm Julie. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I've just been um, looking around the stable mm -hmm. yard mm -hmm. and how it's been repurposed yes. into yeah. these wonderful workshop spaces. Yes. I've been here six months or less in terms of actually working here. And um, in that time, all the other spaces have filled up. Right. So it's an incredible hub of people now, and it's uh, it's just really exciting. You stand, you know, you go outside the doors, and you you bump into the next person, and you know they're making something, they're creating something. something. So yeah, it's really full, filled up, and it's um, yeah, lo lovely place. Is this your space to kind of create yeah. and yeah, escape to and create? Yes. So talk me through though the process. It starts with a uh, series of drawings, really. 
Um, there's a lot of research that goes into the sculpture, uh, both in terms of context, how it will sit in its final position, and, and also because it's a Michael, you know, the symbolism and key features that I might want to pull into the piece. So how tall will the final piece be? So the final piece is going to be 1.3 meters. Right. And it's um, a little bit less than me, so that's yeah, quite big. There it we is. go. Yes, yes. Yes. And it will actually stand um, a couple of almost, I think it's about 1.5 meters off the ground on ah. a plinth, a one side of the chancel arch for a church just outside of London. There is such a creative community here at Pitchford and wonderful spaces still to be developed and restored. Where are we now? This is um, where the farrier used to um, <gasps> operate. No. Um, there is talk of getting someone in to come and do and get, the, get, it, get it working again, but it actually does all as a small Look hole. Look at in. this bellow. Is that a bellow? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Excuse oh the, the scaffold. Oh my goodness. And obviously it was operated by Harry. No. And it, Look at this. It needs tuning, but it does. It does work. Here, I'm going to yeah. give Harry's bellow a blow. Oh my gosh, I've never... Do these still exist, these big bellows? R rare as hen's teeth. That's what uh, I was yeah. about to say. Oh my goodness. This is incredible. Yeah. Oh, and that's the bench for... That's for... The... Yeah, there would have been an anvil here as well. But yes. Because that's, <gasps> see, a very heavy duty. Right. So this is, this is an opportunity for... Yeah. An artist to come in here and... Yeah, maybe do courses in metalwork. Do work courses. And... Fantastic. That was fun. All right, I see some bits right there. That makes me think... Lime washing. <laughs> We're on to do some more. Yeah. So where are we heading to now? This is um, a tree house. Um, okay. And noted to be the, the oldest one in the world. What? The oldest tree house in the world. My understanding is that this was... Um, Queen Victoria. She had, when had she tea stayed here. Yeah, she, yeah. When she stayed here, she stayed in the main house and. Uh, and she took tea here. Yeah. And it's the oldest tree house in the world. It is. And we're going to repair it. Well, <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's been unsensitively repaired in the past, so. Uh, so you've got the scaffolding up, I see. Yeah. Fantastic. S similar work going on as as down at the main hall that we saw earlier. Ah, so you've got. Remind me what the. That's laugh. Laugh. That, that's that's, it. that's new stuff I'm putting in because someone had put steel mesh and had used cement. So oh. I've removed that. The tree. Up. Oh my goodness. And why is there metal? There's massive, there's lots of holes. I mean, it, it, is, it is like a zoo in there. There's that many animals <laughs> living in it. So, uh, and it's, it's hollow, it's grown, it's fallen down. Oh it's my regrown. goodness. But yeah, but it's still. Yeah, it's a lime tree. Yeah, it, it's it, lovely. It has a lot of mistletoe on it last year. It's all been removed. Oh. It's beautiful. All right, should we go up? Yep. Okay. Right. Yeah, I quite like this scaffolding. I feel like I could do some acro yoga on this. Yep. And I'll come on up. Okay, great. Before we start to lime wash, there's obviously a drone right yeah. there. Right. We can wave to everybody. Because <laughs> there wasn't enough room up yeah. for um, the entire crew. Right, so tell me, Nick, what we're going to do now. This is lime washing. So yep. it, it, as we said before, it needs five coats, well, three, four to five, ideally. So this has had one. Right. So it needs to be wetted down to, to help the, the chemical um, reaction. And then... Um, and then we can paint it. I, before we start, the one thing I do want to point out, which I think is fascinating for me to see, and I think probably for um, everybody else, is that you almost have the different stages here. Yeah. So you have the lar... This, this is oak. Oh, this is oak, right. From, from the estate. And then these are stainless steel screws. Yep. So there'll be no corrode. It, it, it should not need repairing for right. a, a very long time. And then this is what we did earlier on the yep. house. That's ready for its top coats. Right. And then it'll need to be lime washed like these. And it'll be right. Oh my goodness, because I can see the hair. So okay. if you want to give it a spray. Oh my gosh. Wow. And you can see it almost, it'll start to look like this. Yes. Yes. That's an, yeah. So you have four more coats really yeah, to right, do. That's, an, that's it. Is that enough? Right, yep. Yeah. And then? And then this is the lime wash. Oh, it's, it's like the consistency of, like I said, single cream. Yes, it is. It's exactly so like it single cream. It does flick everywhere, so be careful. Okay. And then just 
I work from the top because it drips. Right. Don't try and work it in too much because you can you can remove. Ah, what, what has already because it's wet. Yeah, because it, well, it's it's the other the other one's still reacting. So can I do that. To, if you want to have a go. Okay, and you go I'll, side I'll to the, side. Yes, yeah, so I just, just let it let it run down. Okay. So you start on the top and work your way down. It doesn't matter if too much of it goes on the oak because when I'm, when it's finished, we'll use a wire brush on all the oak just to clean oh, you it up. Will. I was going to so, ask so you. So that. that will all. Okay. It's quite because it's so runny. It's quite hard to not get it on. Yeah, it is so runny. And it looks like you're painting nothing. It looks like yeah, you're not so doing anything. Weird. But it has that lovely chalky it, look. Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Do you think I've done yeah, it? That's it. Should I hand you this? Do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll, we'll just reverse what we okay, did. Okay, yeah. And... Like many historic houses, Pitchford has hosted the royal family over the years. In 1935, the future King George VI and Queen Elizabeth visited, and back in 1832, the then Princess Victoria spent time here. James is showing me a very special room in the family wing of the hall where Victoria stayed. I think it's wonderful, James, <laughs> that you have this big connection with Queen Victoria. Yeah. You know. So. <laughs> she's the second most popular queen, right? <laughs> right. So look, th this is where we think she, she slept. And, you know, over, over the years, there, there are a number of kind of guides that have been done for Pitchford. Right, And some right. quite, you know, quite a long time ago, near, obviously nearer her, her stay. And they describe, you know, her being in this room you know, really, really well. I'm just coming, I just love all the carvings. So they- Yeah, I mean, one of my theories is, I think that face looks like, if you look at what Queen Victoria or Princess Victoria looked like when she was a 13 year old girl, when she visited Pitchford in 1832, that's what she looks like. Right, right. Now, so is many it... people think I'm talking absolute rubbish here, but I think if you had, if Victoria had visited Pitchford, you know, that's something you celebrate. Of course. And you know, my, my view is that they have planted this on, on, the, on the fireplace, just, just as a kind of yes. reminder or, or kind of, uh, uh, you know, just remembering the fact that Victoria was in, this, with, was in this room in October, November, you know, on a cold, cold night in Shropshire in, in 1832. There is a similarity to to Queen Victoria, and, and you know, we also have to remember that when royalty visits these yes. historic houses, it's all about celebrating them and making sure that there's some type of memorabilia, if you like, right. of, of that right. visit. That's so, right. you know, I look back at Hinchingbrook, and of course, there's the bow window for Queen Elizabeth the yeah. visit, and and there it is, 1562, yeah. and it was yeah. made after she came, but in celebration that she had that, been that's, there. That's right. So that, that's why my, that's why I think right. I'm right, yes. but everyone thinks I'm wrong. I'm, I'm going to agree uh, with good, you. Good, I, I think good, you're right. Good. I think it was her mother who apparently drew her bed up towards the fire right. to keep warm at night. And poor Princess Victoria was apparently pushed <laughs> towards the end of this room, <laughs> you know, where it wasn't so, right. where it wasn't so warm. And, um, there's a little line on the ceiling, and oh, yes. what we think is there was there was a, a another room, ah. no windows, pretty airless that Victoria and very cold that Victoria would have would have stayed in for the five nights she stayed at Pitchford, and then her mother had you know this room and, and right. the kind of warmer warmer the warmer room. part. Right. And if you remember, there wasn't a great relationship between mother and and, and you know thirteen year old princess yes. at the time, so that kind of makes sense to to me. So. Just looking at kind of around the room, there are things that kind of, you know, help you understand, yes, it helps you understand. the relationship. I find it endlessly fascinating to read the architectural clues left in the fabric of these historic homes. And at Pitchford, there is a rare secret room called a priest's hole, where visiting priests would hide during the English Reformation of the 16th century. Is it so, here? Yeah, yeah, I mean... You try, try and find it, but I'll, go, I'll give you a, 
okay. give you a, give you a bit of a hint that it's in this this in this kind of broad area. But is there a door? There I mean, is a door. Yeah, there is a door. So and it's not it's not a trap door. It's not it's not on the it's not on the floor. It, okay. Okay, okay, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it. I think maybe you're doing. I mean, you're doing well. You did. There's a little lever to. Yeah, you're almost oh. there. You're almost there. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That's it. Oh my that's gosh. It. That's it. That's no, it. no. So this is the priest. Oh my gosh. So it's quite <gasps> a. No. It's quite a large priest hole, or, or pope's hole, as they would be called. Go down. Uh, really? Go down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll hold the trap okay, door. Okay. Hold me the trap door. Okay, everybody. I'm descending the priest hall. Wow. <gasps> There's windows down here. Yeah. Okay, so, so there are very, very few priest halls in this in this country with you know windows. <laughs> yep. And we we think it was and Rowan always describes it as kind of false window. So we think maybe it maybe it's boarded up. Or there was some vegetation outside that basically disguised it. But I must admit, if I was in a priest hall and there were a whole bunch of soldiers trying to find me, I'd quite like an escape route. Yes. And this this provides uh, an, an escape route. Um, but so, it, it is it is a vast. You know, but was this priest created hall. during the Reformation? So, so it, it, no, you're absolutely right. So, so there was a woman called uh, Mary Otley who who lived here in the kind of late late fifteens, early sixteens, and she was obviously a recent and you know she worship the Catholic faith um, and you know they I'm sure she would have had priests there yes. and she needed to protect them uh, right. and, and that that you know that window I think is actually quite important <gasps> very important but they're very few I think they're only about three in the country that That's... actually have a kind of additional kind of accessory of normally course. it would just be a small priest hall and you'd be you know, yeah. claustrophobic and, right and no, you'd, no, you'd exactly. be stuck if they found you you'd be stuck oh my goodness it's incredible it's absolutely that was incredible. I mean, literally, I've, first of all, I've never seen a priest hole in a historic house, so that was sensational, but also just seeing the windows. They're open there. Wow. I'm on my way to the tree house. But again, this just isn't any ordinary tree house. This is the world's oldest tree house. And also in 1832, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary that she walked the grounds here at Pitchford, went up the stairs to a house on top of a tree. And that is where I'm going to right now. I'm gonna have tea with Georgiana, that's Rowena and James's eldest daughter. And I'm really looking forward to it. Give you a hug. <laughs> um, I've heard all about you um, from your parents, and then I also realized that you're the same age as my number three. I have four children, and you're the same age as my number three. <laughs> so, so um, uh, this is such a magical place. I've already spent so much time here, and still lots more to do. But it's a magical place. It is, especially here, <laughs> up in the trees. I know, it's incredible. So Queen Victoria, she was actually here, where, we're, so, where, we're, where we are now. While you're sitting, Queen Victoria was in this area. Um, so on the 27th of October in 1832, she was on her tour of the realm when she was 13 and she stayed at Pitchford for five days and then recorded the whole stay in her diary. And she describes going up to a little house in the tree, um, playing a harp with Lady Louisa Jenkinson, who lived in the house at the time, visiting the old dairy. And so it's just amazing to like, see into the like, life of a 13-year-old princess. So was this tree house already here? For... So, yeah, this is the oldest tree house in the world. Right. So it was built between <laughs> um, 1650 and 1670. And then it first appeared on a map in 1682. You're kidding me. Oh my goodness. We, so I kind of feel very special right now because I'm obviously in the oldest tree house in the world and I'm in the tree house that Queen Victoria yeah. was in. Yeah. So when you were growing up, you, obviously you were told stories about mm -hmm. Pitchford. So yeah. because obviously when you were born, it had been sold. Your parents only had just the surrounding yeah. estate. But what other stories, you were, you were told obviously the story of 
Queen Victoria coming yeah. here and that this being the oldest tree house in the world. But what other stories were you told of um, here at Pitchford that you can remember before you yeah. got the house back? Well, I've always been really intrigued because I would be hearing about this woman called Lady Sybil Grant. And so she was, um, she lived in the house, but she didn't like the sound of running water and she was afraid of being so close to the graveyard because of the ghosts. <laughs> And so she converted the orangery and she literally lived between the orangery and the tree house. You're kidding me. <laughs> no. So she didn't live in that No, she, she in completely hall. moved out. Her husband lived, you can see his like his room window through there. Yes. And she would communicate to him via semaphore um, through or a megaphone through the window. Oh, and then <laughs> megaphone. <laughs> yeah. And then occasionally they would meet for afternoon tea on the lawn. But um, every morning, her maid would bring up her boiled egg on a silver salver to the tree house. So she spent a lot of time up here. <laughs> <laughs> so she was very eccentric. Right. And um, so also, she dyed her hair with henna. So it was bright orange. And she would tell fortunes. So there would be fairs at Pitchford, and she would tell fortunes on the lawn. So you grew up with these stories being told mm -hmm. to you by your parents. Yeah. And because obviously your mom grew up here but you weren't able to go into the house. No. You just saw it from a distance. So we would like quite often walk past and we would see it over the river and it would just be like really dreamlike, like imagining, I would always imagine what it would be like to like live in the house and my mum would just be telling me all these stories. And so it was like always a dream to get it back. Like, right, yeah. It was like a childhood fairy tale, but I never thought it would actually happen. Right, <laughs> And no. so now like all the time, my whole family have to like, completely like pinch ourselves every day that we're actually like here. And were you here when she went into the house? So oh. basically we came back, um, the first weekend we got it back immediately, we came up. The whole house was completely empty. Like there was nothing, no electrics, no water, like absolutely nothing, just cobwebs, <gasps> layers of dust. And so, but we were determined to see, sleep the first night. So we all came, <laughs> um, it was like amazing and unlocking the door, I still remember. And um, then we basically spent the next few months mopping every weekend, like, <laughs> and cleaning. It was in 2016. Right. So I'm 17 now. I think I was, I think I was about the same age as Queen Victoria. Right. So I remember okay, feeling yes. Yes, exactly. connected to the tree house when I was in <laughs> thinking exactly. that she was like my age when she'd visited and it was really, yeah. I love being in this tree house and then hearing the stories of Queen Victoria and Lady Sybil. But I have to ask, once you got the house back, mm -hmm. Was this one of the first places you went yeah. to? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I like, I just love this. It's like such a quiet space, but it's also like you feel really connected because it's so old and like you think about all the stories of all the different people up here. And I think, yeah, it's amazing. I, I like to come up here and like read or have little tea parties. Yeah. And so, and also the view. It's the just view. like, you're able to look at everything and look back at the house. So, I, yeah, I love up here. <laughs> Now, I love a cold water dip, and for those of you who don't know about my love of cold water immersion therapy, let's just say I take every opportunity to plunge into freezing cold water. At Mapperton, we are restoring the 18th century pool with the generous donations from our patrons of Mapperton Live. And here at Pitchford, Rowena is taking me to the Victorian plunge pool. But just a reminder to always check with your doctor before you go wild swimming. Oh, Ta-da! Can't wait. This has your name written all over it, Judy. No, I have to say, Rowena, when you told me that there was a Victorian plunge pool here, <laughs> I immediately packed this, my swim cap, and my swimming costume, but I'm quite jealous of your swimming costume. You look glamorous. It's oh. fashionable. What is that? It's a Victorian bathing outfit, of course, an antique one I've got especially for our wedding night. In fact, the very last time I wore this, I went for a plunge in the pool, and this is the next time after that. <laughs> I'm so cute. That is right. So this is your first time doing a plunge in a while, well, right? I'm not so bad about cold water because I'm rather thin like you. Yes. I mean, you're much braver than I am. You're a wild swimmer. So it's basically spring fed. So oh, it's spring, literally yeah. like the coldest water. So I think it might be even more freezing than Mapperton. We'll have to see I what know. you think. The Victorian pool is a short walk away on the estate. But we think it's built by Lord Liverpool, part of the kind of pleasure garden thing that he, he absolutely loved Pitchford and made it all singing, all dancing. Right, 
and his you... daughter was the one who was friends with Queen Victoria, so maybe they went for a dip, you never know. Oh my goodness. I bet they probably did. She didn't write about that in her diary, no, she... but I like to speculate. <laughs> <laughs> I'll speculate with you. Yes, I agree. I think this is literally yeah. the first time I've been in since my wedding night. Yes! <laughs> Good, I'm glad um, I could somewhat inspire you. Georgiana to... and everyone, they go in loads. <laughs> but... And so here we are. I can't wait to show you. It's literally the most perfect. Oh. Look at that oval pool. It's, we've got the plug <gasps> and pitch food. This is the perfect plunge pool. It's perfect. Oh my goodness. So the only question is, Julie, would you like to go on the right hand side or the left hand side? Right. I think. Well, okay, so I'll go down that step. We can kind of go down together. Remember, it's just a sensation. It's just, just a sensation. sensation. It's, it's just, just a sensation. sensation. It's just a sensation. That's what I say to myself over and over again. That's As we go mantra. down, we're just set sensation and breathing. It's just a sensation <laughs> and we're breathing. It's just... I'm going to get a yoga lesson on the way past me, though. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm we're... learning a lot here. Just a sensation. Just a sensation. Just a sensation. Just a sensation. Breathe. Oh. Wonderful. <laughs> boiling. It's boiling hard. Oh, this, is this is the first time I've been in since my wedding night. Now, can you start to feel? Incredible sensation. Just, <laughs> You're going to have a nice face. I've got garlic. Got garlic in my teeth. <laughs> um, what do you guys think? We I'm did it! <laughs> we did have an audience behind, um, which is great. But do you see how, it's can you start to feel how the, se the, the, sensation. the sensation starts to come in? And then it's like amazing. And it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. So I think we've done it. Is everybody happy? Yay! Yay! <laughs> Yay! <laughs> So excited to show you the attic, Julie. Oh my goodness. You know, this is what I love about these historic houses. There's always attics and secret places. What do you guys think of this attic for hiding? Or is it too scary? Too scary. Too scary. <laughs> too scary. <laughs> this is incredible. Let me ask first and foremost, when you came back in 2016 and you came up to that attic was this at least okay as in more than okay i mean just so good to see it like this because my parents spent 10 years doing the roof in the 80s so the one fantastic leg i mean my parents legacy was the house would have fallen down in 25 years if it wasn't for the roof so to be able to come in here is very reassuring and the green oak that was here originally and it's just the guts of the house isn't right it? and as you can see from here the other thing that reassured me was the bats are still here and that's a, we had a um, plague of bats in the 80s so it's nice to see the bats the, still around. the bats were, were still around i mean absolutely stunning just to see this that these have really survived for gosh Hi, almost 400 years. Yeah, yeah. Let's look it, how brilliantly they, these they've are survived. Brilliant, but it's it's vast up here. I mean, to think that the servants used to live up here. I mean, there are taper marks. So that's why this was yeah, built for the servants yes. to live up here. And they hung their curtains on these poles. Oh, no. So I, that, when I see that, I kind of can picture an actual person, yes. you know, Downton Abbey style, up here. Absolutely. <laughs> Right. It's literally like Alice so, in Wonderland Julie, up this, here. <laughs> this is this is the clock tower that's so kind of prominent. <gasps> you know, when when you're on the when you're on the South Lawn and you're looking up yes. to the house. And <laughs> Edward's just testing it. So this obviously used to used to work. There's a mechanism which was just here, which is being restored at the moment. And then there are these huge oh kind of goodness. weights down there and a pulley system. And a date of, can we find a date? I've already spotted it. <laughs> what was it? Well, 17... because it's 1776. Yeah, it's cool, isn't so, it? So, but is that an American connection? I don't know. I don't know. But because it's, that's I when know. we've really, yeah. you know, we declared yeah. our freedom. Yeah, no, I know. 1776. I know, it's incredible. We've got to do some research yeah, on no, this. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. So anyway, look, it's, it's been there. And we, we look, it's, it's another job for us to, to get this kind of restored, yep. get the mechanism working, get the kind of pulleys working and get this, you know, chiming out on the hour or every every half hour. 
And before we make our way downstairs, Rowena shows me a rare structural treasure of Pitchford's medieval past. So this is the thing. So in the 80s, they're doing the roof and I, there's huge excitement. They basically suddenly discover, if you possibly could shine a light, yep. you will see a medieval crown post. So it proves that whole thing there at the back, the, the bendy bit. So that's where the Pitchford family... Oh. So this house is built on top of the Pitchford family house, which I oh. love. My goodness, so they Isn't discovered so cool? this when they were yeah, redoing so we the roof? Yeah, we didn't even know it was here. We knew, we obviously had... Yeah, I can see that. We, we were very sure that it was likely, but no one had proof. And then this and is so your proof right it's here. It's basically here. Look, it's called a crown post roof. And very little crown post roofs survive because they're so incredibly old from the medieval times. But this is a little piece of history to prove the point. Absolutely. I mean, w wonderful. I mean, it's, it's just, I mean, you'll have more and more treasures. I mean, don't you find that with these historic houses? I mean, I know you yeah. grew up here, but oh, no, you're we're back still you're still, you still discover yeah. over and over again. You still discover. We're learning all the time. Yeah. One of the first restoration projects the family took on when they moved back to Pitchford in 2016 was the summer house. No small task as it had completely disappeared under a web of ivy and moss. Well, I can see here that you've repaired this. Yeah, yeah. You, you can also see all the woodwork. <laughs> well, the woodwork. Uh, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So there's a bit more to do. But. but this is one of the big restoration projects that you have completed. And what is this called again? Remind me. So it is, I, I call it the picture of summer house. Right. And it is, it's Edwardian. I, I think it's Edwardian. Yes. It's probably, we, we've got, we, we appear in country life in 1901 and 1917. Between 1901 and 17, it appears, the summer house. I and, see. and all these kind of uh, red sandstone retaining kind of walls. Right. Uh, so quite a lot of work was done in, in the kind of early Edwardian yes. uh, ages. And, and this is, in my view, an Edwardian summer house. So it's a huge transformation. And one of the first jobs we did was actually get up on the roof. I remember with my, my father, who's 80, 85 now, and we were just cutting back the ivy kind of on, on the roof to try and get things back so at least we could see yeah. what we had to restore. <laughs> uh, and the, 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 the roofer has done a brilliant job. Um, these are called Harnage Stone Slates. They're quarried about three miles away. Okay. Um, they're, you know, they've got loads of fossils in them. They're absolutely stunning. That should give it 30, 40, 50 years of, you know, life. Hopefully. Exactly. And an, an enjoyment yeah, exactly. for others. I exactly. mean, it's, it is beautiful. But I know that this is not the only renovation that's been completed. Yeah, It's quite that's a big right. one coming up. That's right. Celebration. There, 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 is a, there is a big one coming up. <laughs> and... It, it was it was inspired by someone actually lives in a, a historic house about 10, 15 miles away from Pitchford, called Acton Rand Hall, and he came. He knew Pitchford very well uh, when Rowan's parents owned the, owned the house, and he came to us about a year and a half ago and said, "You need to restore the library. You know that's your number one priority." And you know we <laughs> we've done it, and he came up with a design based on uh, a Hampton, uh, garden in Hampton Court, a Tudor garden right. uh, in Hampton Court. And it, it's, well, you know, you'll see it, you'll see it soon. Um, it, it's quite wacky, it's quite wacky. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, I have lots of questions. Yeah, no, no, um, I, yeah, it's quite out there. It's quite over the top. I think um, it's absolutely brilliant. So when you got Pitchford back, what was in this library? So this this was this was very derelict. Um, it was one of the worst. It's one of the worst rooms in the in in the house actually. Right. So that, oh that was it. Oh my goodness! Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If, everything was gone, and this is what it looked like in uh, 1992. You know when when yeah. Rowan's parents left no. it. So, you know, it was a nice country house library Absolutely. and all the books were sold at the Christie's auction. Um, and then bizarrely, in, in the space between 1992 and 2016, all these book um, cases were stripped out. Oh. And we don't really know why. Uh, right. And that's why we ended up with, you know, a room that was, in, in a sense, a blank canvas and allowed us to, you know, create this neo-Tudor Gothic um, library. A lot of people have said to us, 
if you have got a blank canvas, do stamp your own mark on it. Don't you don't have to inherit kind of everything from yes. from other people's tastes, you know, Georgians, Victorians, Elizabethans, et cetera, et cetera. So we did feel we could maybe strike out yeah. in a slightly different direction. And we felt that you know, this, this was a beautiful library, yes. but we didn't we didn't need to we didn't really need to go back to that. But it was inspired by this man, you know, uh, Hugh Kennedy, who who, you know, lives relatively nearby and he said, This is this is where oh, I think you should no. go. Yes. And these are fantastic. Yeah, I mean they, those oh. those appeared about two, three weeks ago. Uh, and we had fun hanging them. Lovely. Uh, I mean they're heavy. Lovely, uh, but here, right heavy. here, and I do see on each of the uh, bookcases you've got different sort of coat of arms. Uh, so it starts with the Pitchford family in, in uh, the kind of Crusader uh, night, uh, and then it goes along to the Otley family, the Coates family, the Jenkinson family, the Grant family, Rowena's family, the Coltworth family, my family. Right. Uh, and we've even got uh, the Quixote Princess. Um, Do you? Marked, uh, marked, marked there. Oh my uh, goodness. So we, we felt, you know, she was part of that line from yes. what, 1280. Um, so we wanted to, you know, incorporate everyone's incorporate uh, coats of arms. Every library needs good heraldry, yeah, so exactly. this is outstanding. <laughs> it's, it's, it's fantastic. So we're having, there's a, obviously a celebration yeah, tonight. Yeah, it's yeah. sort of the commemoration or the yeah, cutting of it, the ribbon. It, it, it's to thank you know, it's to thank the volunteers essentially who, well, and, and the donors. So, you know, a lot of people who've donated money towards getting the library to this to this mm. stage, and a lot of people have donated their time in terms of painting. Yes. So through the winter, you know, those, those kind of long winter nights, there are about 20, 30 people in Shropshire just kind of painting away. Incredible. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's so kind of them. So yeah. th this is a so kind of thank you guys. Uh, for being so incredibly supportive of, you know, the yes. Bishford restoration. Yes. Now, time to join Rowena and the family for some more fun on the water. Here we are! Yay! Yay! <laughs> so... You're in for a treat, Julie. I'm really excited because I don't know anything about... Do you call it coracling? Coracling? You said it literally Cor perfectly. What is a coracle? And tell me about how this was a part of your growing up. Oh, no, absolutely delighted to. So a coracle, as you can see, is an absolutely fabulous, very simple fishing boat. So the essence was this is an iron bridge coracle. So iron bridge obviously being in Shropshire close by. So the, it was quite expensive to go across the actual iron bridge. So instead, they would um, have a cheap and cheerful way of fishing and getting across the river. How easy or hard is it to fall in? If you get it right and do the perfect figure of eight, which will be very, very simple to teach you, not a problem at all, not even a ripple. But if you <laughs> get a bit overexcited and things, then they can tip over very easily, which is really great fun. So I used to have a great time tipping all my friends into the right, right. lake in my childhood. <laughs> but I promise I won't do that to you. Okay. So you know that I showed you the pitch well? Yes. And the natural pitch was seeping up. So of course, look, these are tar-bottomed <gasps> boats. They are literally, so they come, that's how you waterproof them. So every year we used to, you know, the spring would come out, this amazing weather, yes. exactly this time of year, and we'd retar <gasps> the things all ready so they're waterproof, because obviously they start leaking off. Using your own using pitch. Our own pitch. So basically Getting we've got in. you, a, absolutely got you a life jacket. I'm sure you're a brilliant swimmer, Julie. So is, do, do I, am I rowing? So it's really a figure of eight, um, and it's very, very simple. I just have this feeling I'm going to fall in. I can, I just... You know, when you kind of go into things like this with no experience and you get this gut feeling that you're going to fall in, I think that's what's going to You're not, you're not going to fall in. <laughs> okay, are you, are you really holding on to this? Okay, so I'm facing out. Okay, here, oh yeah. Thanks, James. Okay. Oops, you see, okay. it, then you sit right in okay. the middle, perfect oh balance. Goodness. Do you feel happy? Yeah, I feel happy. Okay, now, so are you because balanced? I'm right by the... Are you balanced? <laughs> I'm by land, I'm balanced, yeah. Okay. And that's very gently, just don't do any sudden movements, you'll be fine, a little bit of a figure of eight. Yeah, just feel Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Oh! They're much more stable than you think, it's really... I'm trying to do what Georgiana was doing. Oh my goodness, this figure of eight. <laughs> what? You're so, doing brilliantly, Judy, that's perfect. Is, this, is it? So I'm watching Georgiana. Edward, how am I doing? On a scale of one to ten. Three. Three. Okay. <laughs> exactly. Okay, maybe you get it. Okay, okay, let's show. You, let's have a little. You're doing brilliantly. <laughs> Going in circles here. I mean, 
I mean, I got out here. So, so at least I didn't stay there going in the circle. I have to say, I found this incredibly restorative. It's, it's wonderfully soothing. I loved it. I would do this every day for my mental health. Every day. I loved it. I thought it was just brilliant. Awesome. But now it's just getting off. Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> Here we go. Thank goodness for James. All right, so okay. you tell me when I'm good. I, I, would, jump, I would jump quickly. Okay, great. Oh, gosh. Yes. Yay. Bye. Oh, Bye. I loved it. So I really impressed. loved that. I have to say, I'm happy I had my life jacket on though because Georgiana and Serena were telling me about the size of the fish <laughs> in there. So I was happy I, I had this on. That, that was brilliant. That was so brilliant. What better way to end my current visit to Pitchford Hall than to join the party celebrating the restoration of the library. Just walking in here, you can't help but smile because really this is Rowena and James's mark on things. They walked into this room in 2016 and it was wet and damp and empty and a clean slate and they thought rather than putting it back to what people expect us to do and what it used to be. Let's create something that people will talk about. And that's what you want. When people come into these historic houses, you want people to leave talking about something. And I'm definitely, um, I, I definitely will be talking about this and I bet you will as well. This extraordinary library that has been commissioned. And for me, the pieces that stand out are the chandeliers. I love the chandeliers because I love the contrast of this sort of very dark red and gold yellow with the blue and the yellow as well. And it's really rather wonderful. We ra raise a toast to Hugh Kennedy and the King Henry Library. <laughs> and everyone who helped, thank you so, so much. <laughs> What an amazing time I've had visiting Pitchford Hall. You can really sense the life and vitality returning to this historic home. Rowena, James, and their family absolutely... I have arrived, not just at the spectacular Dean Park here, but with my overnight bag because lucky me, I get to spend the night. Dean Park is one of England's most fantastic historic houses. It has roots from the medieval period and then it evolved over the Tudor and Georgian periods as well to what we see today. It's been in the Brudenell family since 1514, but it really did evolve over these six centuries. I'm here to meet and of course to stay with Charlotte and Robert Brudenell, who are the custodians of wonderful Dean Park. And I can't wait to share all the history with you and what's going on here on the estate. When I married into the British aristocracy, it was the start of a wonderfully exciting journey, but it was also a little daunting. I became a Viscountess, and for an American girl from a small town outside Chicago, that was quite a shock. I live with my husband, Luke, heir to the Earl of Sandwich, and our family at Mapperton House in Dorset. Living in a place like this is a joy, but also a challenge. And every day we're aware that we're preserving a very special part of Britain's heritage. Mapperton has opened up an extraordinary new world for me, and I can't wait to share it with you all. So if you love castles, 
and manners and stately homes as much as I do, please join this American Viscountess as I journey into the British countryside in search of some of Britain's finest historic houses. I'm hoping this is the right entrance because the doors are open, so I must be in the right place. But look at this fantastic courtyard. I definitely have a lot of questions, but I am spotting actually a lot of heraldry, so a lot of coat of arms. Hello. Welcome. I love the welcome, knocker. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> oh, lovely Ooh, to see you. So lovely to see you. Hello, Robert. How are you? Hi, how are you? Um, lovely to see you. Hi, now. I have some questions about the courtyard. Can we start there first? Let's go and have a look. Okay, this has history, doesn't it? Indeed, first mentioned in the Doomsday Book, 1086, so going back a very long way. Right. And then it belonged to the Sea of Westminster and it gradually got added and built to. So this section over here was added in about 1630s. Also, when I was walking in, I noticed heraldry, coat of arms. I And I did, there's coronets, there's, you've got a, We've got the Earl's coronets up there. Yes. For in the, in the hopper at the top of it, because we had seven Earls of Cardigan who lived here. Okay. Bru Thomas Brudenall was made the first Earl of Cardigan in 1660. Right. And he built this tower up there, so we've got more heraldry up there. Yes, you do. And with the flag behind it, in your honour. Oh, my goodness. Okay, where, where are we walking into right now? We're walking into the Great Hall, which we've just had redecorated two years <gasps> ago. And it's got a fantastic ceiling, oh. which um, is made out of sweet chestnut. And we were always told that the little weevils wouldn't eat into it, but unfortunately they have. Oh. So we've just had it restored and we've repainted the Great Hall in what would have been actually the original color. Beautiful. It's one of the last Great Halls that were built before they went out of fashion. We know it was built in 1571 because it says so on the mantelpiece right. over there. And it was, um, it was rebuilt because Queen Elizabeth came to stay here for the night. And Edmund Brudenall thought actually if she came back for more than one night in the future, perhaps she better have a bigger great hall. So he built this great hall, but sadly she never came back. By 1600, these great halls were out of fashion and yes. quite a lot of the houses split them into two levels. I'm just gonna throw this out there because as you mentioned, the mantle, I did spot some Montague lozenges. There certainly is a Montague connection here. Okay, should we save that for later? We will. <laughs> Charlotte and Robert open a selection of rooms to the public on certain days in the year, but we will venture behind the scenes to glimpse how Dean Park is still very much a cherished family home. Now you turn left, come through here. Okay. Oh my goodness. I think I need to stay here for a whole week, Charlotte. We've got a lot of books for you to read. <laughs> and we're putting you in the bow room. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. This is splendid. Okay, first of all, I love the colors. Um, it's enormous. Did you do this? You said exactly the right things. This is the one bedroom in the house that I have recently done up. And uh, it was a germaline pink faded wallpaper and raspberry carpets which were shredded. Uh, and it's quite a, it's quite a, a difficult oh. thing to know you've got to de decorate a room for the next 60 years. The other thing I did was I took all the books out of the bookcase and, and, and put my collection of Coalport china in there, Lovely. which is rather pretty. So you did this all yourself? Yeah. Well, I suppose I did, darling, didn't I? Yes. yes. I didn't and what do you think of it, Robert? <laughs> I didn't have a say in it, I'm sure. <laughs> I just we signed, had, um, signed, signed it off. But then you've also got, up the stairs, this is very important, a bathroom which has got the best no. view in the world. No. You're right, this is the best view in the world. The bridge I just walked over, and then look at these magnificent gardens down below. Thank you, thank you, thank you, both of you. This is, it is really a treat, so thank well, you. Well, shall we leave you to sort yourself out here and then come downstairs and have a drink? I did not expect this. When Charlotte and Robert asked me to stay, I of course said yes, but oh my goodness, this is, I mean, she's done just a brilliant job here. And this is what's so wonderful about these historic houses is the way that each homeowner, as they, you know, 
take over, if you like, um, for their, their period of time, they put their mark on it or they redecorate or they add something. And this is exactly what Charlotte's done in this bedroom. You know, she's put in such lovely, bright, happy colors here, but then kept the horse hair uh, mattress. So I think that's what we're always trying to do as homeowners is we're trying to make sure that, of course, we put our touches um, on it, and but at the same time preserving the past. The connection between the Brudenall and the Montague families reaches back to the 18th century, when George Brudenall, the fourth Earl of Cardigan, married Lady Mary Montague. What I love best of all is the map in the corner that shows that um, my husband and my son are all descended from, from God. Right, And right. as I point out, as we all are. We all are. You'll probably find a lozenge or three. I know, I, maybe. Yep, I already spotted it, right there. So when was this created? Well, it's, I Beautiful. think the bottom one is the third Earl of Cardigan, so it must have been early 1700s. So it would have been early 1700s. Yes. Incredible. Well, you can see down through here, and this is what I love, you can see the three lozenges up there, Montagues, and here is Sydney Montague, and guess what, Charlotte? Right below Earl of Sandwich. Yay! Yay! <laughs> right there, there you go. And so he's got his um, garter there and Jemima, the first countess, and off they go, Edward Montague, the Earl of Sandwich. Gosh, you've got a lot here. Look at this, Edward Montague, Lord Hinchingbrook. Goodness me. I mean, wow, we've really, again, another Earl of Sandwich, that would have been the third one, so, no, that would have been the fourth, so that would have been the, the one who invented the sandwich. Anyway, not taking it away from Charlotte here. <laughs> But what we're is, related uh, <laughs> is, is, is what it is. What we're we related. Kids and kin. Anyway, all I, I'm happy about is that we're related. <laughs> and look at who's here to greet us. Hello, Minta. 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 Now, I briefly walked through here on my way up to my gorgeous bedroom. As I walked in, of course me and my eagle them. eye, I spotted those Montague lozenges. There's center there, right there. And I'm, I'm learning a lot about the heraldry. So, you know, because we have to remember that during that period, if you were a grand aristocratic or noble person, you have to marry somebody from a grand aristocratic family. So when you did, your coat of arms would be impaled with the, the wife um, the wife's family coat of arms, is that correct? Absolutely, so you, you'll find in the middle there that they've got so many quarterings, it's grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents. Right. It was very, a very important part of the um, 16th century. Yes. And, and we've, got, we've got them also on the, on, on the stained glass windows we've got here. And the interesting story about this was that- Oh my goodness. On, I, I, early December in, in, in uh, 1943, we had an American air base of three and a half thousand <gasps> Americans just up, up on the hill there and they were flying B-17 Fortress bombers and one of them early in the morning had ice on the wings and it tipped over and was about to explode and they managed to get into the local village and say, get up, get up, out, out, out. Right. Boom, up it went. No. And it broke all the stained <gasps> glass here and Robert's grandparents stored glass on top of each other, which you don't do because the weight cracks it even more. And then it, after the war, um, during the 1950s, my parents and all got a grant to restore it and with the grant came you have to open to the public, and that's why we're open to the public. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Just like Bewley and so many English historic houses, Dean Park opened its doors to the public for the first time in the 1950s. And the Great Hall is still a highlight of the tours today. And this is the original panelling here. That is the panelling, the original panelling from when it was built in 1571. Now, I see we've got some polishing going on over here. Julie's very kindly helping us. Yeah. And I think you, you might join her, might Yeah, you? I would love to. So what are you using, big, to, using to polish it? A, a wax. Just a wax. Yeah, just a wax, yeah. Right. Put it on very, very lightly. It always go with the grain. Always so go with the, the grain. grain. Yeah, yeah. And little, you know, like, and you can feel it almost go, you know, it's, it suddenly goes smooth. Yeah. Do you try that bit? Okay. And, um. With the grain. Yeah, you just go up and oh, down. Yeah. And just And then just keep going. And oh, then you can yeah. feel it suddenly go smooth. You can. Yeah, yeah. 
Oh my goodness. It's wonderful to be polishing something that's, you know, Tudor period. Yeah, absolutely, isn't it's, it? You just, yeah, you, it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, you, you think you, about the people that made the, it and yeah. the people that polished it yeah, before. I know the people and, yeah, polished yeah, it before. You yeah, think yeah. how many other yeah. hands were on this. Exactly. It's wonderful. So, do you want me to do all of it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for a week. Thank you. What a really, really special place. And also knowing that this is one of the last great halls that was built gives it even more, you know, meaning to it. You, you, when you walk in here, you just think how wonderful. Thank you. We love it. Oh, yeah. We use it. We love it. So this is the moment I know I've been waiting for and hopefully you have as well. And that's really the history of Dean Park. It's been here for a millennium, really. And, but it's been, again, a part of the Bruno family since 1514, is that right? Indeed. This is the start of the tour and this is the billiard room. Um, originally in the medieval days, it would have been a parlor to the Great Hall. But I'm going to go back right to the very, very beginning. And that is that it's first mentioned in the Doomsday Book in 1086. And uh, so we know that it was here yes, in 1086. Yes. It was a monastic retreat. The um, See of Westminster, the Bishop of Westminster, owned a lot of land around here. And he would come up and stay here to survey his land. Yes. So it was a small monastic cell, a little square courtyard house. Ah. And it remained as such until the church realised that actually perhaps they could rent it out to families who would uh, let them, him come and stay twice a year and... And right, there. right. So in 1514, Sir Robert Brudenor took over the lease, because it was a lease then. It, this is the first room that our visitors come to, so we try to give them a little brief about it. Right. It's terribly important because it is the one part of the house where we have just one item of medieval. And that is in the far corner, there's yeah, a little we arch. Go visit it? There, was, there was an archway that went into a Catholic chapel. And okay. then the other important thing in this room is we've got, we've got the charter, which is right there, that creates Thomas Brudenor, the first Earl of Cardigan. During the Civil War, mm. King Charles I was trying to raise money. Yes. And Charles I um, asked him, and the son said, here's a thousand pounds for your fighting fund. When things come good, could you honor my father and his heirs? <laughs> he was very canny. In 1660, when Charles II came to the throne, he said, could you hurry up and honor the debt to my father because he's, he's 81. Right, So right, we need right. that quite quickly. Yeah, we need that title. So three weeks before his coronation, he was created the first Earl of Cardigan. As we explore the wealth of rooms here at Dean Park, there are a few surprises along the way. Oh my goodness. This is actually a very modern chapel. It was only done in the 1980s because the parish church had, it's a huge church, and it had five members of the congregation all called Brudenall. Right. And they froze to death in there. So my oh. mother-in-law thought, well, why don't we um, make our own little chapel? <gasps> and this was the billiard room, and we've just seen the billiard table, which moved yep. into the smoking room because nobody smokes. Yep. Um, and so she turned it into this beautiful chapel. It's wonderful. And do you use the chapel? We do. You William do? was christened here. We're having a service next on Sunday week, um, and we have a lovely little tradition here, which you can bring in when you live in a house like this. Yes. Which is that um, having gone to the um, the Royal Chelsea or the hospital in Chelsea, every service they have there, whether it's a funeral or a wedding or whatever. They sing the national anthem. We sing the national anthem here at the end of every service. No. Charlotte, this is incredible. Nuts. This is the tapestry room. Oh my goodness. And once upon a time, it had tapestries all the way around it. Okay, what about this ceiling here? The ceiling is dated 1597. Oh. And we do have some rooms above it, which we hardly ever go into because we don't want to yeah. bang and make too much noise. Um, on yeah. It. This Oh my goodness. I mean, can I just ask then, because would this be considered a pendant ceiling? Yes. Because, yeah. You can see the... the yeah. Because um... we have one at Mapperton in the Great Chamber. Again, Tudor, probably 1550. Um, but, this beaut but this is extraordinary. I mean, unbelievable. Oh my goodness. It's, it's this such a lovely room. Spectacular. And so when you arrived, Dean, had this been sort of done to what we're seeing today by your mother-in-law. She had, and actually it was, it was um, well, after I'd married Robert, it was beige, this room, and my mm. mother-in-law painted it this extraordinarily tealy, greeny, blue color, which I think is magnificent. Mm, it sets too. off her collection of Christian art. Yep. We've got a whole lot of Christian art. And you know what the great joy with these pictures in here is? Uh, I use them for doing Christmas cards. Do you? Mm -hmm. This one in particular, yes. I think this piece of furniture is the very oldest piece of furniture 
I think it dates from the early 1500s. Wow. Incredible. Obviously it was used in the kitchen because it's got lots of chopping marks on yep, it. Yep, yep, yep. Do you think we're rather bored of listening to us? Mint is ready to go into the next room. This is King Henry's room. This is the room that King Henry VII would have stayed in on the way up to visit his mother, Margaret Beaufort. Right. Who lived about eight miles north. Okay. And she was the reason that Sir Robert Brudenell took on the lease here because he was her finance advisor and her executor. King Henry the Seventh. King Henry the Seventh. His mother. Mother. His mother. We've got a picture of her here, Margaret Beaufort. Queen Elizabeth would have slept in this room when she came for her one night. No. Uh, I would love to tell oh, you that no. she slept in that bed, but she came in 1565, and if I'm a purist, that bed is dated 1580. Uh, so it was not okay. that bed. But she would have slept in this room, which would have been appropriate because this is where her grandfather would have slept. Right. And w this panelling that I'm seeing here, rather it... original, unique, single linen fold panelling. Yes. Yeah. And, and so when Queen Elizabeth was here, it would have been here. In this room, this would have been this here. This would have been here. Coat of arms. Absolutely. Absolutely been here. And then so... there was panelling at this window. And then, uh, as we are blessed in this house to have these little corner turrets, we have a bathroom no. using the panelling. No. Oh my gosh, this is wonderful. But of course, this wouldn't have been a bathroom when Queen Elizabeth was here. No, it would, it would have, have been, been a powder room. But a powder room, yes. right, powder yeah. room. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. So I'm in the turret right now. Yes. Oh, I love being in turrets. There's one room which sums up perfectly how historic houses like Dean Park and Mapperton are layered in history as each generation leaves their mark. But what does this date back to? I'm all about dates. Oh, we're, we're going back to about the, the 15, late 1500s, Jacobean time. So this is original? Yes. Oh, oh my goodness. Yes. This is original. Wow. 18th century, we've got a bit of Georgian panelling. Right, and then okay. We've got <laughs> yeah. 19th century windows, 20th century no. ceiling, because this ceiling is a work of art on its own and was done by Robert's parents in 1997. We've yeah. even got 21st century. What's My husband and I went to Jerusalem about four years ago. Right. And we bought this Ooh. in the market. So this is a real wonderful hodgepodge of centuries. Yes, it is. Yeah, I love it. What I love best of all in the room are the two pictures hanging on the Georgian panelling. Dean Park is full of portraits of Brudnells. He was the steward and he was born in the village, educated oh. by the third earl, came back and was the steward at Dean, running, running it all. And these pictures were given by the third Earl as a wedding present. Oh. And note the blue silk. Of, she's much prettier. Yes. And it passed down the Eaton family line and it came up for sale. So I said that it was incredibly important that we had hanging on the walls people who lived here. Yes. Who yes. are not called Brudenell. Right. So he's come back and hooray, hooray. Come on in. This is, this is my study, the oak mm. parlour. Lovely. Thanks. We've got a portrait of King Charles II there, who was the one who created Thomas Lord Brudenell, the first Earl of Cardigan. Right. Three weeks before his coronation. Three weeks because it was a debt that was owed by King Charles I, his father, who was. <laughs> yep. And then he said to him, Is he, that right? He, he honoured. He honoured the, he honored the deal from the, the money that was given for his fighting fund. Right. Uh, and so he was made the first Earl of Cardigan. And his, one of his mistresses was the Duchess of Port, Portsmouth, Louise de Carouai, and they had, um, their son became the Duke of Richmond. Oh. And the reason we have him here is because he married um, the first Earl of Cardigan's granddaughter, who was called Lady Anne Brudenell, and we've got a picture of her here. Right, well, at least the, um, their illegitimate child became a duke. They were so, all made dukes. They were yes. <laughs> 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 Fitz, Fitzroy, that's where the name Fitzroy comes from. Okay. Yes, because Roy is king and Fitz means um, the legitimate son. I didn't know that. Mm. No. That's a fun fact. I could win that at a quiz night, couldn't I? <laughs> you could. I could win that as a quiz night. Okay, thank you, Charlotte. Now, what I'd love to show you is the work of art that I would take with me. If there was a fire, I would yep. grab the dog first right, and yes, then the husband. And then I'd come back and I'd get this map which is from 1746, done by Brazier, and it's a map layout of what Dean looked like then. And I cannot tell you as a work of reference how much we have managed to understand from it. There was a river, yep. they added a canal, 
they merged them together mm. and then they um, built this huge oh, glacier right and they made an enormous lake yeah because those were the fish ponds from 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 the oh, um, right. medieval days this is wonderful so this is what you would take i would take this yeah. absolutely it's fantastic Look at Minta. Minta. Hello. Good. Yes. Come on, Minta. Come. Let's go. Minta must get a lot of steps in Good. this house. <laughs> she needs it. Have you seen how stout she is? I mean, stunning. The ante hall. Beautiful. It is well, beautiful. The ante hall. And it's because it's off the Great Hall. It's off the Great Hall. Right. So I think probably in, in medieval days it would have been a buttery and a dairy and a storage oh, right. room. Right. Yes, but now it's been made into our little little dining room. Yeah, well, it's, it's rather grand. I love it. Great. But we've got two lovely items in here. Right. Which I really want to show to you. One is the exercise chair in the corner. Okay. Do you know what an exercise Would you like no, to... No, is it, is it 18th century? I think... No, it might be 19th century. Basically, okay. without biffing your head, sit on it. Okay. So I can stand on this. Stand on that, yep. Okay. Sit on it. Mm -hmm. And you go up and down. Up. Hey, this is what they did, what, to That's work what their core? Yep. Okay. Yeah. We used to say to our son, push down lunch, make room for pudding. <laughs> oh my gosh, what? Do they think that they just didn't get enough steps around these big houses? <laughs> well, you're not doing any steps now, but no, it is. No. It's just working something else, it's working <laughs> yes. the core. Yeah. It's an. That is so crazy. And the second thing I wanted to show you, this was a, a gift to me and I have put around it all the most famous people who have been to Dean either for tea or for lunch mm. or stayed or for dinner. And we've got um, obviously Queen Elizabeth I because she stayed here for her one night. Uh, we have Prince Philip because he came here for the um, 1954 anniversary of the Charge of the Light Brigade dinner. And we've got Prince Michael of Kent. Um, I put Earl of Cardigan, but that's rather generic, isn't it? Because there were seven of them. Yeah, but still. Um, we yeah. also had a visit from Her Majesty Queen Mary. Queen Mary came for oh. tea here in 1937. Did she take anything? No, she didn't. She did point out that uh, she had something that we had, and my husband's Greek grandmother said, oh, we'd quite like it back. <laughs> um, but that's apocryphal. Right, right, um, what she right. did do is she went round, went round the house, and um, she sort of saw all the shredded walls and said, um, amazing family that's been here for so many years, such a shame there's no money. <laughs> I thought, plus ça change. Yes. <laughs> this is brilliant. This, I love this though, this sort of en place that is, it's very clever. For dinner parties. Yeah, for it's dinner great. parties. How spectacular Dean Park is. I met up with Charlotte and Robert for drinks in another beautiful room. Can you just tell me a little bit about this glorious room? And the shape, I think, is rather splendid because you've got sort of it, the square edges there, and then it has the... The bow, the, which yeah, is why it's called the bow room. Right. So in this room, we have probably one of our prized possessions, which is the Brudenal Tresham Library. And it is a very important late 16th century library where we have books that are written in Spanish, French, Latin, Greek, English... It's a collection that belonged to Sir Thomas Tresham. Right. And Sir Thomas Tresham's youngest daughter married Sir Thomas Brudenell, who was also an antiquarian, so a lot of the books were his. And Fantastic. I reckon that it was her wedding diary. This wonderful library was confiscated by the parliamentary troops in 1643 when they came to raid Dean. And the Earl of, um, Earl of Cardigan, who was then Sir Thomas, Lord Brudenell, mm. he escaped. And they took his library away, and he had quite an adventure, which I won't go into. But when he was let out of the Tower of London, he had to buy his library back. No. And the library uh, was uh, brought back, except for some of the books, which are now in an Oxford library. And right, but he was back. able to get the majority of yeah. or he's the collection. Furious, he had to pay them. Oh, so my goodness. I think it was more of a fine than a, than a repurchase. This is 16th century, most of these yes. books. Yes, and beginning of 17th century. Beginning. Yeah. In this library here, are, do you have a few favourites, would you say? I have one very special book here. Right. <clears throat> one very special book here, and I know where it is, because it's all under lock and key. Yes, yes. And this is the Almanac, the diary of Sir Edmund Brudenell. On August the 12th, in 1565, it has got Regina Apud Dean, 
So we have the absolute proof that Queen Elizabeth I came here for the night uh, of August the 12th and August the 13th. Oh my goodness. So when people That's say, oh, incredible. she never came to Northampton, she did. Yeah, she did. She did. She did. And, and she, she stayed here. For one night. For one night. You have this proof. Absolutely, we have right. this proof. You see, yes. that's what's pretty spectacular, that you have this in writing. So cheers to that. Absolutely. <laughs> cheers Indeed. to Queen Elizabeth I. Absolutely, and her one night stay. She yes. never came back, thank heavens. <laughs> <laughs> Today, I'm ready to get stuck in on a lot of the future projects that are happening here at Dean Park. I mean, Dean Park is vast. It's a beautiful historic house, but of course, we're always, as homeowners, trying to think of ways that we can incorporate more income to help to preserve this part of England's heritage. Good morning. This is, this is heaven. It's all heaven, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> Good morning. Can I just say, I slept. I was going to ask you. But do you think it's the horsehair mattress? I'm just going to shut that it's also, door. It's also because you're, you're, you're here, you're staying under somebody else's roof, so your um, worries also go yes. slightly. It's That's... very, very tranquil here. Yeah. Yes. You do hear the traffic, but, you know. It's the bustle of life outside. <laughs> yes, yeah. it was beautiful, but I, yeah, I slept like a log. Oh, well done. Do you do coffee, Charlotte? Absolutely, I don't speak until I've had a cup of coffee. I know. Sitting in here, the stained glass, is extraordinary. Was this always here? Not at all. No, we're looking at the remnants of a ballroom that was built after the charge of the Light Brigade to commemorate the great victory, or not victory. And there is um, a sort of gap. There was a, the, a Regency Arfilad that came through, right. and the ballroom went right outside and was designed by Crace. It was very high Victorian. Right. I think the colour of the stone was, was slightly yellower. Well. You, was slightly, you remember I it. I remember it, yes, certainly. But it, the stone, colour of the stone was slightly different to the rest of the house. So you it remember? Was, it was here. It was here. It was taken down in the, in the 80s. I remember we, we had a school here in the, in the late 60s, early 70s. And we used to play badminton in here. And uh, later, of course, when my parents opened the house to the public, we had, uh, we had teas in there and we had our 21st party in, in the ballroom and so this was so this doorway here that i'm looking that at door there i mean on for parties there were three big rooms the bow room where we were the night uh, last night then you open up the, the twin doors behind in, in, the, in the bow room into the drawing room and then these doors open and then you came into the ballroom and this was a double height room in here it was the there was a minstrel's gallery upstairs ah. up some steps and then downstairs was like it is now and then you walked through, uh, when, you right. came, when you came, went straight into the ballroom. I, can't, I don't think there were double doors here like there are now. Right. But uh, then you had the ballroom right to the far end, and the tower to the end was doubled height than it is now. My parents put it down. The floor was, level it, was the same, and they had underground heating. They had um, underground So hot this water. floor here went, went straight out. Went straight, straight out. out. Yeah. One of the things, of course, I love to do when I come and visit magical places like Dean Park is just to be able to get on, onto the estate. Because I think, especially for me, the American, when I first moved here and I would see these grand houses, these palaces, these manor homes, I just thought that was it. You've got the, the house and the history of the house, but then you've got the surrounding land and, and there's a lot going on. We need the land all around it because that is what supports the house. Every tile on the roof needs, needs some funding oh, somehow. Right. Um, and uh, we are very blessed here because we've got a whole lot of, of um, different ways of uh, d a d a diversification, I think is the word. Generating income, yeah. Generating yes. income, yeah. So today you're going to hopefully go and have a look at some of the things we've got, some of the building works that we're doing, which we will be able to um, have commercial lets with, and, um, and then see what we're doing with the ground, with re regeneration in, in terms yeah. of rewilding and the bees. We're very fond of our bees. And, and some of Robert's cattle. When you took over, you know, nine years ago, did you feel when you stepped in, there was still a lot for you to do? I mean, what was your biggest concern nine years ago? Uh, my personal one was being absolutely scared rigid. I'll quite honestly say that I was, 
I didn't like Dean. I didn't right. know how it worked. I didn't know how it ran. There was this sort of feeling that it's got to carry on as it was, and right. financially we couldn't do that. I felt really the newbie, and I was treading on eggshells everywhere. Uh, it was a very horrible, horrible time. But you learn, yep. and everybody's very helpful. Uh, and of course, my love for Dean is, is unquantifiable now. We have had a lot to do here at Dean in the last nine years. We had to re-roof most of the house. We had to put Wait, in central... We re-roofed, no. yes, but we did, I think, a half of the house. And a point I always loved saying when we do that, um, the scaffolding took six weeks to put up. The scaffolding put six, six weeks. We couldn't get a lorry close enough, so we had to walk it through. And also roses at the front, the flowers at the front. Uh, roses do not like iron, do not like scaffolding. And therefore we had to be very careful that if we damaged those roses, uh, it would knock the regeneration of those roses out for, for uh, well, a good 10, 15 years. Yeah, a good years. 10 years, yeah. yeah. The scaffolding went twice the height of this house. Can I rewind slightly yes, on yes. it? Yes, most people put a roof on first and then they deal with the central heating. Right. We did actually the other way around. We had a lovely, lovely expert who came to look at our books, our wonderful library books, uh, and sure enough there was white mould on them. So we had to get specialists in to come and unmould the books, in, particularly in the, in the Bowram Library. And at the end of it they said, that's perfect, but you do realise that after another cold winter the mould will be back and, and, you, and you'll see us again next year. Oh so goodness. we then realised we had to sort out the, the heating and we've put in a, a, a mammoth wood chip boiler, a mammoth one, which is incredibly noisy and I love it in January, but not in June. Yes. And um, so we put in the central heating in first and then and we then, moved onto the roof. And then you moved onto the roof. But those are two big projects because, you know, at Mapperton, luckily my in-laws had done the roof and that, I mean, that is, I don't think that, I know I didn't realise this until I had moved into a historic house you don't have a house without the roof, and the big, your biggest expense is the roof. And that is, so that was your huge, pro, I mean, one of two huge projects, because then heating Dean Park and getting that biomass boiler in would have been an enormous expense. It was. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> and it was, yes. <laughs> we are caretakers of the house, so everything that is done on the estate within the house is all for the good of the house. Of it's course. so that we can hand it over to the next generations so that, that, so that history continues. So that history continues, that's mm. exactly right. Well, I'm excited to get stuck in today and to see more of the estate, but gosh, I really did sleep fantastic. I texted my husband first thing this morning. I was like, I think we need to get some a few more horsehair mattresses mm. at Maverton because I still so I don't know, if well. you, can you still get them? I don't know if you can. Oh, well, there's still horses around, so oh, you must be able, able to. <laughs> After a glorious breakfast, I'm heading out with Mark Coombs, the estate manager of the Brudenell Estates, who is masterminding plans for the future here at Dean Park. So Mark, we're heading off on the estate, but I have just noticed, obviously, big wedding yep. happening here. Yep. Um, there's so much going on. We have to diversify the business in order to generate enough cash to really keep the estate going, yes. you know, put yeah. lead on the roof, as we say, yes. and yes. to be able to reinvest back into the estate. So one of our diversifications is, is weddings. Right. And we've actually got three sites that we do weddings. The estates are, are, are far more than simply agriculture and forestry. Yeah. You have land, yes. and that is an asset. And, and that asset has to be used wisely, both for, I guess, the continuing running of these estates, but as importantly, there's also a, a responsibility in, in terms of good quality stewardship and management for the wider community yes. and other stakeholders. It's lovely long grass. That's right. Yeah, I love this. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? It's so beautiful. So this is all part of a, a parkland restoration scheme. Okay. So we've stopped putting fertiliser on here about two years ago. Fantastic. Anything like that. And you can see the, well, okay. the butterflies, all the, all the biodiversity and vertebrate life has really, has really kicked in. It's beautiful. Yes. Um, oh. Yeah, we're, we're really, so this will get bailed off uh, at some point in August. Right, right. And then we'll right. actually have a music festival on here. Oh, so you are. Just, so you can do you, both. Yeah, you, you can, can do both. You can kind of zone it. Exactly right. right. Yeah. It's brilliant. Okay, so where am I standing? Because I right. do, I thought when we were driving, is yes. that the house there? So the house is just there, just through the trees, and you see St Peter's Church there in the yes. village of, of, of Dean, just here. So where we are now 
is really in the, the sort of the core of the estate. So this is a 500 acre parkland. Okay. Um, it's all part of the Brut Brudenell Estates, of which there are 10,000 acres. Yes. Um, and there's three and a half thousand acres here and a further six and a half thousand acres just in the Welland Valley in, okay. in, in Leicestershire. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is all part of, part, as, as you can see, this is all part of, part, of, part of our parkland. We've converted 200 acres of former arable land back into parkland. Oh, you have? Yep. Okay. A, a, and we planted, we'll plant probably a couple of hundred parkland trees as well over a, over a period of time. Right. We're now in this period where it's trying to find that balance between food production, yep. of course, yep. and of course, rewilding right. and yep. what are you using your land for and making it work for everybody. And that's tough. Yeah, it's quite it's, a balance. It's a balance. I mean, you're never, <laughs> you're, you're, you're never going to be absolutely popular with everyone. No. But I mean, it's a fool who tries <laughs> right. to do that. I, th I think what we do is we, we have a 10 year plan. So true. You know, we have a 10 year plan and um, that's a fairly broad plan, if you like. Right. We know where we want to be. And then that's more detailed within a three year window. So we're quite clear where we are with our sort of development targets, where we are with our internal right, businesses, right. where we want to be with our stewardship, etc. It's lovely to go out onto the estate and start seeing, uh, yeah. you know, this. It's, it, it, it is, it's, it's I mean, absolutely lovely. It is really um, lovely, you know, and, and you do start to notice all of a sudden more butterflies or yeah, moths yeah. or the invertebrate coming back. Okay. And I'd like yeah. to introduce you to, to okay. some of our cattle. We've got some native breeds okay. who help us manage all of this. Okay, and great. they're lovely, placid, beautifully calm okay, good. Uh, Every, beef short horns. Yeah, so um, <laughs> You'll be fine. many people know that I have a fear of yeah, cows. That's fine. So, <laughs> you you so, couldn't meet a nicer bunch of girls. Okay. They're absolutely lovely. You heard it here first. <laughs> Before I face my fears with the herd, we stop off to see some of the building projects Mark is overseeing. Well, this is one of the sweetest cottages I've ever seen. It, it's beautiful, I mean, isn't it? It's beautiful. <clears throat> so this was so, the old Kennelman's uh, cottage. Okay. So the, 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 years ago, they would have had their own hounds here. Right. And so this was built for, for that individual. And right. behind us over there is the, that would have been where the kennel boy would have lived. Oh my god. And the goodness. plan here, Julie, is to, well, you can see we're restoring this. So we've yes. replaced the, the Collie Western roof. It's beautiful. We're turning it into a three bed oh. uh, cottage. The plan is, is that we're going to have this as our, a holiday cottage. It's the first one we will have done on the estate, but it will right. support our wedding and events yes. business. Yes. And so we've got a new venue for our woodland weddings nearby, but we actually discovered that we had bats up in the roofs there. Right. So we've stopped, yes, yes, uh, stopped. consulted uh, Natural England. Yes. Um, we put in mitigating bat boxes around, around the place. Right. Uh, and we've, we're just about to start. So the windows, we're making new windows, which are ready now for fitting. Okay. And as soon as the windows are done and the gutters, we can drop the scaffolding, move into the building and start and renovating and inside. And start renovating inside. So it's got, yeah. Fantastic. So, so three bedroom here. Three bedroom here. And then what are you going to do with this? So that's going to be a single bedroom. Oh, wow. And so the idea there is that you, if you have a small wedding party, yes. bride and groom can stay in the, it's called the dog house. So oh we're calling God. it the dog house. I don't know if that's good or bad, but. No, I'm we're sure it's, the bride and groom are fine. They'll, they'll like that. But so that, you, that's the plan there. So again, we're doing a little uh, timber extension at the back there. And obviously I know that you do, I've seen the marquee yeah. setting that's been set up that has that backdrop of the house. Traditionally, that's what people wanted. That's what we do at Mapperton. But you're telling me that there's now another place yeah. that people can have their weddings, yes. which is more in the woodlands. Correct. Because that's becoming Correct. very popular. People Correct. want to be in nature. So we, we can give them a little bit more choice. This is our, our woodland clearing for our woodland weddings. We've done nothing here other than mow it, but through there, through the trees, we have added some, some wild flowers, etc. So the whole idea is that we've got a really light footprint in what we're doing here. Yes. The intention is that, that, that you know, the marquee goes up for that, for that specific event, but it's a super um, light sort of touch. And also for, from an estate point of view, We've not spent lots and lots of money no, on this. Exactly. You know, so nature's kind of done it all for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the meadows, the meadows are absolutely beautiful. We've Should cut we some paths through there if you want to have a, yeah, a quick exactly. look. But How? it's lovely. So, so we only put the wildflower mix in in the autumn um, last year. Okay. But that, what we'll do here, Julie, is we'll, we'll cut this off. Right. Once it's all seeded, we'll cut it and bale it and remove it and keep taking the energy out of the grass. Okay. And you'll find the wildflower mixes get stronger and stronger, stronger and stronger. Yeah. yeah. 
So, uh, you know, if you come up here in the evenings, it's absolutely full of moths and what have you. Oh. It's really, it's lovely. In fact, I come up in the evenings so and you, it's not lovely. unusual to see a deer or two here yeah. or the hare or, or that sort of thing. But you can see the paths are, they're sort of rudimentary a little bit at the moment, but you get the idea of what we're trying to, this trying is to do. Brilliant. It's beautiful, isn't it? It is beautiful. And you know, then again, you just see butterflies all around. Well, absolutely. So you've got the creeping thistles in yes. here. You've got um, parsley, oxide daisies. Yes. There's a few poppies. There's, um, there's a thing called kidney vetch down there. Absolutely brilliant for, for, it, for, for the bees. For, you can see yeah. the bees you know, buzzing around. Well, I can so, hear so this is interesting, isn't it? You might be able to give me a view on this slightly. So uh, our garden's saying, should we be pulling these out, these thistles? No. No. Well, there's uh, the answer. <laughs> I mean, no, look I at think the, look at the, if you look at the thistles, and it's thistle, quite pretty, look, isn't it? It's looking, so looking pretty. You it. don't pull out the thistles because yeah. look at the wildlife that's at, well. Look at the the you know invertebra yeah. that every yeah, all, bee all, I've seen so far is it's going. Been, is, look, there is, they are. Is, they're absolutely full of it. They're full of it, and you so, know then they pollinate and go on and, and on and on. on. This is this is but we, this is what you want to look at them. This is year one, so within two or three years we'll have to. Well, I can't wait to come back. Yeah. Everywhere I go, Mark, everybody wants to introduce me to their cattle. I know. It's somehow it's, it's, cruel, got, isn't it? it's gotten around <laughs> that I have a fear of cows. Okay. Well, these are probably the nicest bunch of cows you're going to meet. These, these are our little herd of um, traditional beef shorthorn cattle. Right. Okay, so they're a native breed. Yes. And the reason we have them here is because uh, it's, it's part of the, the, our agri-environmental scheme. So we wanted to reintroduce these grazers back into the estate. Ah. And so we have, we have a little, little herd of 20. We've had them for a couple of years. Okay. Uh, and we've got a lovely bull called Poseidon, who's not here. Oh, he's, 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 was due, he was due to come in today. And we thought that might just be too exciting for everyone. Right, right. So he's, exactly. he's in tomorrow. Okay, okay. But as you can see, they come in lots of sort of different um, colours. Yes, and what have beautiful. You. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah, they're really they, beautiful. They really are. So this is part of our parkland restoration. We, we've introduced a, 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 a new avenue here. Uh, as you can see, some lime trees. Yes. Cleared some trees at the other end. So you get a vista all the way up through there. Yeah, beautiful. As you come in. To, to, in, to, into, into the estate. So this yes. is part of the 500 acre restoration program. What you've got in front of you, this lovely cow, that is the classic beef short on cow. Yes. And you can see, isn't she lovely and friendly? She's lo she is lovely hey? and friendly. I mean, they are all looking at me though, so <laughs> yeah. I'm a bit like... Ooh. Yeah, no, no, no. But they're, they're, they're good calves and there's some, there's some yes. lovely calves in here. Then Mark introduces me to some renovation projects taking place across the estate. All right, Mark, I love a good kit, so <laughs> thank you for the hard hat right. and the high vis. We've got a range of, of, of disused uh, agricultural buildings here. Right. They're, they're listed, so they're, yeah. they're, they're, there are complications uh, with that. <laughs> yes, but yes they are. They're, they're, they're totally underutilised. Yep. But what we're doing is converting these to form little business units. Um, the plan originally was to do very small little workshops, but we're actually going to go for offices. For offices? Yep. So yep. We, we, we've got planning, so we're stripping the roofs off and we'll start uh, re-roofing it, etc. But there's a lot of stone work to do. But this one here was totally gone. Right. So we've stripped that off and it's been battened and, and then we'll put the Collie, the Collie Western slate back on there. Back on there. So they're scheduled to come at the beginning of, <gasps> of, of, of the month Brilliant. To do that. So you can see it's a, it's a, it's a classic sort of <gasps> courtyard. Um, but we, we can, we're going to create roughly 19 little business units out of this. Okay. And what we're proposing to do is heat them through geothermal rods. Yes. So 10 rods at 150 metres, so one and a half kilometres if you, if you like. Right. And a little plant room and that will distribute heat and hot water for oh all of the business goodness. units. So hopefully we can ride the sort of the peaks and troughs of, of energy right. costs and so on and so forth. And, and I'm just going to ask, with this roof up here, so yep. that you, you're having to literally rebuild. The joiners will come and start replacing the timbers that need to be replaced. Okay. Uh, and our guys uh, just pointing up the walls, etc., in advance of the, it, right. of the rest of it. Now you know me. I never miss an opportunity to get involved. And I'm joining Ned Cole and Adam McCrone up on the scaffold. So here, um, where, because the building's that old, where the wall plates moved and pushed the stonework yeah it's all come loose yeah so basically what we've got to do up here on both sides is replace the lo loose stones 
Okay. So wow. Me and Adam. And then repoint. Yes, and yeah. then repoint. Right. So me and Adam, we did off last week and this week with help from Brandon doing this side, right. which is all pointed up and ready for the roofer to replace the roof. Oh, right, right. So this side's ready. This side's ready. And then I'll what about on the other say. side? On the other side, there's plenty of work to do. That See, side. still, <laughs> right. Okay, should we have a little look at that? Yep. Okay, wow. This is, this is your next big project. This is the project now, <laughs> this side. <laughs> so, yeah, so basically what I'll get Adam to do now is we're here, instead of it being lime, some lime mortar, it's, it's cement. Oh my so gosh. So what we've got to do is either, well, we've got to try and get it out and then re repoint it with lime cement, right, which right. we've been using. All um, this is cement. Yes. You can't, you're not supposed to use cement because then it, well, it doesn't work well with the environment. It's not breathable. So all the moisture gets yeah. caught in. Yes, trapped. Right? Yeah. Trapped in. Yes. All right, so what are you and I going to do while Adam has this super fun job? He's super <laughs> so excited. So while Adam's about. doing that, we, what we'll do, as you can see, um, already prepared. <laughs> we've took, this is where all the loose stone was. Okay. So what we've done is we oh. took, took it off and then all we're doing is, as you can see, we've put it, so this is your top course and that's to go on next. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll just lay these stones onto the wall. Without? No, with, oh, with? the lime cement. With the lime cement. Yes. <laughs> okay. So then basically what we're doing is just rebuilding it back up to this height. Okay. So when the roof has come, it's not loose. It's, it's not it's, loose. It's okay. all solid again. Okay, do you want to start this process? Yep, yep. <laughs> so, because I have zero. <laughs> so, what clue. we've got to do, because obviously when we clean them, there's still some cement left oh on. Oh my gosh. So, just chip that off. If you've got rubbish and dirt still there, your cement's not going to stick. It's not going to stick. So, what you've got okay. to do from there. Oh my goodness. Again, different no. brick layers and stone layers, they. They have their own way of putting joints on. Some put it on the one they've got in yep. the hand and some put it on there. And then basically what you've got to do is fight your way back in. Oh. I mean, that's looking sort of right. Yeah. yeah. So again, when you've done that. Okay, so I'm going to try to do one. <laughs> so I take this and I'm going to plunk it on, yep. correct? Spread it about, fill all yeah, your that places one. in. Mm -hmm. And go far back, Ned, how yep. far back should I yep. go? More, more. Yep. And back. Yep. Okay. What do we think, more? No, that's fine. You sure? That's fine, that's good. Okay. And then what you gotta do there, mm -hmm. is so you stone to stick, you need a joint either on this stone or that stone. Oh, right, okay. So what I would do, I'd put it on there, mm -hmm. so then you can control okay. the stone with your hand. Beautiful. Okay, okay, yep. how's that? That's fine. Okay, now? So now what you've got to do is pick your stone up uh -huh. without any dirt on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Keep a 10 mil gap-ish uh -huh. there, uh -huh. and then tap it when you're sort of level-ish. Yeah. You're there. I'm there, I did it. Yeah. I did one. And then you go on to your next one. Then you go on to the next one. Mm. And then you're- You just carry on. And then you just carry it and you've got all to do so, all yeah, down there. So, so there's lots to do. Lots to do. Gosh, I'm gonna have to come back here and visit this. Oh yes. That is for <laughs> sure. So you're really seeing behind the scenes wow. here, really. This is this not is... many people, well, hardly any people get to see this. <laughs> oh um, so what we've got here, it's an yeah. extraordinary building. I think it's one of the only of its type if it's uh, in the UK so it's a brick it's brick built listed riding school okay so it's mid mid 19th century 1840 or right so, right. so it, was, it was built by the Earl of Cardigan to train his horses oh my so goodness so can you imagine training your horses undercover here and oh the my goodness. walls if you look at the bottom of the walls can you see that they they slope away slightly yes I do yes that's so the horses it's going around in its peripheral vision can see that and just keeps you and the rider, it keeps the rider off the wall, doesn't ah. it? So you can go around here at, at quite high speed. And so of course, it's very cleverly built. Obviously. Very cleverly yeah. built. 
Yeah. Yes. And as you can see, it's, it's in need of, of restoration. Some of the timbers have rotten and we've got uh, acro props keeping it up. We got a little grant from the Historic Houses Foundation. Oh, did you? Well to done. Do it. Yep. So the idea is that we will strip all these roofs, reset all the timber, rebuild the walls where they're bowing out. Yes. Um, and then re we're going to reuse this. So the yes. idea, what our kind of vision is here, is to have markets in here at least oh. monthly. So Christmas, maybe a Christmas market, a flower fair, an antique fair. Oh my gosh! So we, so we could run electric antique around fair. the outside. Be It'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah I mean, must have a, oh my goodness! Have a good explore. It's a lovely set I of buildings. Can't. This is definitely. It? I will definitely. It's unusual, be, isn't it? It's really it's unusual, unusual and it's beautiful. It is actually really beautiful. Good. I've just had a brilliant day out. I've learned so much about really the detail it takes to run an estate like Dean Park. And it, you know, it always brings me back that, of course, these estates have these wonderful, magical, historical homes that w visitors want to come and see, but it's a running estate. There's old farm buildings that need to be repurposed, yet they're listed, so you have to do them the right way. This is a perfect example right here of, um, you know, an old sort of training riding school, if you like, and it is listed. So it needs to be repaired in the right way. And yes, there are grants available, but the grants only go so far. And you have to work out how you can commercially use these spaces in order to generate income that goes back into the estate. Today is the big day. It's the wedding here at Dean Park. So I put my dress back on to look the part. But I'm first gonna check out the gardens because like so many historic houses, there are usually magnificent gardens attached to them and Dean Park certainly has some sensational gardens to look at. Right, now you're, you are known for your gardens, aren't you? We are, yeah, yeah. yes. And we have, we have in the last nine years uh, produced a few more gardens. This is the golden garden because they all flowers later in the year. So when the long borders are over, yes. you can then actually <gasps> have colour. We've grown sort of local things. We haven't had a designer in. We're just growing things that we know are going to work and survive here. Beautiful, but this is one of how many? Uh, well, five different coloured theme gardens that Love we've it. got. All right, where are we off to next? Right, on we go. Beautiful. Well, this is lovely. I mean, do you come out here as often? Every day. Every day, Every exactly, day with the dog. As you should do. We're going now into the White Garden. Okay. And um, the White Garden was built in, it was there before, but we revamped the entrance. Right. And it's done in memory of Robert's parents. <gasps> So everything here is white, oh and there's goodness. a little urn tucked in there given by the guides. <gasps> and then Robert's father's got one there given by his tenants. It's so lovely. In fond memory of Edmund Brudenell given by the farm tenants, August 25th, it's lovely. Yes. And then the other one is for mother. Mother-in-law, Marion, mother, yes. Yeah. Beautiful. Everything here is white, except at the end so of April, beautiful. when we have forget-me-nots galore. Right. And they were yep. white forget-me-nots, but they've turned back to being blue. Blue, right. And right. I did say to Andrew, hang on a minute, it's a white garden. <laughs> and his answer was, well, being called forget-me-nots, it's the right name. Yeah. <laughs> this is beautiful. This is like an avenue of heaven, right? It's called the Long Borders. And originally it was part of the um, walled garden that was built in about 1720. The gardens here at Dean were, obviously during the Second World War, they were all put to grass. Okay. And Robert's parents started to formulise the garden back as it was. And these wonderful borders here were half the size. And they took advice and they doubled them in size, which is why they're so luscious and rich right. and yes. full of colour. And... But everything we do here as a garden is that it's an adjunct to the house. It's not a separate garden that's, you know, a beautifully designed right. and all It grows with the house. So everything that we have here, and we do only have two gardeners, is self-seeding. And they go along and weed, obviously, they, yes, they, they keep yes. it going and replant. How wonderful. It's absolutely beautiful. Mm. 
This is enormous. It is enormous and we change all the flowers within it. And the flowers that we're planting now seem to be changing much more into sort of warmer, hotter plants. Ten years ago, I knew you'd never have put a banana plant out there, but now it thrives. <laughs> it certainly does. So where we are now is called what garden? It's called the Four Seasons Garden. Okay. I think this was here originally, but it wasn't planted out with, with these, this wonderful beach hedge that we have. Mm. Um, and the colouring in here is a sort of mixture of white and, and blue and yeah. red. So it's rather, yeah. rather a royal garden, actually, Yeah, it is a rather royal garden. Yes. It's fantastic. And this would have been a huge kitchen garden. Is that right? We've got records in the 1850s where they had 18 gardens just in the vegetable gardens. Fantastic. I just want to show you this building here. It was built by um, the 7th Earl of Cardigan and it's where he entertained his lady friends. Yes, oh there's, a, there's some stairs at the back that go what? up to what was his bedroom. Yes. Oh but. my, so he built that as his escape. There's his little yes. hideaway. Yes. There you go. Right. Oh, oh and now we're going to head up okay. here. Okay, let's head up here. Fantastic. Okay, so I'm standing on where people will get married. This is your third location. This is the very first of the three oh, locations. The first, okay, right. Yes. So this location came first, and you decided to put this in, people can get married here, yes? Yes. Yeah. Weather dependent. Yes, yes, yes. yeah, of course. Yes. And then what, chairs would come out here? Chairs would be put out there, and then they go straight straight into the marquee behind. But to have three wedding venues is incredible on an estate. And they're all different, and that's what's so wonderful. You've got the lakes, and then this one you called the this, wall garden. The walled garden. The marquee, yes. Marquee, the lakes, and then the woodland. And this traditionally has been the most popular, and, and we're sold out here for next year. Because of licenses, we can only hold a certain amount. So right. 2023, booked. So originally, though, this would have been, again, part of the walled garden. The, the, thir the third Earl of Cardigan, when he came back to Dean eventually, uh, discovered that fruit and vegetables had to be bought in from the neighbouring estate at Blatherwick. And he was so shamed by that, he started at a brick kiln and they built these seven oh, walled gardens. No. And it's just incredible oh that <laughs> they're still oh standing, goodness. these walls, which are all listed. And then, and then at some stage they were used for growing Christmas trees and breeding pheasants. And I believe there was a tennis court here once upon a time. Well, it's brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. Each generation adapts the gardens to the tastes and needs of their time. Robert has joined us to explore the jewel in the crown here at Dean Park. Well, this is glory right here. <laughs> Tell me about this it. This is the main best bit showing off of Dean Park Gardens. This is called the parterre that uh, Robert's parents put in in the 1980s and they got David Hicks to design it. And it's based on the Serlio design, which we have throughout the house, of a square and a circle and a square. Right. Uh, and the whole theme of this garden is purple. Now, Charlotte, I want to just point out something a little bit further <laughs> oh, along. Like something to do with lozenges, <laughs> I'm guessing. <laughs> it's just something as I was staying here that, and I was walking around and I was like, <gasps> I spotted that <laughs> coat of arms all on its own. That is the Montague one, because yeah. there's nothing brutal added exactly. to it. Exactly. I know. Yeah, so that was done in honour of, of Mary. Mary, yeah. Montague. There we go. Incredible. Yeah, yeah I know. So, I, like I said, we're family. <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. Wow, well, that was a real treat. And I can see now, well, you know, it's all these layers that Dean Park has. You know, you've got the history of the house, but it's then you've got the living history, your own stories, but attached to that. And part of the fabric, really, of the building are these extraordinary gardens. And then you've got the wider estate. It's wonderful, though. Wonderful. I've got one more garden to show you. Yes. Round the corner, which is a rather special. Oh, yes. okay, 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 okay. Yes. Let's go to that. Let's go to that. This is the east front of the house, which I think architecturally is, is the most interesting side yeah. of the house. This is Mrs. Roberts' pink rose garden, which I have put in as, as, as my gift to Dean, my legacy oh. to Dean. And it's pink because, because there are too many men in our house, <laughs> <laughs> and I love pink. Uh, and it was designed particularly because originally, once upon a time, there was a chapel that stuck out. That was the monastic chapel, the medieval chapel that you saw the arch coming through yes. to. 
And to the right of it was a knot garden of herb, a herb garden in the shape of a cross. Okay. So that's what we've done here is the shape of a cross. Oh, you've done, yes. And what we did here was we've put pink lavender. You put pink lavender. And the colours of the roses grayed out from dark pink to mm. pale pink. And they're all chosen because they're named after people we love. Oh, they are. So Rosamundi for Godmother Rosie. Right. Sophie Splendida for Godmother Sophie. Fantastic. And this, as you can see, is a haven of bees and butterflies. Yeah, I can see them. Yeah. Obviously, I see a lot of coat of arms here. It's, it's um, the carvings are beautiful. Lots of broodnels, shamrocks, which is the tresham. Right. Tresh, yeah. the three. Yeah. So this side is pre, pre Montague, I'm afraid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is wonderful. And I love that we've sort of done this fantastic garden tour, but we've ended with you. Oh. We've ended with your I'm clashing garden. terribly with you know, my pink great. roses. No, no, it's great. I love it. You stand out, Charlotte. You stand out. So these historic houses rely on, of course, visitor income, the tours, the events, but weddings are a huge part of income for these historic houses in order for them to restore, to repair, and to preserve this part of England's heritage. And Dean Park is no different. I'm really excited. The marquee's right here. I'm gonna get stuck in and see all that goes on in preparing for this huge wedding that's happening here tomorrow. All right, this is the big marquee right here. I'm about to meet Georgina, wedding coordinator here. So they're getting prepped for this enormous wedding. It's all very exciting. This is a fantastic marquee, by the way. Whoa, and it's huge. Hello. Hi, lovely to meet you. So nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you Welcome. so much for letting, this is enormous. It's huge, isn't it? I can come in and see what's happening. But I'm sorry. That's right, don't be sorry. <laughs> I'm all about kidding out and making sure that this floor <laughs> stays. stays squeaky clean there we go. until tomorrow. Come in. Great. So this is an enormous marquee. Isn't Huge. It? This is the biggest we've had at Dean Park so far. We are one a week at the very most. Right. So we can give our couples the full week's yes. attention for the build-up, as you yes. can see, that's taken yes. place oh here. Oh my goodness. I know weddings are a big business. It is. For historic houses. I mean, we have a wedding business as well, and it's big for us, and it's, it's because it's a way to generate income that can yes. then go back into Absolutely. preserving the estate. We keep right, it very right. exclusive, so we can give our couples the time that yes. they deserve in the planning yes. of their weddings and the setup. But with the other two sites now coming along, we'll be able to take a few more weddings on because the Woodland site is so far away. Yeah. It's a, it's a self-contained venue in its own right. Yes, so yes. Um, we'll, we'll be growing, there. isn't it? Yeah, magical. Do you see the wildflowers? Oh, yeah. It was, so oh. pretty. So we saw, Mar I was with Mark, we saw so many bees on the thistles and it was it was incredible and butterflies tomorrow yep. um the dj will be setting up we've got a big screen going behind the dance floor right. with the dj booth and all the lights on the stage here in the front so it will change right. a bit tomorrow um crystal group are in at the moment setting up all the decor so they're okay. setting up all the the vip tables in the middle here and ah, all the so centerpieces okay so these these are the family tables, tables. right and then this is all this is all the guests. Now these yes. centerpieces are rather extraordinary. Aren't they beautiful? Yeah. We're final touches today. So this is Daisy from Fuse Marquis. Hello, hello. <laughs> She's steaming the um the all the drapes today to take right. all the creases out. So you've got to go all the way around. Yes. Yeah. Right. Oh my goodness. I know what it is. Can I just have a little go? It's quite yeah, fun, of isn't course. it? It's quite fun, <laughs> isn't it? But ha look at that. There's something about a steamer, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It just sort of makes you proud because you're like, oh my gosh. But you, how's your arm going to be after this? All right, to be honest. Will it be, well, well you're, you're well practiced <laughs> in steaming? I mean, it does take some time, you know, this is, so have you just started here? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> okay, Daisy has a long way to go. <laughs> this, you can do this yes. occasionally, right? Give yourself a nice little yeah. facial there. The next step, so tablecloths have gone on, centerpieces will go in place, then they'll dress the um, VIP tables in the right, middle. Right. Then that's the decor team done. I make that yeah. sound really quick and easy, no, and they'll no, be no, here no, all no. day. Okay. 
So with the preparations for the wedding well underway, it's time to head inside to help get ready for our dinner party this evening. All right, I have to be honest, Lynn, that I have been waiting all day for this. You know, when I've gone to dinner parties before, I've always been impressed with the napkins. I've tried it many, many times myself, mm -hmm. and I haven't been able to do it. So I've been right. told to come and find you because you know what to do. That is the napkin ring I'll show you okay. how to make. Okay, yes. How do you start? So you've right. got the napkin so here. So you get the napkin, make it with starch. Yeah. And then iron it all out. Fold it in half. Right. Spray it again. Okay. You fold that here there and iron it. Yeah. And then another one. Another one. Iron. Iron. Flip oh, it over. So two, two flip over. Flip it over again. Okay. And then flip over you fold. just roll. Okay, you made that way too easy. So it's like a fold in half. Yeah. And then two little folds. Yeah. And then a fold in half and a roll. Yeah. Okay. All right, should I have a little go? I think you should. Yeah, so I'm just gonna start on like a clean slate here. Okay, now, fold in half. Fold in half. Spray again, Spray yeah. again. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna... One fold and iron. Just iron, yeah. Just iron. Okay, one. And then another one. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then I do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna flip it over. Yeah. Okay. So should I go? Yeah. Like that? Whoops, whoops. Yeah. Okay. Okay, fold up here. Then I'm gonna roll. And then I roll up. Okay, roll. And there you have your napkin ring. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> Lynn is kindly doing a Birds of Paradise napkin just for me in my honor. All right, here we go. Iron it all Iron. up. And you fold it in half. Okay. Spray. And you fold it into a square. Okay. You fold each ah. thing up. And then you iron. Iron. Spray. Yeah. Iron. Then you fold an iron. Okay. Then you fold that over and then you just do that. Right. And then you take <gasps> each little... Oh my gosh. And now I see why you had to starch them. Yeah. In, yeah. in, in between each of the folding yeah. crease. <gasps> that is beautiful. Okay, I love that one. That was brilliant. So exciting um, that I was able to do that. And I can definitely take that yeah. back home. I'm gonna remember that. Fold in half, fold, fold, fold in half. Yeah. Roll. Yeah. yeah. And that's nice at Christmas as well, because you can put a little bit of ivy. Yeah. Or yeah. holly. Or, or holly in, yeah, there. in there. Or even mistletoe if yeah. you have some. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Next up, polishing the silver. So can I lend a hand? That would be marvelous. One of the things I do like to do is polish silver. So would you okay. like to polish one of these? This must be Bruno family silver here. I believe that's yeah. a wedding present, Mrs. Bruno? Yeah. 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 There's, a, there's a pair, you see. Oh, yes. Are these just really more like features? Yes. Just the features cop, on the, the top. The cop pheasant sits up by Mr. Bruno and, yep. and, the, and the female by Mrs. Bruno. Right. I think it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm polishing this. Well, maybe you should wear one. Maybe of I should. Yeah. I was just thinking. I don't know if I'm. Get your yeah. I, well, I just. It. I kind of want to. <laughs> you know, I'm all about ki being kitted out. There's something quite meditative about this. Yes, like, there is. Yeah, it's part of our deep cleaning regime as well. It probably takes us a good you know, week to um, polish the silver over. in the house. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. how often do you, are you polishing? Just once a year. Just yeah. once a year. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah mm, that's mm, about mm. what we do as well. Yeah. What do you guys think? Oh, I think you've done a marvelous job. Yeah, great job. Is that all right? Mm. Okay. I mean, you can you can definitely tell a difference of the shine. All right, ladies, are we finished? It's rather fun, isn't it? Then the big test for me 
setting the table. Anytime I do get left to set the table without my husband, he does come around and check it. In fact, we just had a son's 21st birthday and I set the table for that. But it all looks so beautiful when it's said and done. So I'm going around and I'm just making sure there's sort of one thumb distance um, so that when you sort of look down here, and this is how I always, when I do mark it, when I look down at the one end of the table all the way down, I wanna see like a perfect line. I think there's one I might have to move up here just like a tiny bit that's bothering me. The thing about formalities is that if we don't keep them up, they will get lost. And it's not that we're doing this all of the time, um, but it's about carrying on these traditions. And times, of course, have changed, and luckily they have, and many of us just have lovely suppers in our kitchen. But I think, you know, every once in a while, being able to set the table properly, I think it's a real art, and I think it's a thing of beauty, and I think it's wonderful it's just to be able to be in such a beautiful setting around you know friends or new acquaintances and having a really proper dinner party so it's my last night here at dean park and we've set up for a dinner party the dinner is in the dining room. I cannot wait to eat in there, but it's just been an extraordinary time here at Dean Park. And this is the wonderful thing about these historic houses. Yes, they're open to the public and we love opening them to the public, uh, having visitors come in and tour all the rooms. But of course, they also need to be lived in. This is really living history. So I'm really excited to be able to dine with Charlotte and Robert and have a dinner party in the dining room and use the rooms uh, occasionally and put new energy and life in them. So I feel like I'm going off to a ball. I'm not, but I feel like I am because let's face it, I'm in a castle and I have a turret there for my bathroom. something about drawing rooms like no other rooms in the world. This. Oh my goodness! They're really called withdrawing rooms and they're where the ladies withdrew to when men were carrying on drinking port round the table. And having cigars. So that's why they're always, <laughs> so, they're always so exquisitely beautiful. So tell me about this drawing room. Well this drawing originally it had silk hangings and we've got a small remnant left in the corner over there. Right. And then Robert's parents found this exquisite American wallpaper. <gasps> no. It's not silk, it's wallpaper. And they put the filaments over it so it looks like it's silk. This room being a withdrawing room has got portraits really mostly of women. We've got Anna Maria, and then we have Mary, Mary Tresham, Mary Brudnell, the first Countess of Cardigan, my absolute fave rave. She yes. was the one who held the fort during the Civil War when everything was taken, the books, the pictures furniture Every, yep. and everybody skedaddled and she was left here being fined four-fifths of her income. Oh my goodness. Do you feel that she kind of saved the place? She really kept the home fires burning. I love that you said that this is where, you know, the drawing room is because this is where the women used to withdraw. But you have really made it, you know, women, sort of empowering women around here. Well, I'd love to say I made it, but in fact it was Robert's mother who made it. What is the most beautiful thing in the room are these portraits we've got which are painted by Paul Van Soma, and right. they're known as the Brudenal Tresham portraits. There's nothing to do with the Tresham. I think they're all sisters. So you want to find out who they are. Of course and so this I is do. another project it's, at Dean. It is my exploration right. phase, yes. yes. It's one big research project, isn't it? And it's such fun because you know interior decorating changes the whole time. Research becomes more and more easy to do. I've yes. just looked up something and found that there's a book I can read online for what right. I want the information for. And, and so as, as information progresses, we learn more and sometimes things change.
Yes. And what you think is written in ink is, is uh, yes, not the person you thought they were. Right, and you have to change the narrative and the storytelling. Yes. But, um, and that's what's so fascinating. I mean, it is utterly beautiful. It's, it's an elegant room, isn't it, it? It really is. And here is our good health to you for coming all the way from beautiful, beautiful Dorset. Yeah, you are to, a Dorset up to, <laughs> up to Northamptonshire, which we absolutely now love. Yep. Um, and thank you for taking the time to come no, and see thank us. thank you. This has been... And to understand and to share our joy of Dean. I love, I mean, I'm, I'm in love. I'm in love with Dean, okay? Let's just say that. Good. And um, it's brilliant. So thank you both. And um, cheers. Chin chin. Chin chin. <laughs> and so Robert, Charlotte, and I reflected on my visit over dinner and raised our glasses once more. Thank you both well, so much. It is so much our pleasure to have you. You lighten up our life, and we well, just think it's fabulous that, that you appreciate Dean, which we so appreciate. Yeah. I appreciate it on a, I appreciated it before because I am, you know, a lover, if you like, of historic houses, but I appreciate it now more than ever because coming here, you get to really see how it all works together. And it is, in one sense, a big jigsaw puzzle, but you have the team in place and the team so looks up to you and you have the two of you who just immerse yourself into making sure that the pieces are in the right place and that this carries on for Well, I'd just future. like to make tribute now to the fact of our three wonderful trustees. Yeah. Because they let us go out on, on, on little adventures and, and yeah. there are, they are so supportive. It's amazing. And um, thank you, we could not survive without yeah. them. So I would like to pay tribute to them. Yeah, you, and you must, because trustees are so important, especially in this, in where, in where we are today with historic houses. So cheers, shouldn't I keep, Indeed. cheers. Thank Chin. you for a really, truly spectacular time. And the following day, before I head home, there's time to take a peek at the wedding celebrations. It's so exciting. The bride and the groom have just arrived and they're here to do some of their photos, of course, with Dean Park as their backdrop. So far, so good with the weather. And I got a sneak peek of her and she's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm.